Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Marietta, and this is my colleague, Mikhail. Today, we will be our host of JONCOM 2022. This is the third edition of the conference. Uh, our goal with this conference is to assist uh, Java developers worldwide in their career paths to become best professionals in the field. We believe in knowledge sharing and learning is the best way to exceed in the industry. But since Dreamix was created, our focus was to help by the community, since we know Java what it is today, won't be anything without a community around it. So that's why we have initiatives like Java Special Interviews with Java Champions and Java Daily, now Triple Thread, that you've probably already seen on our social media websites. So, um, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Marietta. Good morning, everybody. I hope you're having a nice time and you've prepared yourself a nice cup of coffee or tea. So today we're going to have a very packed day full of very interesting topics and presentations. And uh, before we actually start, uh, I would like to briefly tell you what you should expect from us. So today we're going to have five presentations in total, wrapping up the day with a panel discussion. And now we're going to start with three of the five presentations in the morning. And uh, each presentation will be for about an hour, including a Q&A session at the end with the presenter. Uh, afterwards, at around 12 p.m. Central European time, we're going to have a lunch break for an hour, and then we're going to continue the rest of the day with the rest, present, uh, the, uh, the two more presentations and uh, the panel discussion. Talking about the panel discussion, uh, this year we're going to talk about, with our guest lecturers, where is Java moving to and what you as a Java developer should expect uh, from Java, the Java community and what skills you should learn in the coming years to stay relevant. Now, without further ado, uh, I would like to start now with the first presentation for the day and our first presenter, Holly Cummins. So Holly is a senior principal software engineer at the Red Hat Orcas team. She has worked for IBM for many years and she has participated in different projects in, in sizes. Holly is also an Oracle Java champion, an IMB, IBM Q ambassador, and a Java One rock star. She, uh, she has participated in many conferences, and today she's adding the 2022 JonConf to her list. Uh, something interesting, she has used the power of cloud to understand climate risks, count fishes, and she even helped a blind athlete run an ultra marathon in the desert. So I would like to welcome Holly to our forum where today she's going to talk to us uh, to talk to talk she's going to talk, sorry she's going to talk to us about trade-offs bad science and polar bears in the world of java optimization so before we actually start a brief note uh, holly couldn't join us live for the actual presentation so she has kindly sent us a pre-recorded version of it which we're now going to play however if you have questions please still post them in the chat and she's going to join us live for the q a session in the end thank you and stay tuned Let's talk about Java optimization. Before we can do that, we need to have some idea of why this would be interesting. Why is anybody interested in optimization? I think it has to do with people, ultimately. When someone is using a website, when someone is interacting with a system and that system is slow, they get annoyed. And that annoyance turns into lost money. Google found about 10 years ago that if they had half a second extra search time on their pages, that turned into a 20% drop in traffic. So that's quite a direct revenue impact for a company like Google. Akamai found that if they had 100 milliseconds extra latency on their page load, again, it was a 7% lower conversion rate. So their, their clients were, were losing money if Akamai were slow. Sometimes the connection to money can be even more direct for something like a high frequency trading company. Now, hopefully if you're doing high frequency trading, this isn't your introduction to, to Java optimization, but for businesses like that, they live and breathe optimization because even just a 10 millisecond delay in their trading platform, a tiny little delay can turn into a 10% drop in revenue. So it's, really substantial amounts of money. So that obviously that matters. It matters a lot. It's something that we all should be thinking about, that we all should be looking at. But what does it mean 
to optimize an application. When we say we want to optimize it, really what we mean is we want to make it go faster. But it's not always simple to define what faster means. Who is it who's using it that needs it to be faster? What time of day is it? What are they doing? Is this a batch job or is this something where response time matters or is this something where we need to have high throughput? I used to work in a consultancy in IBM called the IBM Garage and we did a lot of human-centric design. So in any problem, whether it was something that seems really quite obviously UX oriented like a web page or something like designing an integration system or a build system or something on the back end, we would always try and take this lens of finding the person and figuring out what they needed and going from there to the technical design. And I think the exact same principles apply when we think about performance, when we think about optimization, because it can be so many different kinds of things. And if we optimize the wrong aspect, we might actually make things worse for our users. When we think about performance, I think often the first thing that most of us would think about is something like throughput. So that could be transactions per second. That's the sort of the obvious definition. But often what actually matters most to users is latency. So it could be something like startup time, or it could be something like response time. A more subtle aspect of latency is also the ramp up time. This is something that matters a lot with Java because it can take a long time from when the JVM first starts to when it's fully warmed up and operating at full capacity because of the time needed for the just-in-time compiler. And this is why things like GraalVM and native applications are really interesting. Another, another potential um, performance metric is capacity. So by capacity, we might mean something like bandwidth. So that matters a lot when we're doing a virtual event. Can, can I actually upload or is someone else in my house using all of the pipe for upload? When we think about cloud computing, an aspect of capacity that matters a lot is the footprint. How many containers can I fit onto one virtual machine? A similar but related um, consideration, also really relevant for the cloud, but also relevant for my laptop, is CPU usage. It used to be that if I ran Slack on my laptop, it would use so much CPU that I couldn't actually run anything else on my laptop. So the, the capacity was really bad there because I had to use, dedicate all of my capacity just to Slack. A related thing is utilization. Utilization is sort of the opposite of capacity and both really matter. But again, we have to decide which one we care about. So if I have a really high powered machine and I'm only using it at 10%, that may not be the most efficient thing because all of that extra capacity is just being wasted. So capacity and utilization are sort of opposites of each other and we need to decide which we want to optimize. And it's similar for things like throughput and latency often. So for example, with something like GraalVM, the startup time is outstanding, but sometimes you pay a little bit of a penalty for that in your transactions per second. So what, what do you care about? And sometimes the thing about all of these is that they can be a bit counterintuitive. And I think sometimes we naturally focus on one metric when maybe it's not the most important one to us. And there's a, a true story about throughput and bandwidth, which is so nice for trying to understand how, how they work. Because the story is that in, in the 1970s, NASA had two sites in Texas, and there was a data pipe between those two sites, but then the data pipe broke. So they needed to get the astronomical data from one site to the other. So what they did was they took all of their tapes and put them in a station wagon and sent it down the highway. And the interesting thing about this is this seems like a terrible way to do data transmission, but actually the bandwidth was higher than it was when they were using the electronic data pipe. 
the response time was terrible. It, you had to wait all the all the while for the car to make the trip, but the the, the bandwidth was really high. And there's a, a similar thing with something like SneakerNet, where I, I think we don't do it so much anymore, but you know, you take your USB stick and you put the data on the USB stick and you walk down the hall. Slow response time, amazing bandwidth. And they still actually do that for things like, um, things like Netflix and Google. I think they still use SneakerNet actually for some of the really large data transfers because it is the most efficient way for doing it. But again, that's because they're not time sensitive. And the funny thing about requirements is it's not enough to define your requirements once. So you might choose one of those gray squares and say, I'm optimizing for this. But then the requirements may change. A colleague of mine, they, they worked on a performance problem for a bank and they had a system that had been originally designed for the tellers to use once at the end of their shift. So there was a mainframe and then there was a, an API endpoint on a terminal and the teller would push the button and it would send a transaction in. But this was a pretty useful API. So the tellers continued using it, but then at some point they started doing mobile development and the mobile development team found this API and said, oh, that is exactly what we need. But when in a bank, there's a fairly small number of tellers, just the bank's employees. And if they do something at the end of a shift, it happens very rarely. There's a lot of mobile users and mobile users tend to use their mobile phones a lot. So all of a sudden the load on this API increased a lot because all of these devices were sending traffic in. And so that system that had been working really well, you know, it sort of started to smoke and it just, fell over. And of course, even if our local environment, our re local requirements don't change, the world around us changes. The cloud has really changed what we expect of our systems and what matters in our systems. Because it used to be we would buy a machine and then once we had the machine, we could use all of the machine and that was fine. But now in Java, we want to try and keep our containers as small as possible so that we can pack them as densely as possible. So all of a sudden that XMX, that how much memory we're assigning to our JVM matters a lot. It's, it's money. So footprint is often the most important performance metric. And this means that some technologies that maybe have been around for a while, all of a sudden look much better because they're so well suited to today's requirements. I used to be a performance engineer for um, J9, which is now Open J9. And I, you know, I have a fondness for that, that JVM because I used to work on it. So I was really happy to see it open sourced. And then it was even better when after it was open source, people started trying it out and going, yeah, the performance of this is really, really good. And in particular, it starts up really fast, it warms up fast, and it has a small footprint. So that's exactly what you need in the cloud. So these, these performance figures, you can see those two left ones, the start, faster smart startup time and the smaller footprint are really great for the cloud. You can see on the right hand side that throughput is maybe a little bit less good that, you know, after it's been running for a long time on this particular benchmark, the throughput was less. So again, it depends what you're trying to do. If you want to have that density and that fast ramp up time, you want to go with OpenJ9. If you're running a long lived process, maybe, maybe hotspot is better. There's no right answer. It just depends. And we see this, um, well, I was going to say we see this trade off even more with Quarkus, but I'll come back to that. Um, because with, with Quarkus, which is what I work on now. I work for Red Hat. I'm an, eng um, an engineer on the Quarkus team, so I, I help build Quarkus. But before I joined the Quarkus team, I heard a story um, from one of the Red Hatters and they were telling me about a conference and there was a Red Hat booth and one of the project managers was demonstrating Quarkus at the booth. But because he was a project manager, he was maybe not quite as technical as, as some people. And so someone would come along and he would show them Quarkus and then the person would go away and someone else would come along and he would start up Quarkus to show them Quarkus. But he was forgetting to stop Quarkus. 
So at the end of his day, he looked at his laptop and his laptop had 120 running carcasses on it. But the, the thing I like about it is he didn't notice. He only noticed because it was the end of the day. His laptop didn't slow down at all because Quarkus is just so incredibly efficient. And Quarkus can run in two modes. Um, it can run on the JVM or it can run on um, as a natively compiled binary exploiting Graal VM. And of course, one of the questions that we get a lot is which is better? With When you're running on Graal VM, you see that same trade-off that we saw earlier where you start up really fast, but your ultimate throughput is maybe a little bit lower. If you run on the JVM, what's really interesting is there isn't that trade-off. It has a lower footprint it starts up much faster than other JVM applications, obviously not faster than a native application. And the throughput tends to be much faster, well, certainly tends to be faster than other JVM applications as well, because it does some stuff at build time rather than at runtime. That helps the startup time, but then it also continues to give a benefit while the application is running. That does mean there is a little bit of a trade-off against, so the trade-off isn't against runtime throughput. The trade-off is against flexibility because we have this closed world assumption. We assume that things aren't going to appear on the class path after build time. Whereas a lot of the older Java frameworks were actually optimized for this highly dynamic, I'm going to stay up for six months, but things will change around me kind of environment. And that's not how we run Java applications anymore. So in terms of which you should choose, if you're doing something ephemeral, if you're doing something serverless, GraalVM is definitely the right way to go. If it's a longer running application, OpenJDK is probably the way to go. And of course you can have both because it's the same code base in both cases. So the other great thing is that sometimes the best way to optimize is just to not make a decision. And that's what you can do with, um, with Quarkus. Another thing that we should think about when we optimize, which we often don't at all, is because we tend to focus on the happy path. We tend to focus on the active path. What's going on with my application when it's running? When you people are using it, when happy users are so excited by what I've built that they're just, you know, there's lots of demand. But a lot of time, people won't be using the application, either because it's overnight or just because it's a quiet period. So. What happens then? And this matters a lot because up to 30% of the virtual machines that are just out there on the internet are zombies. So these are machines that got stood up, a server got started, it was running an application, people stopped using that application and nobody remembered to shut the server off or people were too scared to shut the server off. And sometimes zombies are long run things that it got started, it should have been stopped. Somebody forgot to start it, stop it. But we also see an issue just with things like overnight. So I saw one estimate that said that there was $26 billion, that's a huge amount of money, of cloud spend that could be saved if people would just turn off their machines at night. On the alternatively, instead of turning off the machine at night, you can just make sure that you have something that has that low footprint so that it uses less energy when you're not using it. So how do you how do you find these kinds of problems? How do you optimize? It's sort of really simple to optimize. What you have to do is you have to find the bottleneck, analyze the application, find the point where resources are constrained and that's what's stopping it going faster and fix it. It sounds so easy, right? Well, there are, there are just one or two or six or eight pitfalls, things that can go wrong. The first pitfall is intuition. All of us, I think when we have a machine that's not going fast enough, we have an idea about what the problem is. 
performance optimization is not the place for ideas. There's a rule, which is measure, don't guess. You have to be guided by those measurements because often when, when we have an idea, we'll focus on the bit of code that really annoys us, that technical debt that's making us itchy. But sometimes the, the bottleneck, at least the first bottleneck, is somewhere much simpler. And of course, when we measure, it's not enough to just measure. We have to measure the right thing. And that comes back to that human-centered design. We have to measure what our users care about. And it's, it's actually pretty easy to go wrong with numbers. There's a fallacy called the McNamara fallacy, which is also called the quantitative fallacy. And this basically says that if you attach numbers to something, people will assume you know what you're talking about. But they may not be measuring the right thing. They might be really impressive looking numbers measuring the wrong thing. So we have to make sure that we look past the numbers to think a bit more deeply about whether we're measuring the right thing. And there's a, a way of thinking about measurements which actually comes from business, but I find it really useful for technical things too. And that's that there are two kinds of indicators you can measure. There's leading indicators and lagging indicators. Lagging indicators are the things that we actually care about. How much money is my business making? That kind of thing. They're really easy to measure. How much money is my business making? Well, let me just look and see. The only problem is they're hard to change. How much money is my business making? How do I make more money? Well, I don't know. That's, if we knew that, we'd, <coughs> excuse me, we'd all be millionaires. Leading indicators are easy to change. There's something like, how many CPUs have I got on this? They're super easy to change. And they, they are predictive of a thing we care about. If I change this, that will change how much money I make. The problem is, <laughs> they're really hard to identify. What is it that I have to change in order to change how much money I make? Well, I, well, I don't know. And it's really easy to get leading indicators and lagging indicators wrong. And sometimes we, we get this advice about what to change and it turns out to be the wrong advice because we've chosen the wrong leading indicator. So I did some, some performance experiments, but I should caution that like all performance experiments, you know, I may try something and then it might be a different result for you. So don't try these at home or rather do try it at home, but do the measurements, don't just take, take my word for it. So many years ago, I did um, an MSc thesis about garbage collection. And at the time, there was all this bad advice going around that was to optimize your JVM, you need to reduce the amount of time you spend in garbage collection. But this advice, it's, it's not 100% wrong, but it's pretty wrong because garbage Garbage collection can actually make your application go faster. It can rearrange objects in memory so that when you're not doing the garbage collection, things are faster. That's, that's worth investing in. So in 2007, I did these experiments and I looked at um, a benchmark called SpecJBB. And what I did is I changed my JVM so that it would do a full compaction every single time it collected. So you can see that that's the blue line and like this is a pretty bad way to optimize a JVM. There's a reason it's not the default. And so as you can see, the pause times were really high and the total time spent in GC was also really high. What you might not expect is that the throughput, which is again this blue line on the second graph, it was higher when I compacted every single GC. So even though I was spending all of this time doing GC, my throughput was, was better. So if I cared about throughput, I should spend more time in GC. So last year I tried to recreate this experiment. So I took a benchmark called DayTrader and I set up a, a system. So I had Apache J meter, um, and I tried doing that same setting to say, I'm going to compact every single garbage collection, but I didn't, I didn't really see that setting made it make a difference. So 
I tried changing the GC policy a bit, and then I tried squeezing my heap so that it was smaller, and then I tried making my heap big, and I still wasn't seeing that the GC was really making much difference at all to how the application performed. So I was getting a little bit depressed at this point because no matter what settings I chose for the garbage collection, the performance stayed the same. Um, by the way, this is, I was trying to prove a point about garbage collection and it is totally cheating to like look and look and look until you find the one setting that proves your point. Um, that's not, that's not science, that's bad science. So in the end, I did find a way of changing how much time I was spending in garbage collection. So I ran with these settings and my first experiment, my, my GC looked like this um, and I was spending 21 seconds in GC. And so that was about 4% of the time was paused. I did a second experiment and I only spent 12 seconds in GC. And so it was only 3.6% of the time was paused. So clearly the, the second one, where I only spent 12 seconds in GC, is better, right? Well, not so much. And you can start to see that when you look at how much garbage was collected. In the first experiment, I collected 24 gig of garbage. In the second experiment, I only connect, collected 13 gig of garbage. So I was only collecting half as much garbage. What's going on? Why was there less garbage? Ah, now we start to see it. In the first experiment, I had almost 500 transactions per second. In the second experiment, I had half as many transactions per second. So of course I spent less time doing garbage collection because I was actually just doing less work in the application. So what had I changed? To, to make this difference. What I'd actually changed was I changed where I was hosting things. Everything says that you, and quite rightly, that when you're doing this kind of performance experiment, you have to have the thing driving the load on a different machine. So I'd done that, but a modern laptop is so powerful that I actually couldn't get enough load through my network connection to stress the machine out. And so the only way I could get enough load in was to run JMeter on the same machine. So as soon as I had JMeter on the same machine, I was able to do more work, which just goes to show that you need to, when you do performance experiments, you need to think really carefully about what you're measuring. Because in my case, the network was the bottleneck. It didn't matter how much I changed my GC parameters. So thinking about the leading and the lagging indicators again, The sort of the, the theory is that that total time in GC was a leading indicator, but actually it was a terrible leading indicator because the, the correlation to the lagging indicator, the thing I really care about, the number of transactions per second, was actually inverse. If I made time in GC more, I did more transactions per second. And of course, there's a question too, like, well, clearly this is not a leading indicator, that time in GC. I shouldn't spend, tune how much time I spend in GC to try and change my transactions per second. But we should also think about whether transactions per second is even the right lagging indicator. Is that what my users care about or do they care about response time? If so, maybe I should be optimizing something different. And, and as I mentioned, the thing that I changed to change the GC was actually nothing to do with the GC settings at all. And so the, the sort of the, the tricky thing with it is that you can spend a long time. I had the wrong bottleneck. I thought GC was the bottleneck, but actually it was my network connection that was the bottleneck. And so Gene Kim says any improvement made anywhere besides the bottleneck are an illusion. And again, he's talking about business there. He's talking about development processes but it applies to machines as well. You have to find the bottleneck. The other moral of the story is that this, this performance advice that I had from 15 years ago, funnily enough, 
wasn't, I mean, it's sort of correct, but it was sort of totally different now. Um, so time kills all performance advice, even, even my own. So if you, if you remember just one thing, do remember that GC is your friend. It can improve your performance by rearranging the heap. You have to find a bottleneck and you have to validate it, validate advice independently because it can change or it can just be wrong. Advice is a big performance problem. There is so much bad performance advice on the internet. And this is partly because the internet has been around a while. So some things that were true once are no longer true. So there used to be advice that said you should make one big Java method because method dispatching in Java is slow. That was true, like for Java one, it is no longer true. Now you, the JIT is more effectively able to optimize small methods. There's this idea that you should reuse your objects to help the garbage collector. That's just bad advice for a modern collector. Objects tend to be free to collect if they die early, but they tend to be very expensive if they have a cost every collection if they live for a long time. Another thing that um, we see a lot is these command lines where it gets cut and pasted around the internet. And it was maybe correct once, but there's a lot of stuff in there that is relevant. There's a lot of stuff in there that's obsolete. And there's some stuff that just doesn't, doesn't matter anymore. And some stuff that will make you worse off. And New Relic found when they looked at the, the command lines of, of things that had New Relic t um, turned on, for what, there was one parameter that had a really weird number in it. And it was, it was um, a multiple of two that had had one digit taken off and that had been copied around the internet and a good portion of JVMs were using this ridiculous command line. So you do need to be really cautious with things that you copy and paste from the internet. Sometimes it's more complicated. So there's advice that you should use string builder and that you shouldn't be concatenating strings with plus equals. Well, I mean, this is sort of correct but you have to decide what you're optimizing because it, I mentioned time ruins all performance advice, but context also matters a lot. And sometimes we can get really excited about micro optimizing, making changes that are technically correct, but which just don't matter at all. So Jeff Atwood wrote a, a lovely piece about micro-optimization theater, which is where we get really excited by doing optimizations and, and we're sort of going through the motions of optimizing it. But the sad part is it doesn't actually make any difference. And he looked at this example of if I change plus equals for a string builder, does it matter? So I think probably a lot of us know that if you have plus equals and it's just in normal code, the Java compiler will optimize it to a string builder for you. But traditionally, if it's if it was in a loop, it couldn't optimize it for you. So this is where you started to see the performance penalty for it. So he did an experiment where he went around this loop for a huge number of times. And I thought, I'll do I'll do the same experiment and see, because what what Jeff found is he, there was a small difference, but it was only a small difference. So I went through the um, the day trader benchmark and I found somewhere where I could change a string builder to a plus equals. So I put that in and I ran my application. Didn't make any difference. So I eventually realized the problem was I was making the change in a method that probably never got called. It was a two string method. So it didn't matter how slow I made it. And this is a case where if I had spent some time going through my code, trying to find things like this, it wouldn't have been wrong, but could I have been doing something more valuable with my time? Could I have been doing something that would make a 
bigger performance difference with with that time. And I think we probably all fall into this habit of trying to make these optimizations because we know how to do them without stepping back and looking at the big picture. And I tend to do this when, when I travel. I travel a reasonable amount for work and that's involving planes. And I, I think a lot about sustainability. So I, I, you know, I, to get to the airport, I try and avoid taking a taxi. I'll always take public transit. Sometimes it's actually a lot more time consuming and sometimes even scary to take public transit, but I do take the public transit and I feel like a hero for doing that. But then I get on a plane and the carbon impact of that plane trip is so big that the carbon impact of the bus versus taxi is almost irrelevant. And you could say every little helps. Surely it's better to be taking a bus than a taxi, even if there is a plane involved. Probably yes. But the question is what, what optimizations am I maybe not doing because I'm so busy feeling like a hero for taking the bus. And that's especially true for something like work where we only have a limited amount of time to optimize. So we have to spend that time where we're going to see the biggest difference. We have to think about the opportunity cost. The good news is that our platforms really help us with this. So I mentioned that in that, in that example where we have the string concatenation in a loop, it's actually okay because the compiler will, will optimize this under the covers. And the best way to get optimum JVM code in almost every circumstance is to write ordinary, normal, clean code, because the JVM builders have so much more time to optimize the code than you do, because it's, it's their day job. It's the only thing they do that you want to be on the path that they've optimized. You don't want to be doing some weird code that they've never seen before, because that's less likely to end up optimum. Okay, but if having heard all that, you know all the pitfalls, but you still do definitely want to optimize. So what you should what should you be doing? There's a lot of tools that help. You won't get very far without tools. Um, Susie Shia from from Netflix again. She was talking about something a little bit different, but she said that you what you can optimize is limited to what you can observe. So you have to have the instrumentation in place to allow you to measure. So when we're talking about debugging, we talk about observability, but it's actually the same for performance optimization. You need to have that information in the system so that you can access it and optimize. There's a few different categories of performance tools that you may find useful. A method profiler um, tells you how much time is being spent in each method. There's a bunch of free ones available. So visual VM, um, mission control. If you are using OpenJ9, IBM Health Center, um, which is a tool that I architected, so I, I know it, um, is, I think it's, it's a very nice tool. Another technique that you may find useful is something like flame graphs. Um, I couldn't find a good Java flame graph tool. Um, so I don't have a recommendation for that, but certainly look out for flame graphs. Um, when you're looking at analyzing your GC to see, figure out how much time am I spending in GC, what are pauses the cause of a latency problem, um, GCMV is a good free tool for that, which again, I wrote um, a long time ago. Memory leaks may be something, or just memory bloat, may be something that you want to analyze um, for that. Eclipse and MAT tends to be the standard tool. You can also get more sophisticated. So you get can get tools called APM or application performance monitoring tools, and they will look at the whole package. A lot of these do tend to be proprietary. Um, there is an open source tool called Glowroot that I haven't personally used that is um, that is 
open source and in this category um, or you can go for something like new relic or app dynamics or dynatrace all very well respected tools and then finally if you're in a microservices context you need to have something that can handle the distributed nature of your application so you're going to want to be looking at what your distributed tracing tools are telling you so there you're looking at things like zipkin or jaeger or just more generally open telemetry microservices bring their own set of challenges for performance optimization though because if you work on a microservice and you make your microservice really optimal was that was that micro optimizing because maybe your microservice is only used a tiny amount and it really isn't the bottleneck so someone needs to be having that higher level view of where the organization should be spending its time to avoid micro optimizing and sometimes you really need to know the whole context in order to be able to make the right decisions about what to optimize so in that example of the bank and the mobile application and the tellers the mainframe application was working great for the original context for which it was designed but then when the context changed when it was being used in a new way it needed to change it had new performance requirements it's also really important when we are looking at our measurements to think about the edge cases and queuing theory you don't need to go too deep into queuing theory but i would recommend doing a bit of reading about queuing theory and performance because queuing theory helps us understand where the disasters happen it helps us understand what happens when a whole bunch of little little suboptimal things mean that a whole bunch of jobs end up mashed together and causing this huge delay because it's those huge delays it's the it's the bad things at the edges that make users really angry and so the the, the professional experts don't look at the 50th percentile you need to look at the 99th percentile you need to look at those edge cases because ultimately it's not about what your dashboard is showing you it's about how many of your users are angry and how angry they are there's a cost aspect to this as well so slow performance can cause angry users and lost revenue because in the cloud time is money because in the cloud footprint is money those performance non-optimum things can turn into big cloud bills um, there was a great blog that got written a couple of years ago where a team accidentally deployed something with an infinite loop obviously an infinite loop is a very bad performance problem but between the time when they deployed it and the time that they realized the problem they had a $72,000 cloud bill just from this infinite loop. And so a more subtle problem can also turn into a, a big cloud bill if it's deployed at scale. And we're starting to see some nice tooling coming in in this area. So backstage cost insights, it's not intended for performance optimization, but looking at some of that cost information can give you some really good hints about where to look to do the performance optimization and i mentioned this matters because of cost and it matters because of users but i think there's an even bigger reason why it matters and this is where i get to the polar bears my kids i think possibly like all children will not turn the tv off they finish with the tv and they just leave the room and it drives me bonkers and eventually i i snapped um and i said to them every time you leave the tv on you're being a polar bear murderer because the all that energy for the tv is just being wasted and it's a little bit the same for for all of us for the it energy that we're potentially wasting i think that there is a moral imperative for us to avoid waste because of the sustainability impact of what we do and that means we shouldn't 
waste electricity and we definitely as well shouldn't waste hardware because when hardware is built it gets embodied carbon that's the carbon that was used to build it so we want to make sure that after the hardware is built we don't just have big bloated loads running that need more hardware than they should and in, when we think about the scale of the problem data centers use about one or two percent of the world's electricity and it's the software that we write that is running on those data centers using that electricity so we should be trying to optimize as much as we can to write software that uses fewer devices that requires fewer devices to do that we need to have software that has higher efficiency lower footprint so we can get away with more density more multi-tenancy because single tenancy is a big driver of extra devices and we also should be thinking about how do we optimize these devices by giving them a longer lifetime so let's optimize our software to allow it to run on old hardware for longer ideally wouldn't it be lovely if we got to the end of planned obsolescence so that my phone is only a few years old and it needs to be replaced because I can't update it anymore. It would be nice if a lot has to change to change that, but it would be so nice if we could have things that lived for, for longer. So to, to wrap up, um, I'm looking forward to your questions, but please to, to take away, optimizing is, is so worthwhile for so many reasons and it can be really fun problem solving as well. But the principle that you should take into optimizing is to start by measuring, not guessing. And even though optimizing can be fun, focus on optimizing where it matters, not where it's most fun. Thank you very much. Hello, Holly, can you hear us? I can, yes. Nice. It was a great presentation. Thanks a lot for hanging in and joining us in the Q&A session. How are you feeling today? Yeah, not too bad. As you can see, I'm in a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> you seem quite busy. We have some uh, questions coming in. So uh, we would like to start off with one interesting question from one of our viewers. So he's saying, We've recently increased the performance drastically just by upgrading the Java and Spring versions of our services and dependencies. Do you believe having the latest equals the greatest applies here for optimization? Yeah, definitely. I, I'm sometimes a little bit afraid to upgrade, and I think also something bad will happen is I upgrade and it will get slower if I upgrade. But in fact, almost always the opposite is true. Like it, if you look at the performance of the JVM, it just gets faster and faster and faster. And it kind of makes sense that that's happening because they have performance engineers that are just working on it all of the time. And so they just keep making those improvements and we keep finding new things as well. Like um, one of our practice software engineers was sort of looking at the practice performance and then he sort of went further down the stack and he looked at Medi and he was like, oh, make this huge Medi difference. And so I don't think it's actually in a release yet, but it means that like next time you have Medi, you're going to get this amazing benefit just by changing the version. So definitely, I mean, there's all sorts of reasons to keep on the latest version. Security is a really good one as well. But, you know, if the security isn't enough to persuade you, then the performance improvement should be. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Um, cool. Sorry, Holly, can we just ask you to speak a little bit louder, please? Because sure, yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, it's quite you, noisy here. <laughs> uh, do you have some red flags that uh, tell you it's time to think about optimization? Anything that comes to your mind? Yeah, this is a great question because I think there's sort of an idea that we just want to make it faster, but it's actually really worth thinking about what what your performance requirements are before you start and so then that means that you instead of sort of going oh i think i should optimize but i don't know if i need to optimize you can be really sort of crisp and say okay we knew we needed to get it responding within 100 milliseconds and it's not doing that so let's fix it but you're not going to waste your time on like well the throughput's kind of slow but it doesn't actually matter so don't don't worry about that just worry about where it matters and of course, you know, the ultimate red flag is if users are complaining, and then you've got to fix it. <laughs> yeah. That's always a red flag, I agree. 
Um, in that regard, maybe a more technical question. So you showed us a very nice JVM uh, setup with the parameters, and you said we should be careful when we copy paste stuff. So now I'm curious, are there any specific configurations that we should consider for our JVM setup that people forget or don't know about? What do you think? Yeah, to be, to be honest, I almost always go with the default. And again, I think it's one of those things that you, the default is, is such a good starting point. If you're having a problem, then you can do the analysis and then maybe you'll see, oh, actually, we're, we're in a slightly unusual scenario and we need to change something. But for almost every case, the default will probably be the one where they've spent the most time optimizing it. And that's, <laughs> that's where you want to be. Yeah, makes sense. OK, mm -hmm. cool. Thanks. Um, one last question we have for you. How do you go about selling this idea of optimization to your manager and to the board? The people who pay basically your salary and tell them <laughs> it's worth investing time into this. Yes. Yeah, it can be always so hard to sort of make the case for things that aren't features. Um, you know, it's just like, how do we make the case to, to fix technical debt? Um, and I think, I think really it's about speaking their language. And it's about figuring out what what their problems are. And so if if there is a user impact to the performance, then figure out or a business impact to the performance, figure out what that is. And then that's what you want to be pushing at to be able to say, look, our competitors are faster than us, so we need to do it. Look, you know, for these similar projects, they lost users because they weren't fast enough. So we're probably going to be losing users as well. And really frame it not in terms of hey, this is a fun little technical challenge for me, but this is going to make a difference to our business and here's why we should do it great well i think there are no more questions uh from the public uh, for us that we have prepared so uh thanks a lot for your time and for the presentation it was great having you and have a nice and productive day thanks so much i hope everybody enjoys the rest of the conference we thank do you. as well. Thank you again for joining, uh, even though you are part of another conference currently. Uh, it was very nice seeing you, and we hope uh, probably we see you next year as well. Super. See you all. Bye. Bye, Holly. Well, that was a quite interesting beginning. Um, now it is time to move on to our next speaker. And uh, um, I hope you had enough time to uh, ask your questions to Holly. As we already mentioned, she's part of another conference, so she won't be joining us today for the panel discussion. But if you are um, interested in um, speaking to her, we can send you additionally her uh, channel so that you can ask her questions, for example, or, or Twitter or on LinkedIn. Um, so moving on to our next speaker. And that is Cameron McKenzie. He uh, is a software engineer and a Java enthusiast. He is also the editor-in-chief um, of the Notorious Java News platform and website, um, theserverside.com. And he is author of uh, multiple best-selling books like What is WebSphere, Hibernate Made Easy, and Pickering is Springfield. Sorry. Um, so uh, we are actually waiting for him a bit to join. Um, in the meantime, if you have uh, any questions to us or you want to just uh, add anything uh, when it comes to the volume or if we speak too quickly or anything else, just drop a comment in the private chat and um, yeah, uh, we'll give you now just two or three minutes to refill your coffee until um our uh, friend uh, cameron joins cameron us joins. and then we'll be right back with you
So uh, we have news that Cameron is here. Um, it's uh, we want to welcome you, Cameron, uh, now to the day on conf. Can you hear us? Oh, he's preparing himself. Hello. Good morning. Hey. Good morning. How are you? We're great. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Can't complain one little bit. Can't complain one little bit. <laughs> Glad to hear that. Only about the time difference, but that's okay. We're very thankful that you managed to join us from all the way from Canada. Oh, it's great to be here. It's great to be here. So we give you the stage um, to talk about why we teach developers to hate Java. Really? Well, that sounds kind of inflammatory. It's, uh, <laughs> it does. Well, it's one way to kind of start the day. Um, awesome. <laughs> Uh, feel free to share your screen and uh, start your presentation. Okay, let's see if we can kick this off. Okay, well, hopefully right now you can take a look at the serverside.com. Just a quick question. Does that come up on your screen? I do hope it does. Well, welcome. I'm Cameron McKenzie. I'm the editor in chief over at the serverside.com. I've been teaching, working with Java for, well, I hate to admit it, but maybe the last 20 years. And, you know, it's it's become more and more apparent to me over the last little while that that, you know, we're not teaching people to love Java anymore. Maybe 20 years ago, we did. There was like this enthusiasm for this brand new language that was object oriented and was cross platform and was easier to run and use than C or C++. Wait, but Cameron, uh, yeah. we just wanted to ask, is it intentional that we see the stream? That you're seeing which? The stream. The stream. Uh, we were streaming just a lot. Yeah, yeah, perfect. If that's OK with you. Yeah, this I mean, is server side, but a minute ago we we were seeing oh, the stream. So. Well, the stream looks good too, but um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we could throw it over there. Um, but yeah, uh, that's one of the things that we've seen uh, over the last few years. People have been, uh, you know, historically we've taught people to love Java, but um, nowadays it seems like we're we're teaching people to to hate it. We're not teaching people to love it anymore. Um, as I mentioned, I am the editor in chief over at theserverside.com, one of the large, largest online magazines for, for Java. And we date back, well, right to the early days of Spring and Java and J2EE. And uh, I've been the editor over there for about the last 10 years. So I've really seen a big swing in the industry. Now, this whole thought came to me, well, it came to me probably about, I don't know, maybe six, maybe eight months ago, when a very good friend of mine wanted to learn Java. And so I started showing her the ropes and showing her some of the basic stuff. And, and her first reaction to me was, you know, why is learning Java so difficult? And I was like, well, compared to what? She was like, well, compared to learning Python, compared to learning JavaScript, compared to learning some of the other fundamental languages that that uh, she'd been introduced to. And so I started digging into some of the ways that they teach other languages. So for example, I looked at a, a couple of Python courses. And you know, if you take a Python course, or even take a JavaScript course, quite often, well, they'll send you over to an online website like, uh, well, I like replit.com. It's a, it's a great site for learning how to program in a bunch of different languages. So any course that teaches Python these days, any course that teaches JavaScript these days, just say, head over to an online site like replit.com and create this, click on this beautiful blue button, click create, and then select, I don't know, in this case, it could be Python, create a replit, and then instantaneously in just a couple of seconds, you just start writing some code and it's done online. And of course, if you're 
learning Python, well, I don't know, how do you print something out in Python? How do you do hello world? I think it's just something like print hello world. Like something like that. Actually, I don't even know if that'll compile because I don't write Python and I don't uh, teach Python and I'm not even sure if that would compile in Python. But if it did, that's kind of how they'd start you out, right? Just a simple print, hello world, run it. Next, all of a sudden, within 10 seconds, you've just written your very first Python, JavaScript, Rust, whatever language it is. It, it, and you've written your first program and you're feeling good. You're feeling confident. And you want to go into for loops and while loops and start getting object oriented. Now, compare that to Java. Go find any course online about Java. Go find any course online about that has to do with a Java boot camp. So I don't know, here's a Java programming for complete beginners over on Udemy. Kind of scroll down a little bit, take a look at the beginning of the course. And this is just one that I picked randomly, but these people are teaching Java, but they're also teaching people to hate Java. So look at this, right? You want to learn Java? So first start. Okay, great. Okay, go install Java. Right? Okay, fine. Which Java do I install? Because there's like a hundred different Javas to install. So is it the Amazon Java? Is it the Oracle Java? Is it the Open JDK Java? Is it the Adoptium Java? Is it the Oracle Java? Maybe even the IBM Java that we should install. And then just step number one, you've already flooded this beginner, this person who wants to learn Java with this confusing question of like, which even Java do I install? Okay, and then that's fine. And then what version? Right? Like, well, obviously the latest version. Well, obviously not the latest version because we don't put anything that's not an LTS release into production, right? So no, maybe it's not the latest release. Well, should it be Java 17? Well, you're probably not using Java 17 in production. Well, should it be Java 11 then? Well, maybe the course that you're teaching is still on Java 8 because we've got all of these different long-term support releases that people are using. So, you know, somebody has just written a program in python in 10 seconds and we still don't even know what version of the jdk to install on our local machines and then once you've done that well then what's the next step okay well the next step is obviously you've got to configure java home right because your java code won't work unless java home is configured you do that then the next step is configuring the path and the next thing, you've messed up Java Home, you've messed up your environment variables, you've messed up the system path on your computer, and now nothing will work. <laughs> like, let alone Java, but all the other programs that are supposed to uh, be referenced through your operating system's path are messed up because you put a semicolon somewhere that it shouldn't be, or a comma somewhere where there shouldn't be a semicolon. And then you haven't even started writing your first program yet. So what's the typical thing that we do when we start writing our first program, right? Well, we got to have to hit that main method, right? We've got to start going in, writing our, our very first main method. You want to write a little Java program? Well, you've got to go in, you've got to write the good old, okay. Well, actually you can't even do the main method, right? First thing you got to do, you got to create a Java class. Okay? Then the Java class has to have this main method in it. Public, static, void, main, string, arg. Now you've, you've lost people at this point. You've lost the new developer. Why, why, what is a class? Why are we creating classes? I just want to print out hello world. Okay, now I have to have a method. Well, this method is public and static and void and main. Like the concept of static, like if you're teaching a Java class to somebody, the concept of a static variable or a static method is something that doesn't make sense until somebody actually understands object-oriented programming and polymorphism and how variables are allocated in Java. And all of a sudden you're throwing this term out at somebody within minutes of, of, of teaching them Java, of, of having them learn Java, you've lost them, right? You've lost them at that very moment. Um, and let alone the fact that you know, on top of this, you've probably got to put this Java class inside of a package, which is some subfolder mechanism. And then after you use the subfolder mechanism, you've got to add this package statement to your code. 
people aren't happy at this point in time when you start trying to teach them Java like this, because you're not teaching them Java, right? Like at this point in time, you're teaching them to hate Java and they're going to start running back to Python, to JavaScript, to Rust, to any of those other languages that are going to make learning so much easier. And I, I understand that by judging a language by what it takes to write a hello world method is well, it's probably probably a little judgmental <laughs> maybe a little unfair but the barrier to entry is a real thing right like the more barriers we put to the entry into the the java ecosystem the java language the harder it is to be to get people to adopt the language to start working with the language and to love the language. And there's no question to me as to why people are rushing to Python these days, why people are rushing to JavaScript, why people are rushing to peripheral languages, because that barrier to entry we've made so difficult in the Java ecosystem. And so, yeah, when I started talking to my friend about learning Java, when I started talking to my friend about, um, what it was like to learn other programming languages, I was amazed to see how they teach other languages because they make it easy. They make it so simple. Now, as I said, you can go on to these sites and um, even if you wanted to start trying to create some replets for Java, even coming back here onto this replet program, you go into create a program, you can create a Java program, they make it pretty easy here. So starting and creating a little Java program with replit.com. Well, you know, even then make it doing it online, they kind of made it a little bit easier, but still you know, we've got this horrible system out print line. Hello world. Boy, oh boy, they're not making life easy. And as I said, we're starting to make people hate Java not love it. Now, I don't know, what can we do? What can we do to adjust this and get people to start loving Java again? Um, there's things we should be doing. There's things that we need to start doing differently. And we need to start doing it differently right from the ground up, right in colleges, right in online courses, in Udemy, in Pluralsight just the way that we present and introduce java to people absolutely has to change every time you you learn a different programming language you you're often taught um REPL, right you're often taught just the basic command line interface to get the language working that's what we saw in python just a, a moment ago it was just the, the REPL environment for python um with Java, we're always creating standalone applications. Well, why? Nobody writes standalone applications anymore. Um, we did that 25 years ago, maybe, and even then we weren't doing it that often, but we're certainly not doing it a lot today. Um, so why do we even start off with this public static void main stuff? Why do we even go in that direction? You know, Java with JShell, now has an amazing REPL environment where you don't have to create these Java classes. You don't have to have uh, a main method. You don't have to start throwing around public static when you start writing a program. We can start teaching people Java online. We can start teaching people Java simple concepts right out of the, the, the bat without having to get overly complicated. Here's a, a site that I actually like quite a bit. It's called One Compiler. I'm gonna come over here and see if I can create a, a new application. I'm gonna create a new application and let me see, I've got all sorts of different languages here. One of them is JShell. So, 
look at this. All of a sudden, we are now changing the world in terms of how we develop and how we teach Java applications. So starting off, here's JShell. System.out.println, hello world. This might disturb a few Java professionals, but I'm going to click the run button right there. And all of a sudden, look what I've got. I've got hello world. I've done it. I've done my first hello world program in Java. A couple of things of note. There's no class written here. There's no public static void main. There's no keywords that are going to confuse somebody that's new to Java. There's no array of strings being passed as a crazy argument into the method. It's just a simple system.out.print hello world. And it works. And in fact, you can even do some crazy things here. Now, I got Tighten this up a little bit. We don't even have to have the print lawn there. <laughs> so we could actually cut this down even a little bit more. So there we go. Our system.out.print is still working. We've still got our hello world here. And I can even do some other crazy things as well. Now, this is going to disturb a lot of people. This is going to disturb a lot of the, the purists in the world of Java development, but Boom. I'm actually going to remove that semicolon and run my code. And all of a sudden, the great controversy of whether you should have semicolons at the end of every statement in your code, whether you're coding in Java or JavaScript or any other language, well, all of a sudden it rears its ugly, ugly head here because even in this environment here in Java, we don't even need a semicolon at the end of our code. Now we should. We should always put a semicolon. I'm definitely pro semicolon. But just the idea that we can start writing Java and have all of these rules that are typically thrown at people, all of these requirements that are demanded of people, have them all just go away uh, by using an environment like this. Well, it's a big step towards getting people to love Java instead of getting people to hate Java. So just take a look at how long it took me to write that one piece of code. <laughs> you bring up a tool like one compiler, you do a quick system of that print line. You don't even have to worry about a missing semicolon in your code. And look at all of the things that you can learn in a second. Look at all the things that you can learn. I mean, while somebody else might, in fact, still be trying to figure out what version of the JDK to install on their local machine, or even worse, trying to figure out why they can't compile code because for some reason they've installed the JRE rather than installing the JDK. Again, all of these confusing things that we put in front of new developers when you know we really should be teaching them to love the language, but instead we're teaching them to hate it. So in the amount of time, that it takes you to write a line of code or maybe two lines of code using this environment. You can learn so much more than in any of those other courses where people are teaching you to hate Java. So for, for instance, right off the bat, taking a look at this simple application, a simple line of code. One of the things that you learn about Java is that, well, it's not verbose, right? Because that's one of the big slags that we get when we start working with Java. And you see it, I mean, it's difficult to defend against when you see something like this to print out hello world. People always say, Java, it's too verbose. Java, there's too much ceremony. There's too much needless code. And I would say it's very difficult to argue against that when in order to just print out hello world, you're demanding somebody say public class main, public static void main string arg system out print line hello world, semicolon, end bracket, end bracket, and eventually have something missing in there that's going to cause it to fail. But look at that. It's not verbose. Now, given that maybe you're working with Python, 
maybe instead of system.out.print hello world, it's just print hello world. But that's not verbosity, right? Ver verbosity is uh, being verbose is using more than the required amount of words to get something done. That's verbosity, right? If you're verbose, you're using too many words. Java is not verbose, right? Like, yeah, maybe Python uses only print instead of system.out.print. But that's really because, well, it's because Python doesn't have as many functions and features as Java. I mean, that's the, that's the crux of the whole point. In, in Python, they don't have like windowing options. So for example, in, in, in Java, you can do hello world, but push it up into a dialog box. You can do hello world and you can push it off into, up into a J option pane. You can write to the system log, system.out. You can write to the console, system.console. Um, you could even quickly do it to an input or output stream using scanner. So in Java, if you want to print something out, you've got many options. And so in order to address the fact that we've got many options in Java, well, you can use system.out to do a print in order to print to the system. You can do system.console to print to the console. Use a J option pane to do some windowing. And so in Java, yeah, it's maybe we've got a, a couple more words in order to print something out or to perform a function system.out instead of just print. Um, but that's because Java's got more packages. Java's got more features. And also Java is properly object oriented, right? So you need to go through an object in order to access a resource. And so when I look at this, I don't see verbosity. I see expressiveness. Right. So we end up teaching people that, yeah, Java, it's not verbose. Right. I mean, this is verbose. <laughs> this teaches people verbosity. This teaches people that, yeah, there's too much going on in Java. This teaches people, no, it's not verbose. It's expressive. And also Java has an incredible number of, of packages and resources and components for doing different things in the Java ecosystem. And as a result, yeah. Maybe we need a, a couple more words in there. But if you're going to say another language like JavaScript or Python, um, it doesn't use as much words because, well, it doesn't have any as many services. It's not as object oriented and basically doesn't have as many functions in Java. That's a weird flex. Right? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we use less words in Python because it's not as good a language. Okay. You win that argument, well done. But yeah, something as simple as this, we're now teaching people, no, you know, Java's not verbose, right? Um, Java can be simple to achieve simple things. Um, Java is expressive, right? In our Java code, uh, we use words, we use objects to describe very succinctly what's happening. Are we printing to the console? Are we printing to the output stream? System.out tells me that we're printing to the output stream. So these are good things, right? You're teaching people why Java does stuff and the benefits of doing it that way, especially compared to other languages. It emphasizes the fact that, yeah, in Java, we have extensive libraries, right? We've got an extensive set of packages in this JDK from Swing to AWT to Util to IO that allows us to solve problems in many different ways. And maybe I shouldn't say solve problems in many different ways, because I don't like this idea that, you know, there's so many ways to do, to achieve an end in Java, because usually there's one proper way to do it. Um, it's just that there's a lot of different things you might want to do. And Java addresses all of those. A great thing for people to learn, um, and a great thing for people to learn early <clears throat> If we want to start teaching them to love Java, not hate Java. But even on a simple program like this, you know, a simple program like this, what else can you learn? So again, let's just keep in mind that everybody taking that Udemy course, everybody taking that Pluralsight course, everybody who's doing their first week of Java in college, they're still trying to figure out how to install the JDK and configure Java Home, right? So we're way ahead of those people. What are we learning while they're still trying to, to fight with environment variables. Well, lots of other things there is to learn here. Well, I mean, one thing is 
you should have a semicolon, but you don't have to. And that's pretty crazy. Like that's pretty interesting. Um, that in fact, yeah, Java, when you're using J shell, it unshackles itself from the need to use semicolons. Um, other things you can learn very, very quickly. I mean, and it's just simple stuff, right? Like, you know, Hey, in Java, you know, your, your strings need to be placed within double quotes, not single quotes. Right. So you're learning more about Java as you do a little example like this. So something that we've, you know, we've learned already. Let me see if I can run that. J shell does some crazy things for us. So sometimes something will work in J shell and will actually surprise you, but there you go. As we're, you know, working in this environment very, very quickly, you throw a single quote in, you end up getting a quick error message back saying, Hey, you know what? It's double quotes, not single quotes. So, you know, right here, if you made a mistake, very, very easy to come in and just fix that mistake. But again, we're teaching you another important part of the Java programming language that, well, strings are put inside of double quotes. And boy, um, I love Java. I do dislike IntelliSense. <laughs> Um, other things, you know, you learn right away. Well, I mean, another big one, you know, just from an example like this, you learn that Java is case sensitive, right? So again, people are still trying to learn how to install the JDK and configure Java home. But if we push people into these types of online environments, um, they're learning things about Java right away. So, you know, a simple mistake, like a, a lowercase letter there for your system, well, that's going to trigger an error right away. You know, you're learning. Yeah. Okay. Java needs to have uh, uppercase letters when uppercase is required, lowercase when lowercase is required. Um, so you're, you've learned all of a sudden, yeah, casing is important in Java. Um, and when you get that wrong, well, you get immediate feedback, right? We can see that error message right away telling us, pointing right at that, that lowercase s that, you know, there's a problem there. Um, and, you know, it seems minor, but I know that 20 years ago, when I started learning Java, when I first picked up a, a Java programming book and did all of those things that you need to do about installing the JDK and configuring Java home, I started writing a program and, you know, I made that a mistake that new programmers often make, which is I wrote, a, you know, 10 lines of code out of the programming book that, um, and then tried to compile it. Of course, you should try and compile stuff as soon as you write it, but I didn't know that when I was starting out. But Another thing that I didn't know when I was starting out was that Java was case sensitive. It, nobody really emphasized that in the, the book that I was reading. And so I couldn't compile my code. I couldn't get things to work. And uh, of course, I had this entire public static void main thing where I'd probably put an uppercase C on the class and an uppercase C on the public and a lowercase s on the system. I was overwhelmed with error messages from stuff that didn't even have to do with the, the, the code that I was really interested in, in running. Um, and then of course the sets of error messages were overwhelming. I'm just trying to learn a, a simple programming language through a simple hello world. And all of a sudden I'm, oh, I'm overwhelmed with all these messages that I just can't figure out. Well, when you're using an environment like this, <laughs> It's very simple. You don't have to write all of those lines of code. And then when you do encounter an error, you can find it out very, very quickly. And of course, hitting errors is a great way to learn. And so another thing you quickly learn when you're inside an environment like this and you write a simple program like this is that, yeah, you know, Java is case sensitive. So what did we learn? It's not verbose. It's expressive. There's an extensive set of libraries that allow us to do things in a variety of uh, to achieve a variety of different ends that java is object oriented that's why we're going through this system class that's why we're using the output object to print something out um well we've learned some fundamentals like the fact that strings have to be placed inside double quotes another interesting thing that uh, we can learn right away as well is white space doesn't matter right? so if i put a bunch of carriage returns in there um, Put a couple of spaces in here as well. I can run my code and it will run without problem. So again, all of these things that we can quickly teach people about Java right away without having to worry about the overhead of getting everything configured, people can start learning immediately. 
And so again, Java white space doesn't matter in, in some languages. Well, it really does. Um, what's the other thing we've learned? Well, it supports um, REPL, right? Um, it, it supports this environment where, well, you can quickly write batch programs. You can uh, quickly write scripts. You can uh, get input from users, write quick expressions. We don't have to get uh, uh, pigeonholed into this world of creating standalone applications all the time. And if you look at any other programming language, you look at the Rust, you look at the Golang, you look at the Python, that's where they start. They start with REPL. Like people always compare Java to Python. So they look at how easy it is to, to write a program in Python and always throw this public static void main in the Java developer space. Well, have you ever seen Python to write a standalone application? Have you ever seen Python for uh, having a standalone application that actually gets an array of environment variables passed in as a string? I got some news for you. It's verbose, right? It's got to do that whole main method thing. It's got to do that whole passing arguments thing in there. It's got to import modules in it to make it happen, something that Java doesn't have to do. But when they teach Python, they don't teach people to do that. I mean, you learn Python for a very long time and never actually write a standalone application because Who's writing standalone applications these days, right? Like, I mean, you're not creating standalone applications. Even if I wanted to write a major application today, I wouldn't uh, write it and deliver it as a standalone app. I mean, I'd write it as a, I don't know, I don't know React Native app. So I'm going to go to a mobile device, use a, an environment that will deliver it as a web page, right? You're not doing windowing applications in Java. And even if you wanted to do a batch program, we'll do it like this, use JShop. So there you go. You've learned another important topic about uh, Java. You've learned the fact that it supports a REPL environment, something that a lot of people in the Java ecosystem either they don't know about or they've actually never used it. Okay, what else? Java's case sensitive. Java makes colons optional when you're actually working in this shell environment. That comes as a big surprise to a lot of developers, but it's kind of cool. Um, nothing like showing a Java developer a bunch of code that doesn't have semicolons and letting them know that it runs. What else do we learn? Um, we learn that, well, in order to, to write some Java code and start playing around with Java, you don't need to install all of these technologies. You don't need the JDK. You don't need the JRE. You don't need to make a decision about what version of the environment to install. Um, you don't have to configure environment variables. That's all in the past, man. Don't get people to do that. If you ever sign up for a class, look for the syllabus for a class, read the course outline for the class, and the first five hours of that class are just getting the environment configured, just setting up an IDE, having you install Eclipse, installing the JDK, don't just walk away from that class, but run, run away from that class because they're not going to teach you to love Java, man. They're going to look, teach you how to hate it. So other things we need to, that you learn about Java right away, you can learn it online, right? You don't need that overhead of installing things on your computer and getting things configured. And these online environments are amazing because you can write your code here. You can put things into one compiler. You can put things into REPL. And once you're done writing your code, well, it all goes into your um, it all goes into your history of code that you've created. So you can come in here and take a look at all the different pieces of code that you've written in the past. And you can see there's me testing JBang, and there's me writing a little Java ternary operator. That's something for the faint of heart to do when you're learning Java. That's for sure. Um, but you've got all this code now stored online, easily accessible, and you know, even more importantly, you can go in there and you can just start sharing it with people, right? Like if you've got a pro problem, you just share a link to your replit, you share a link to your uh, one compiler code to a friend, ask them what's wrong, they'll go in, they'll troubleshoot it, they'll help you out with it. I've even had some of my friends, you know, they post a little problem that they've got on Twitter, 
And a lot of times if they post a link to the replit on Twitter, they end up having a tweet that has more engagement than their very best as a developer type tweet that they put out there. So not only that, it's but this ability to share code with others and get feedback from others um, and publicly share your learning journey. And that's an incredible way to start learning programming language, right? You're no longer just hunkered down in your office late at night, typing things out from a, a textbook, but you can actually become collaborative. Use your build your help. Use it to build your social media presence. Um, encourage engagement. All as you learn Java publicly and get help from from others. Um, uh, in fact, uh, it was just the other day. Uh, one of my friends posted a couple of things about learning to code in Java. And next thing you knew, there were like three or four Java champions jumping in and, and helping out. Um, and it's just amazing how, you know, somebody who's learning their first line of code in Java can post something online. And next thing you know, some of the, the, the biggest stars from the industry are jumping in just to, to help out. So what are the things that we start learning here that again, you know, as we are learning these things about Java, uh, other people are still doing the installation. Other people are still configuring Java home. Well, I mean, we can learn online. We don't need an IDE. We don't need to install Eclipse. We don't need to install NetBeans. We don't have to install anything from JetBrains. A little big shout out to the people at JetBrains because I do love their stuff. I don't know. What else can we learn? Well, I guess we could always throw in a little for loop or something like that and take a look at how braces work. Um, we also learn, well, even just right away here, we don't have to get crazy with braces, but you know, we've learned that in Java, well, we've got strings have to be put inside of double quotes. We've also got the fact that methods, and you can see Java is object oriented. So we've got the system object here. We've got the print method. And when we call that method, it has to go inside of these round brackets. Right? If you forget the round brackets, your code is definitely not going to compile. And I've got a little attempt to do that right here. Very easy. And so we've learned more methods have brackets and we've also learned objects have properties. So we've got the system object here. The system object is going to print to the system log. So we've got the out um, property there. That property has got a method and the method is hello world. I should probably tighten this up because I actually want to make sure that our code compiles. Although I will get rid of that semicolon just because I love seeing some Java code that doesn't have semicolon there. And so all of a sudden we're teaching people to love Java. We're teaching people not to hate it. And again, just in 10 minutes, right? While somebody else is configuring their environment, what have we taught? Java is not verbose. Java is expressive. Java has extensive libraries. Java, when you use strings, they have to be put in double quotes. The white space in your Java code, it doesn't really matter. So use it as much as you can. We know that Java supports REPL, something that people don't think Java does. We know that Java is case sensitive. So make sure you get your uppercase and lowercase letters straight. We know that well, it's a good thing to put semicolons at the end of your code, but in a REPL environment, you don't necessarily have to. Um, we know that you don't have to install a JDK or an IDE to get started. We know that you can learn this online and share your learning journey. We know that uh, methods have brackets around them, so, so those round brackets, so make sure that we don't forget about those. Um, might also learn that uh, Java has braces as well, but we didn't get into a for loop there. And we also understand that Java is properly object oriented. When we want to do something in Java, we always have to go through some type of an object. That's why we see the system object there. We know that those objects have properties. So system has a property called out that can give you access to an output stream. And if you want to do something in Java, you have to call a method and you see that print method here. And so I think that's 12 different things that we've now learned about Java in just a moment by doing things a little differently, by getting away from the great, big, long main methods that print out our code, this public static void main 
type of stuff that we've done in the past. And we've jumped right into REPL and we've quickly learned 12 things about Java that you wouldn't have learned for another half a day, maybe two days in a traditional Java programming course. And I would also say that not only have we taught you 12 important fundamental things about Java uh, in a very, very short period of time by taking this approach, but I would also say we're not turning people off because that barrier to entry in the way that we've traditionally taught people to program in Java is a big enough barrier to entry to push people right away. For people to say, you know what? I'm just gonna give up on this. I'm actually just gonna move over to Python, start working with JavaScript because it all seems a whole lot easier. And if people are starting to take that attitude, well, we're gonna start losing the hearts and the minds of Java developers. But you give them low barriers to entry. You make it easy, you make it fun. Uh, you make it simple for people to, to learn the fundamentals of the programming language. People will quickly learn to love Java because Java is an amazing programming language to work with. And so, yeah, keep it simple. Ditch all of that ceremony. Uh, ditch the idea of this is how I was originally taught to program in Java. Because this is part of the problem. It's like people just don't want to change. People that were taught Java 20 years ago, people that learned how to program in Java 20 years ago are still using those same strategies today. Uh, this, the, the training techniques that people used 20 years ago are the same ones you still see in colleges. And that absolutely has to change, right? Like why aren't people changing with the time? Um, yeah, people need to adjust their approach to, to teaching Java. Um, as I said, it's not 1996. It's not the year that Java was released. Um, there's new techniques out there for getting Java into the hands of young developers. And, and we need to embrace those, right? We need to start pushing them and we need to get away from the way that we've done things in the past because it's just going to turn people away from Java. Uh, we need to take this attitude of keeping things simple and avoiding all of the the, the crazy rules that we put around Java as well. Um, and, you know, part of it, the problem is how we teach Java, but part of it is just the philosophy that many people have in the world of Java about how Java just, I don't know, has to be difficult and has to be complicated. You know, I worked with some PHP just a, a little while ago, um, and I'm not, I'm an enterprise software developer, so I don't get to see PHP too often. But I was amazed by looking at a very complicated application where we had a bunch of PHP code. And in that PHP code, we had HTML, and then we had database queries embedded inside of it. Those database queries would quickly pull back some data, and when that data would come back, it would quickly get rendered on the page by embedding the results with some HTML. It was mind blowing when I looked at it. The other great thing about it was if you made a change to your PHP files, your PHP files were sitting right there on an Apache web server. And so those changes as you're doing development would become uh, rendered in your web page immediately. If you just do a quick refresh, you know, it's like you're working with JavaScript and the changes come up immediately. And I looked at it and I thought, I was amazed by how elegant it was, how simple it was, how easy it was to work with, how easy it was to maintain, um, and just how simple it was to create very complicated database-driven applications. <laughs> the thing was, I thought, geez, I wish Java could do this. And then I thought to myself, Java can do that. We've actually got a way better technology for doing that. Java's always had a better technology for doing that. In the world of Java, we've always had Java server pages, right? And with Java server pages, well, if you've got a Tomcat server and you've got a Java server page file running on your Tomcat server in your local development environment, 
you can embed all of the HTML in that page that you want. In fact, it can be nothing but HTML and it'll work. And then you can just put a, a little scriptlet tag in there, a little expression tag in there. And then you can embed a real simple database query, get content back from MySQL DB2, pull it into your file, print it out. It all works very, very simple, very, very elegantly. And it would look very similar to PHP. It would look almost identical to PHP. But unlike PHP, you would have the entire Java ecosystem at your disposal. All of the hundreds of different packages and libraries and classes that are available in the JDK, all at your fingertips inside of this simple Java server page file. But as beautiful, as simple, as elegant as that complicated PHP application was that I was maintaining, you could do that in Java. You could do that in JSPs. We've got an equivalent and better technology, but you would never be allowed to. People in the world of Java would never allow you to write something that simple using a JSP. Quite frankly, you would be shunned, right? You can't just put code into a JSP. You know, forgetting about the fact that PHP has done it for years and been incredibly successful at it. No, in the world of Java, everything has to go through a front controller first. And after you go through a front controller, well, then you actually have to go through some servlet code. And then that servlet code has to spawn a bunch of variables that get put into the request scope or the session scope. And then after you put it into that scope, then you can call on your JSP. And of course, you have to make sure that all the database connectivity is done inside the servlet and passed into a component. Then the JSP can come and then render all of the resources that are pulled out of the request object. And that's the way that it can work. And if you're not doing it that way, you're not doing it right, even though the PHP world has shown us that, well, you can do it that way. And not only can you do it that way, but they've been incredibly successful at doing it that way. And it's success that Java could have had if we didn't put these silly rules around our Java code that says everything has to be done with this over in this overly complicated way. I write tutorials for the server side all the time. And Whenever I'm creating tutorials for the server side, I always try and make them just as simple as possible. I always try and just, well, take a look at the concept that I'm trying to teach somebody and then just focus on that. And a couple of years ago, I wrote a little article about inversion of control, how inversion of control works in Java. And I want to do it through a web application just because, well, it's easier for somebody to replicate and also, uh, it uh, is a little bit more real for people than well, a standalone application. So I wrote the code in a JSP. It was real simple. Um, little method in a web-based Java component. Uh, output that you would see in a browser. It would be real easy to copy the code, put the code into a file in your Tomcat server, local development environment, run it, and see how the concept works. And I was beaten down by the community like you wouldn't believe. The simplest, easiest to use little application written in a JSP that anybody could copy and paste and put into their own dev environment and reproduce and learn from. And I was annihilated for it. Why would you do it in a JSP? Why wouldn't you do it in a server? How can you teach somebody this concept by not first having a front controller and then taking this application and then packaging it in some sort of a war file. And then after packaging a war file, doing some sort of Jenkins deployment to push it to the server and blah, 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 so that you're doing it right. Not so you're teaching people, not so you're making it easy, not so you're making it possible for people to love the code, but because you're doing it the Java way, the proper way to do it. And honestly, it was just mind numbing to me. I was like, seriously, are we seriously um, giving flack over a simple example that we need to overcomplicate and make impossible to understand just so we can do it the Java way? Um, 
And that's got to stop being the jab away. <laughs> that has to be stop being the jab away because we're not teaching people to love Java. When we do that, what we're doing is we're teaching people to hate Java. And that's something that we need to stop doing. So anyways, I'm coming to the end of this opinion piece, this diatribe, this soliloquy on Java and what I've seen happening in the industry. But to sum it up, you know, this is really the message that I think we need to get out there. And it's that Java is an amazing programming language. Java has incredible things to offer in 2022. We've got the best object oriented programming language in the industry. We've got a language that supports functional programming in a way that it never did before. We've got features in the Java programming language that have been taken from Groovy, have been taken from Scala, have been taken from Kotlin. So we are at a point now where the Java ecosystem itself, well, maybe a few years ago, people could say, oh, I definitely prefer to use Scala, I definitely prefer to use Kotlin. Those arguments are harder and harder to make because the architects have seen the best things from those languages and brought it into Java. And so Java is an incredibly competitive language with more features today than it ever had in the past. And it makes more sense today to be using Java for web development, for enterprise software development, um, for REPL, right? for doing batch processing than it ever has in the past. And adoption of Java should be accelerated we shouldn't be seeing Java get usurped by Python. We shouldn't see adoption uh, uh, of Java getting usurped by JavaScript. All great languages, but they're not Java, and they don't have all of the things to offer that Java does. But the problem is that we're fighting for the hearts and the minds of the young people of the people who are going to be making the decisions in the near future about what programming languages to use when they're spinning up a, a web service or they're building a database driven application. We're losing those people right from the start. We're losing those people on day one and we're pushing those people away from Java and we're pushing those people into other languages. And that needs to stop. And the first place we need to look is how we just teach Java, how we introduce Java. And we need to start using modern methods. Look anywhere at a Java class that's being taught today, and they do it the same way they did it 20 years ago. And it worked 20 years ago. It doesn't work today. So stop it. <laughs> stop throwing public static void main at people. If you see a class like that, don't walk but run away. Stop with the local installations of JDKs and JREs and IDEs and class paths and environment variables. Get people learning online. Don't make this uh, an isolated, independent, lonely experience. Make it an experience where people can share their learning with others, that they can learn in a public learning environment, that 100 days of code, that 100 days of Java type of environment where you're sharing your learning and you're sharing your progress and you're sharing your challenges with others. Don't force people to do it, you know, on their computer, in their office, late at night, disconnected from the rest of the world like we did 20 years ago when we didn't have the connections that made it possible to connect with push the public learning of Java and use these types of tools. Use tools like Replit, use tools like one compiler and teach people the simple and easy way to, to start programming Java. And please start teaching people to love Java. We need to stop teaching people to hate it. And there you go. That's all I had to say today. By the way, as I said, I am Cameron McKenzie. I'm the editor-in-chief over at theserverside.com. 
you want to learn anything more about Java, you want to learn about Git, enterprise development, microservices, DevOps, Scrum, Agile, I would say head over there to serverside.com. I think uh, also probably be co-publishing some of this over there too. Um, you'll see plenty of my opinion pieces over there. But there we go. I don't know if there's any questions, let me know. But hopefully I've given you some food for thought today. Yeah, you sure did, Cameron. Thank you for uh, your thorough presentation. Just a few questions we have. Uh, multiple times you've mentioned that there's a rising popularity of JavaScript and Python that would probably, uh, if uh, Java taught the same way, would override Java. Do you think if this switch that you talked about during your presentation is made, Java will still be on top? Because as um, you've probably seen, when it comes to statistics, JavaScript is top listed, uh, looked for in uh, scale in developers these days. Yeah, the, um, the, the, the J Java has lost the, the, the mind share uh, on all of the, 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 um, on all the surveys of what the most popular languages are out there. Uh, JavaScript and Python are now uh, doing better than Java. And I think Java, you know, led that, that the statistics for the last 20 years, they're always one or two. Um, Will it uh, completely change it? I think it, I, I think it would make a big difference, right? I think there's a lot of negativity around Java, and it's the same 20-year-old tropes that aren't true anymore. Um, and I think those get a lot of play. So I think, yes, I think by changing the approach and changing the perception of Java in the industry, it will go a long way to... Uh, curbing the downward trend that java is on adoption it's not going to change it completely because these other languages are incredibly strong they're incredibly powerful um yeah. and they also have a, a a great place and a great role i love javascript i love node.js i love the fact that uh, i can use that language to write my react applications but also uh, do node and express js on the server side um and there's certainly use cases where JavaScript makes more sense than Java. Uh, um, so, so I would say that you know, uh, it, it's no longer there's no longer an argument that you know there's one language that can do everything. We're going to see these other languages um, certainly carve out their niche, um, but uh, I do think we've gone definitely too far in the other direction where people are moving away from Java into these other languages when it actually would make more sense to be working with Java. Nice, interesting. Um, I'm curious now uh, to dive a little bit deeper. So we already you already mentioned why uh, people tend to hate Java and, and how we can teach them to love it more. So if I put you in a position where, let's say, I'm a high school or a college graduate and I just graduated, I want to go into the world of programming and let's say Java specifically, and I want to become a really good Java developer. What would you tell me? What would you recommend me? How should I go about this? Because it's a very well, vast topic, right? Well, um, I guess it, you know it all has to do with what level you're at um, uh, and where you want to to go. If you're if you're a new developer and you just want to get into development, get into Java, you know the the best thing to do is just work on some personal projects, um, find a personal project that can uh, drive you to do some learning. Um, and there's lots of sample projects out there that uh, they, they suggest new developers do everything from I mean, developing a rock, paper, scissors online application to developing an, an online training uh, uh, quiz, something like that. So, I mean, work on personal projects as you develop. Um, but um, in terms of working with Java in the industry, the money's in Java. That's one of the things that I tell people like JavaScript and Python uh, have much lower salaries than people in the world of Java. Java is used by banks, insurance companies, governments. Those are people with deep wallets. So it's definitely a good career move to move into Java. Um, uh, I would say, you know, get that entry level position, get your Java certification, uh, maybe a spring cert, definitely a scrum mask, a scrum certification too, always looks good. Get that entry level job, find a good mentor, 
work as a junior developer on a team with a, a strong team lead who's going to help you show the way, get experience, um, and then show up. You know, one of the biggest things about being successful in programming is showing up every day, writing a little bit of code every day, and getting better every day. And if you do that, if you show up, um, people will recognize that, and uh, uh, your career prospects will, uh, will will just blow right up. The other thing too is good developers never get to develop, right? If you're actually a good developer, you'll end up get getting promoted out of development very, very quickly. Next thing you know, you're a team lead, you're a manager, um, you're a CE, CTO and a CEO. So, um, but yeah, start off with programming, learn the fundamentals, get a good mentor, show up for work every day, write a little bit of code and uh, success will be in your future. Great, great. Th thanks a lot uh, for, all, for your time and presentation. It was really interesting to see this point of view also for me as a Java developer already for so many years. So thanks again for joining us. Thanks. And uh, get rid of those semicolons. Start writing in REPL and uh, start <laughs> loving Java once again. <laughs> Noted. Thank you. Right. All right, Cameron. Bye. So uh, we have one more presentation on our way until the lunch break. So uh, if you feel hungry, just hold on for a little bit longer. Uh, next up on our list is Otavio Santana. He's an architect, a software uh, engineer focused on cloud and Java technologies. Otavio is a distinguished member of the Java Champions and Oracle ACE programs. He has deep expertise in polygon persistence which includes also high performance applications in the areas of finance, social media, and e-commerce. And also as a NoSQL expert, Otavio has worked uh, with many databases and their APIs. This includes the Jakarta NoSQL specification, which maybe you've heard or you haven't, but now I'm sure you're going to learn more about it because Otavio is joining us today and he's going to talk to us about making our lives easier with Jakarta's new persistence features, data and no sql otavio hello can you hear us hello hello everyone yes i can hear you and can you hear me yes we hear you perfect whoa that's amazing hello everybody i'm glad to be here so uh, today let's talk about persistence especially one thing that we don't like to talk much that is the challenge to handle co-design with uh uh how to handle it with database so let me uh show my screen where you might be able to see it right yes yeah it's loading yep we now see it okay okay so thank you everyone uh let's talk about the persistence way uh, uh when we talk about application we usually uh we usually have more maturity to handle that uh we talk about attacher how to affect on your codes documentation i know we usually don't like documentation but but you must you write in and Finally, partners, the designing partners, microservice partners, the saga partners, and so on. So when we talk about application, we usually talk only about the, the, code, the code stuff, where eventually it has more maturity in several ways. Uh, in another perspective, the database Whoa, this one is hard. It's pretty hard to handle that and work with that. Especially because we we wondering the maturity because uh, when we talk about database, we don't have enough documentations. We don't have enough uh, tutorials, books, and maturity models to handle that. And uh, I mean, if I want to reflect on your code on the on the application side, I'm easy to go, right? So I just need to go to go code use and modern IDE where I able to rename 
everything. I'm able to rename even as a whole class, uh, for example, right? I'm using person and then I want to use uh, human. So it's easy to go. So go, refactoring and so on. And it's eventually will happen when you talk about evolutionary architecture where there is no way to run or escape uh, about agile methodology. So we need to keep my my code moving progress and get more maturity as much my business get maturity. So it's, uh, believing in application, if that will change, is impossible nowadays. Uh, but even if that, do a factory inside the database it's hard, it's a pain, right? We don't have enough documentation about how to refactoring my database. Uh, yeah, we have the evolutionary architecture book where they have 12 chapters, I guess. The only one chapter will cover the database details. So it's hard. And each context and each business might have a different way or a different perspective to handle that. Besides, uh, we're able to see several fights between uh, developers and database around NoSQL, right? Uh, and SQL and new SQL. And indeed, right now we have over 400 database so it doesn't matter if you're gonna choose SQL, no SQL, new SQL you're gonna have a huge flavor to choose and it's hard it's a pain to handle with a lot of data flavors and options to work on it uh one second let me share here my old presentation to you to put more graphic perspective on this way so one second here. Um, this way here. Let me stop and show again. So I took the wrong one. Can keep you see my screen? No, yes, maybe. So let's stop and share again. Uh, one second. One second. So you might be able to see my screen. It's loading. So it's time to talk about NoSQL and SQL database, right? And it has a usually a huge drama to handle with this, especially because with SQL and OSQL, we still have to handle with design partners. And we're still wondering if there are better flavor should I choose? It's hard. And of course, let's check out the Google. Why not? Uh, and the app design, we have a, a huge amount of documentation and books. However, in the persistence layer, or on the persistent side, we have a few documentation around it. So, as I said, we have a broad knowledge around the tattoo, effect on documentation partner. But on the NoSQL perspective, we have a lack of documentation, maturity models, and yes, I use flavors. Furthermore, think about it. Usually, when we talk about no SQL or SQL, new SQL, any kind of persistence layer in the database, it is usually the first thing that we do. And the first thing that we do usually is where we have no idea about the business or even the business is not mature enough to write everything in stone. And also we did that, it's hard to change. It's really, really expensive to change. And it's hard to keep moving, it's hard to change, it's hard to refactoring, it's even harder to maintain the architecture on the evolutionary way with data. Plus, on the set four, we have over 400 
NoSQL database with SQL, NoSQL, and NewSQL. If you are familiar with NoSQL, you might know the several types that we have. Uh, those are the most famous one, key value, that looks like a map and key, uh, where I have the key and only find my information by the, the, value, uh, the key and then return my value information as a blob. The column family, where I able to find my information by the key or some secondary index, but it looks like the key with more uh, options and flavor. The document, it's more the most closer to SQL that we have, and graph where you're able to do uh, queries even deeper uh, than with relational database, and of course, uh, SQL database or relational database and the hybrid solution with new SQL. Okay, as I said, we have application layer, we have data, database layer, OPSS layer, and yes, we need to handle with different paradigms. On my application side, if you are a Java developer, you might know objects. So we have interface, uh polymorphism and so on and on the side i have my persistence layer for example here my relational database where i need to handle with tables and of course every time that i do a query i need to do this conversion and there are several studies that they believe that around 90% of the query returns results you'll be spending on the translation process. What does that mean? So I do a query in my Hibernate. If the query occupies one second, 900 milliseconds will belong only to the translation between SQL and your object. And of course, we do have the mismatch. What does mean? What does that mean with mismatch? Because we are Java developers, of course. You might be a Java developer, and we might enjoy a lot of objects. So we have heritage. We have polymorphisms. We have encapsulation, and of course, we're able to have types and create our own types, business value, and so on. And of course, our favorite database does not support any kind of thing like this. If you go to SQL, you're able to use normalization or NoSQL where you're gonna use query design model or this normalization and structures that usually is far from my object perspective or my design perspective. But, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, when we talk about application and architecture with a huge maturity, we still have the, the priority that we're seek, seeking or we are looking for. We want to write codes closer to the business. That's why we love DDD. Uh, we want to put our code in a, a bigger language where I able to put a person uh, that makes sense to my business, my repository, and so on. Then we we are seeking for isolation. Of course, we don't want to throw an exception about my favorite database or about my favorite language in my user face, right? You probably might see one and you, you might not like it or enjoy it. And the idea is to isolate what matter in application and the technology. Wait, wait, wait. But how can I do it? Avoid exception of our technology. So isolate your business and, and get away from the technology. So if you want to use uh, SQL or non SQL, it doesn't matter. Your goal is to deliver results around e-commerce, for example, finance, for example. And the last one, we you want to have isolation around business code and, and database to get more performance. That's why we are we are reading a lot about database internals. That's why we are 
go to scalability vertically or horizontally with NoSQL, NewSQL, or even NoSQL. The whole point here, we have three layers uh, and mostly of the whole applications. And we are seeking to put all those layers health as possible. Business, I want to write my code closer to the, to the business perspective. Isolation or isolation, where I able to identify where is my business and where are my technologies. I don't want to throw an exception around Cassandra among the B to my user. I want to have a clear error message. And the last one, performance. Take advantage of the database that you are using. And okay, Otavio, you talk too much. So we are exploring database land. Uh, we discuss about application, but, but how do we handle with persistence in Java? Especially because we have a lot of stuff to do. We have a lot of stuff to handle it. How much efforts we take to change, for example, different database, uh, SQL to SQL, uh, MySQL to PostgreSQL, or different types of persistence layer, like SQL to NoSQL. And the latest one, how can I change, how can I able to change my framework that I'm using? For example, I'm using JPA, and I want to put a wrapper inside it, uh, Spring Data, or Micronaut Data, or Quarkus. And yes, when integrate does, we have ch several challenges to take a look. And it is a huge uh, option. So configurations, connection handling, mappings, the mapping, communications to or from my objects, the relationship, the management of transaction, uh, my developer experience, because I need to keep moving fast as possible in my codes. And this couple of my business logic, logic and put that away from my technology or my technical details, as I said a couple of times. And want to return that as much as possible. Should I use caching? Should I custom the query? Should I put some index on it? Should I use a memory cache or database grid? Any kind of database abstraction should I have to, to handle with this kind of thing? It's a huge word, and of course, I'm not able to talk the whole. Uh, everything here in only 35, 40 minutes. But just you to put your mind that when talk about database in any kind of language, we must put attention on both sides. In the language side, it doesn't matter if it's Java or not. Of course, I'm using Java here. And the database integration. And when we talk about database integration and especially Java, we mostly have four types of uh, Java frameworks to handle with that. The first one that we're going to talk today and cover today is the framework driver. This one is closer to the database and far from my business perspective. So as you can see here, it's a sample of JDBC. Uh, you are able to see this kind of API to NoSQL as well, when you decide to go, for example, to uh, MongDB driver or data stack driver to Cassandra and so on. This one here, you are able to go, okay, I want flexibility as possible, closer to the database. And as you can see here, if I'm working with objects, I need to do a couple of codes every single time. That will put me slower usually and trust me i saw several cases where people decide to give away of hibernate to get more performance this way and uh, the result might be the opposite or usually go to the opposite way uh, especially because we will spend more time with boilerplate and you're able to do several op optimization that hibernate does in reflection for example okay so this way here, we're able to do some queries, we're able to do the data-driven design, but pay attention 
it doesn't make sense when you have a huge complex relationship and relation with business logic. But of course, sometimes you're able to do it if you wish, if it makes sense. Again, driver closer to the database, far from the business perspective, you get more flexibility around the database and you get more complexity and bullet plate when you handle with objects or DDD or any kind of thing like this. Okay, let's do the opposite. Let's use Mapper. I'm using here uh, or Jakarta NoSQL or JPA or any kind of solution like that where I have my objects. I put a couple of annotations like my do with Spring Data, Quarkus, uh, Micronaut, and so on. And I will decrease the number of bullet plates, especially because I put some annotation and my framework will handle every, everything for me. And that's is amazing because I will decrease the complexity inside my object and my DDD because I, I will go closer to my object. However, sometimes it not might be good, especially because uh, uh, when you don't care or sometimes you forget about the database, you get so far to remember. Uh, a good advice is try to avoid to use the auto creation of database and SQL database. Uh, try to use the normalization as, pro as possible, especially because the, the relational database has a design, a design to work for normalization. They work waiting for this kind of improvement. So pay attention when you do the mapper. Okay, it's closer to the business, however, far, far away from my database as perspective and of course i put more details here on sql database but if you want to run it with no sql we have several flavors like micronauts uh, spring data no sql and so on the point is pay attention when you go to this way when you talk about mapper we have two more options uh, I guess if you are a Ruby fan, you might know of uh, the partners or the partner, the active record one, where I have my NT, I do uh, extend of my abstraction of active record, I'm done. Doing that, I'm able to do several operations inside my NT class. And that's give a huge power to me. Right, for example, here I'm using Apache Panache by Quacus, where I have my person NT and I'm able to create my NT and do the persistence method. And here you go. I did the persistence way. I'm able to do the list all and it will return the people or a collection of person. And finally, do my own queries. So it's give me a huge power on active record, especially when you handle with simplicity. I able to decrease the number of layers. We usually talk about MVC where I have my NT and then my DAO, my data access object, and then my controller that might be a REST, REST controller or my resource. When we do active records, we have your model. We don't need a DAO because the DAO will be here. And finally, my controller. Uh, it's good, especially with sim when you have a simplicity of complexity of my domain. However, as you can see, I get married with that solution. So it might not be easy to, okay, I want to use a different database. I need to change my extent. As you can see here, it's using Panache. With SQL, if I want to use with Mongo, for example, I need to do to replace that with extend Mongo NT or a new solution on it. So another point is solid, right? So the single responsibility has broken, especially because right now my NT is able to do the business. Besides, or furthermore, with my database operation. And the last one, if you are familiar with DDD, 
we still have our mapping and the whole database operation go outside. So it does not belong to my entity. For example, using DDD, I have my personal repository. You might be familiar with that. And we have my interface where I create it, I instantiate it, and then I will proceed with save. Hey, Otavio, can I do insert update? Uh, with repository, you should not care about it. It will check if the information is there. If it's not there, it will insert and then update. The whole complexity of the database or the persistence layer belongs to the repository implementation. That's why the DD and the Mozilla frameworks use save instead of insert or update. If you want to go, we have another option or flavor that is tau data access object, where yes, we're able to insert, update, delete, and do a couple of operations like this. But in both ways, we have more domain core driven design. And we uh, decrease the code complexity. But in some case, you might not take advantage of the persistence layer as much as possible. OK? Uh, please pay attention on it. Again, communications, the driver, closer to the database, far from the domain. The mapper, the opposite, closer to the domain, the object, and far from the database. Please pay attention on it. On the mapper, we have two different cut types, where one is the active record, where my entity extends a database ex, uh, operation. It doesn't matter if a SQL or a SQL, or I, I will split up in two layers where I might use SQL or no SQL. Or it doesn't matter what I want to use. Move away, when we talk about no SQL solutions and flavors or SQL solutions, so far, the most popular one is JPA, the Java Persistent API. It's a more mature stack solution in Java, especially because it has a huge influence on Quarkus, Spring Data, Micronauts, and so on. You might know several APIs, even if you're not using the JPA Pure. Uh, on JPA, we also have support to a couple of documentations around design partners, uh, active records, repository, data member, data mapper, and so on. And JPA has a huge history around it. We are talking about almost 20 years of maturity of this stack. So it has released uh, 2022 with Jakarta E10, the DPA 3.1. So when you talk about SQL, there's no doubt about JPA. Hey, Otav, I'm not using it. You might use it for sure. If you're using Quarkus, Spring Data, and Micronauts, you might use it. And you, we usually, when you want to use no SQL, you try to use the same API. Of course, it makes sense, right? Uh, the user and my team already knows JPI. Why not keep it? But in the reality, you're not able to, uh, to handle with SQL and no SQL because those has does have different behaviors. Uh, even when your microservice and one service needs no SQL persistence. And one solution is use a specific API to NoSQL, such as Jakarta NoSQL and, no, and Jakarta uh, specification, or Spring Data, where it does a huge influence on this specification as well. The main reason or the main motivation around Jakarta NoSQL is to put the common annotations with multiple APIs and be extensible. Be extens uh, with a huge extension. Extension, sorry. Mainly because, yes, each NoSQL particular behavior matters to us. It makes sense to explore and take advantage of each NoSQL behavior. For example, if I use Cassandra 
I might want to use Cassandra query language. If I'm using uh, MongoDB, I might use some particular behavior or a specific behavior from MongoDB that makes sense to me over my application design. And finally, other set, those are the most popular NoSQL types, key value, document, column family, and graph. In the graph, we already have a standard that is Apache Tinkerpop, where on Jakarta NoSQL, we want to use it as a graph, graph API. And yes, we have the integration API. Hey, Otavio, does it make sense? Why are you using that? Why should I use Jakarta NoSQL instead? Why should I use an abstraction layer? If you take a look on those sample here, we are talking about four different NoSQL database. Those are document types, NoSQL types. And I put a red and blue, as you can see, because those NoSQL database are trying to do the same behavior. However, with different classes, with different uh, methods, class, and so on. However, they want to achieve the same result, the same behavior. The main goal to, or the main motivation around Jakarta NoSQL is simplicity. So instead of you need to learn a new API, learn once and apply everywhere. So the same four APIs using Jakarta NoSQL, and yeah, it's possible and it's available. Okay, but sometimes I don't I don't need even I don't need even to show to my engineers or my developers to handle with this API with this persistence API. I just uh, just want to handle with a repository where me as a senior engineer will delegate the whole operation to my architect team. And yes, we have one thing that we are working on right now, that is Jakarta data. Uh, the Jakarta data, as far I know, is the second Jakarta E specification. The main goal is to work in data agnostic area. It has approved and it is initial step phase. We are able to take a look and, and know how does it work. So join us on this mail list and yes, you are able to go check out the GitHub repository and so on. And the our first fe feature that we're working right now is the repository pattern. So for example, here I have my business layer. And uh, each one should I use? Should I do my PCC layer based on REST client or JPA or NoSQL? The answer is sometimes I don't care uh, as a developer. So I will handle or I will delegate that to somebody else, right? So based on that, I have my repository interface. I have the implementation with each provider. So each provider will take advantage of the specific database. This way, me as developer, I able to focus more on my business perspective or my business layer. And of course, the DD repository was the first step. We are looking more for options. As uh, next step, we're gonna have CQ or else, even driven design and even DTO. And more ideas are coming. So please join us in the mail list. And that was our persistence layer saga. As you can see, there is no perfect solution. Everything has a trade-off. Everything has advantage or disadvantage when we work with NoSQL. The main goal here is to show how the database are improving in the architecture layer, especially with these APIs, where we want to give more developer experience on a specification with Java way, especially with those specifications. JPA to work with uh, relational database, you might know it. Jakarta NoSQL to work with uh, NoSQL database. Uh, and the last one, you be an abstraction layer where able to abstract and use agnostic data partner on Java, the Jakarta data. 
And that is it for us today. So thank you. Is there any question? Please let me know. Hello, can you hear us, Otavio? Yes. Yes, okay, nice. Great. Um, thank you for, for the presentation. It was uh, quite interesting. Um, uh, we have a few questions prepared for you. Um, Michael, can you start with the first one? Yes, of course. So uh, I'm curious, you said you mentioned that uh, the Jakarta that is going to abstract both the JPA and the NoSQL drivers. So does that mean that uh, you support both non-blocking and uh, you support both reactive and non-reactive communication or blocking and reactive? in the specification yes the answer is we will okay but remember it really depends on if uh, provided by provider we're gonna have several uh styles of repository where we're gonna have the crude repository the basic one the paging repository that is a crude operation with uh paginating uh, the asynchronous re reactive, we're going to support several ways. For example, we are able to support the flow repository where it's a flow, the reactive way by uh, the Java APA from Java 9 or higher. And of course, more flares of reactive like WebFlux, like Spring Data does, and so on. So yes, we're gonna have support for that. Nice. So In basically, if, ways. if you're if we're currently let's say using JPA standard, we can add this abstraction on top, and then at some point we can switch to a NoSQL database. Is this is my understanding correct, or I'm missing something? Yes, we're able to change easily between SQL and NoSQL with this repository interface. However. Remember the idea of the, these two or this API is to make your life easier. But we should need to understand the SQL and NoSQL database, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when you switch between SQL and NoSQL, you might also to change the modeling of the, the SQL database. For example, with SQL, we handle with normalization. With SQL, we usually go to the opposite way with the normalization or query uh query, query modeling design yeah exactly and so all of that is going to be basically abstracted by the api right so you can let's say keep yes. your java modeling or entity modeling one way and then the the way that you have modeled it in the databases respectively sql and no sql it's completely detached so you can kind of make the switch without with using the api right yes that's the idea only change the configuration, the properties, uh, you know, the provider, this kind of thing. Really cool. Awesome. So um, since JNOSQL started as a separate specification from GE, is it supported or is it going to be other frameworks like Spring? Yeah, oh, that's a good basically. question. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 that, that's, uh, sorry. I... Yeah, yeah that, that's the question. That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't worry. Uh, it, it, it is a, a specification from Jakarta. So uh, Jakarta NoSQL is the API. Mm -hmm. And JNoSQL will be the implementation of Jakarta, Jakarta NoSQL. So those are, they have a time integration, right? So Jakarta NoSQL API, JNoSQL the implementation. So the idea is to move both on some path. When we release the new API, we must also implement on JNoSQL and so on. Nice. And when, when do you plan to release it? Do you have any date already? Uh, it's supposed to release this year, but uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the discussion. We discuss about configuration, especially because I don't want you to do the same thing that JPA does, that is put uh, credentials inside the application. I don't like this approach, and mm -hmm. especially with the traffic application, right? So the idea is to 
override this information through properties or system environments. And based on that, mm -hmm. we created a Jakarta NoSQL or Jakarta configuration to make it easier to us. And right now we have Jakarta data. The idea is to three of those specifications go to the next release, Jakarta E11 next year. Okay, I see. Right, and after it releases, uh, just a final question in that regard. Um, if I run a Spring Boot project, would I be able to integrate it with Spring easily or I have to switch and decide if I won't be able to use it? The goal is to make it possible to switch. That's why we have in our board Quarkus, Micronauts, IBM, Oracle, and so on. The idea is to everybody has your own implementation besides, mm -hmm. of course, the Eclipse Foundation. This way, uh, you're able to switch easily. If you take a look right now, everybody's doing or is trying to do in any kind of repository. The idea is to standardize. This way, okay, I'm going to use Quarkus. Okay, the same interface. I'm going to use Spring. Okay, the same interface. I'm going to use uh, Helidon, Micronaut. It doesn't matter. Everybody will follow the same interface. What you can do is do more specialization. And of course, when you do more specialization, the API will not support it. Okay, great, great. Thanks a lot for your time and for the presentation. Yeah, That's thank you, Tavio, yeah. for uh, participating. And um, thanks, everyone, uh, for, for listening. Um, before we head to the fridge for the lunch break, since it's, that's what we have next, we have a brief overview of what we have um, after that, right at 1 p.m. We continue with two more presentations, uh, one from Vladimir and one from Dimitri. Then we'll give you a brief 30-minute break to grab some fresh air, a cup of coffee or tea, and prepare your questions for um, our guest speakers that will be joining in the panel discussion. And uh, then um, we will just wrap up the conference and we'll, you'll be good to go. Uh, for everyone that wasn't able to join for the first part of the, the conference or any part of it, don't you worry, we'll have the stream be shared with you uh, later when we finish. So expect that to uh, be able to rewatch the presentations as well. And I think this is all yeah. for us. Thanks a lot for joining and see you in an hour and a half around. Yeah. Bye. Bye.
Hello, welcome back. I hope you had a nice and refreshing lunch and you're ready for the second half of the day. So for anyone who's joining us, we were just uh, uh, we just had three presentations done already, uh, which you will be able to find uh, after the stream ends uh, is a shared link. And now in the upcoming hours, we're going to have two more presentations and finally we're going to wrap it up with a panel discussion. So on to our next guest. Yes, so we continue with our next presentation that is from Vladimir Dejanovic. He is a founder and leader of the Amsterdam Java User Group, Java One Rockstar, speaker and senior director at PBH. 
he en enjoyed developing software mostly in Java and uh, JavaScript. However, he wrote his fair share of code in Scala, C++, PHP, and many other languages. Um, always interested in cool new stuff, free and open source software he is, uh, which brings us to the topic he is going to present today, how to kill most in first steps. So, hi Vladimir, hey. um, tell us more Hello. about the monster you're going to kill today. Okay, let's just see how, yeah, just to share the screen and I'll give okay, window, screen two, no, screen one. Just a second, I'm you know, just having some, trying to figure out how to do it. So, hopefully you see my screen now, right? Yes, yes, we do. Yes, yes, it works. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed your lunch and that you're ready to continue with the learning. Uh, yeah, like you know, all of us who visited the conferences know that lunch is always the interesting part. You know, it can be perfect. It can be like yeah, not so perfect. Uh, again, like I think that you know, with uh, setup like this, the yeah, I like with the lunch that there is no queue. You know, like so, and there is also no surprise what will it be. But yeah, let's start with the talk. Uh, welcome to my talk, How to Kill a Monster in Four Steps. And you know, this is the first time that I'm yeah, giving this talk in a kind of online setup. So fingers crossed, you know, technology works good. Uh, first of all, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Vladimir Dijadovic. Here you can find my Twitter handle, my mail, GitHub blog. Uh, originally, I'm from Serbia and city of Belgrade. Uh, currently, I live in Netherlands and in the city of Amsterdam. And you know. As was you know, stated before already, you know, I'm part of the IIT scene since 2006. Uh, in other words, I'm getting paid for work I do since 2006. And yeah, I develop you know, technologies in all kinds of languages you know, and work on all kinds of projects over the years. Uh, as was already stated, uh, my day job is a senior director of engineering at PVH. Uh, we are the company behind uh, the brands such as Tommy Hilfiger and Kevin Klein. Uh, my night job is, you know, founder and leader of Amsterdam Java User Group, and uh, and also again I'm giving talks at conferences all, all over the world. Uh, I'm basically, you know, the Java One rock star at Code One Star. But enough about me, you know, like you know, so what this talk will be about. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the monster that we're going to kill. Then we're going to talk about the plan, okay? How we're actually going to, you know, execute and how we're actually going to kill that monster, right? Uh, after which, uh, we will discuss on of how to assemble the party of the brave heroes uh, who are actually going to go on, on this journey and try to kill the monster, right? Uh, and then at the end, we are going to look at, you know, execution of the plan. At the end, there will be some types of questions, so, you know, feel free to put your questions in the chat or wait until the end. And again, okay, we're going to try and, you know, answer as much as we can at the end of the session. Uh, before we start, I just want to you know make it clear, like all the things that I'm going to share with you here are from my own personal experience. So you know, take all of that you know, with a grain of salt. You know, my your use case might be different than mine. Okay, so let's start with the monster and its loot, right? You see, uh, the thing about the monsters is that first you need to convince the people that they exist. Uh, that is one of the reasons why on the old maps they added pictures of monsters with words, you know, here be dragons, you know. And when we talk about IT monsters per se, uh, it's a little bit tricky. Uh, anyone working in IT for some time has encountered some really bad code, right? Or some old legacy system, you know, that people were just, you know, like, you know shying away, nobody wanted to touch it, nobody wanted to deal with anything with it, you know, right? So for us techies, uh, existence of IT monsters is reality. The thing is, though, that you know, all of those systems actually started, you know, something like this. Yeah, you know, very nice and yeah, cute projects that needed to bring some you know, new functionality to the business. You know, we were like betting the future of the company or some fancy stuff that they're going to bring. You know, and of course, as it happens, like you know, over time, you know, these nice and cute little thingies, you know, evolve into you know something like this. You know systems that we see today. Uh, however, you know, since they're not a real dragons, you know, that you know, come down, you know, burn the villages and kill the livestock, you know, it might be difficult for business people to understand that, you know, from our point of view, they are actually, a, you know, huge monsters that, you know, we, you know, we want to either to kill or, or you know, shy away from them. 
And the main reason for that is that yeah, we have a different point of view. You see, uh, business people usually see those systems still as a cute, nice systems, you know, as they started, you know, they're bringing some very important functionality to your company, to your business, you know, they're seeing all the money, like either like being generated by that uh, system or, or earned by that system, you know, because in the end, you know, that's the part of their job, right? They're looking from the business side and they are stealing all the money, you know, coming, you know, thanks to that system. On the other hand, uh, tech people have a little bit of different point of view. You know, usually we see something like this, you know, we see all the issues and the problems in those systems because in the end, you know, techies are the ones who are called to fix all you know, upon all of these issues. And usually, you know, you know not, not once you know, it can happen, you know, in the middle of the night and somebody is screaming you know, over the phone saying, okay, like okay, this, you know, that very important system is down, you know. So again, very different point of view at the same system. So how we then con can convince the business people that actually it's a monster? Well, you know, the best way to convince business people uh, or the business stakeholders that monsters exist and they are here with us is to use data, of course. You know, don't, don't go with emotions, go with your real data. Uh, but don't use any data. Try to connect that data to the things that are very relevant to them so that they can understand. Uh, one way that I found effective over the years in explaining that, yeah, okay, we have a certain system and it's a monster, is mostly how you, by tying you know, how much money uh, a company is losing because of that system, you know, like how that IT monsters are causing the company to lose money, because that's usually something that's you know, easily to understand. So in my use case, uh, basically, you know, the business stakeholders wanted to build a lot of fancy new stuff for driving traffic and revenue, very important stuff, of course, on top of a very old and unreliable system. So my uh, main convincing point was the fact that for a month and a half, the data was being sent to the system, while this system didn't really work as expected. It resulted in system dropping all of this data. And worst part was that nobody actually noticed that for a month and a half, you know? And, you know, as we all know nowadays, with all, you know, data scientists, machine learning, AI, and other stuff, data is the most important commodity of any company, and losing it is extremely bad. And, you know, if this issue, for example, happened in this new setup which they envisioned, you know, impact on the revenue and reputation of the company would be catastrophic. Okay, so we convince people that there is a monster, so what next? Well, next uh, step, of course, is the plan, right? We can't kill the monster without a great plan, correct? Well, you don't need to have a great plan per se from day one. Uh, you know, general plan should be good for the start. You know, as long as you have a general idea how you're going to approach the problem, you know, know which skill set you need, uh, you know, to solve the problem, and you're very and you're able to pitch idea in a good way, you should be fine. Uh, of course, uh, you will need to you will need to be able to create a more detailed plan and the roadmaps and everything you know, along the way. Yeah, because again, like you know, you know, general plan is good for start, but yeah, you know, once you start, you need to keep the momentum. You need to keep people engaged. You need to deliver on promise, and for that, yeah, you will need a you know, more detailed plan. So, in my use case, you know, landscape looked something like this. You know, it consisted of a lot of you know systems all over the place communicating with each other, and then you know. Basically, in the middle of all of the setup, of all these connections and the data go, going back and forth, was the spaghetti monster, you know, running on the old hardware and outdated software. And yeah, I must admit, you know, like, you know, by going like from the company to the company, the monster that I encountered the most is actually the spaghetti monster, yeah, which are connected to the half of the systems in the companies, you know, like yeah, it probably started small and then like it yeah, just grew, you know, over time. So looking at this, you know. Kind of beautiful setup, you know. One might say, yeah, this is a deal perfect situation to introduce new stuff, right? You know, something like this. And yeah, this was precisely what you know the business stakeholders you know thought, and that was their, their idea. And their logic is uh, was a very simple one. You know, their logic was, well, it works so far, so why it wouldn't still work, right? Uh, in a nutshell, I said no. Yeah, that's not what we're going to do. What I said, we're going to do this. So basically, we are going to create a middleware. And then what we're going to do is to you know, route all the traffic from the old existing systems and also the, the new system via this middleware to the monster. Idea uh, was that you know, in this way, you know, we could keep the old and the new system still running. 
meet your know, business needs, you know, will bring the sanity into this picture. And again, also the idea was that by doing this, we're going to start cleaning a lot of connections. You know, there was a lot of uh, waste and the redundancy that wasn't actually needed. You know, for example, uh, in the existing setup, uh, every single system that was sending, for example, order to this monster has done it in a slightly different way. You know, the payload was a little bit different, like yeah, the response was a little bit different. Also, the endpoint that was being used was different. So we actually had like a yeah, 30 plus endpoint just for order, you know, instead of just having one. So, you know, by doing something like this, you know, we can slowly start to clean up things. And again, we could, you know, impact that, you know, the, the, basically the impact of a monster gets smaller and smaller and smaller, you know. Also, by having this kind of protective layer, you know, we could keep the monster kind of contained. And again, this was also going to allow us to either fix the monster, modify it as needed, or even replace it, you know, with some other system, you know, without effect on the rest of the ecosystem and business downtime. And that's very crucial, you know. Uh, also, what we did is we looked at all the systems, internal and external. So there's like a lot of internal systems, third party, also like in all kind of stuff that interacted with this monster. And we roughly split them in, in two groups, in the systems that push data to it and the systems that were pulling data from it. Uh, since our biggest concern from day one was, you know, losing the data, uh, because again, that happened in, in more than one time in the past and it really hurt us. We said, okay, the phase one is going to be like moving all the direct, direct connection from the, all the systems that are pushing data to the monster to go via this middleware. Then we said, okay, like yeah, the, the phase number two is going to consist of moving all the read and pulling data from the monster, again, you know, to go to, to the middleware. And again, you know, then we said, okay, and the phase three would be somewhere in the future to see, okay, what we actually do with this monster when it's really contained, where it's really put back to the size and the place where it actually should be. Like I said, you know, we might do modification, we might we might buy some other system, we can maybe build some other system. Again, in the in the end, you know, the functionality that monster that this monster provided was very, very, very much needed you know, in the company. You know, it, it wasn't you know there just you know, because you know somebody fancied it. And you know, I think that's something very important to keep in the back of our mind that any kind of monster that exists in uh, some company. It exists because it's adding real value and it's put, you know, giving some functionality, which is very important for that company. You know, that's why it kind of also, you know, evolved, you know, and became this kind of crazy monster, you know. Okay, so once we convince everyone, everyone that there is a monster that needs to be slain, and we have a great plan on how to do it. The next step, of course, is to gather the brave group of heroes that would go on this quest. You know, they would go you know, on this quest, kill the monster, and you know, be, you know, reap the rewards, and you know, be ever song in, in in the songs, right? Forever and ever and ever. So you might think that you know, since everybody is on board for this quest, everybody you know, understand the importance of it. You know, then of course the budget and the resources that you're going to be able to use for this quest are going to look something like this, right? Endless amount of money and resources just at your disposal. Well, at least from my personal experience, that's not really the case. You know, in reality, uh, in you know, at least what I saw, in most cases, uh, it goes something like this. Yeah, you're given a green light to kill a monster. You're given a wooden sword, and then say, "Okay, go now and kill it." Right? Uh, of course, I'm exaggerating, right? You know, it, it's not really like this. Uh, but reality, you know, is that you know, probably you're not going to have new, no new additional budget. You know, like you know, the budget cycles usually go once per year, and you know, and then you know, when it's when you have a budget, that's it, it's set. So you know, you can't expect that somebody is just going to you know find the bags and bags of money laying around and you know give it to you and just say go for it. Uh, similar thing is also with you know additional headcount. Again, like you know, usually it, it, there's a whole cycle and it's you know, approved once per year. So again, like you know, that you know, all of a sudden somebody is going to you know pick you know pull like the new headcounts like 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 the you know the, the rabbit out of the hat it's it's very unlikely which brings us to the fact that you will probably have to be very creative you know in this and again here also plan and general plan comes in place uh, you need to have you know, some rough idea actually on what you're going to do and who you actually need to do it you know how many people what kind of skill sets and basically, if you have that understanding, then you know what your skeleton crew is going to look like. So the minimum number of people that you actually need, you know, to move along. 
My suggestion is never ask for skeleton crew. Always ask for more. Because if you ask for more, you might get more, you know. But again, you know, what you need to be very, you know, uh, strict and again, like, uh, transparent to everyone from day one is, okay, what is actually skeleton crew? So you must say, okay, guys, you know, like I'm asking for this. However, this is the bare minimum below which we just can't go. And be very strict on that and be very like, you know, forceful on that and say, okay, like if anybody offers you less than skeleton crew, then just say, no, that we're not going to do it. Because doing anything, you know, with, that, with, with you know, a small number of people than the skeleton crew is destined to fail, you know, from day one. So there is like just no, no reason for you to spend the time and resources and energy on something that will fail for sure. Also, the uh, reason why you have, should you know, have like general plan but not super detailed plan is that you know, also your plan might need to maybe adjust, you know, depending on the skill set that, that, that you get, you know, like, you know, because maybe you say, okay, like I need this, this, and this. But again, like actually, actually we have like you know, this and this, this skill set laying you know, around that we can use. So then you, you need to see, okay, how can, you, how can you marry all of that? So as mentioned before, in my use case, idea was we were going to create a middleware of basically some APIs, you know, that would connect to like uh, the old systems, but also the new fancy stuff that we're betting a future on with the old you know, legacy system. Uh, and so again, what we decided from day one, of course, which was very easy, we we're going to do this by you know building the APIs, and we were going to do that to because of two simple reasons. The monster already exposed the APIs and all other systems were connecting to the via APIs to the monster. So we are just you know, kind of like you know, rewiring, okay, okay, don't go to this to URL, basically go to this URL and theory everything is going to work. And the second reason, of course, is that APIs are cool, they're very like, you know, robust, they're very like future proof. So yeah, why should we do that? Because of this, you know, skeleton crew, you know, that I said that we have to have is basically two Java engineers to build an APIs. Never go below two engineers. Simple reason is somebody needs to do the code review. Somebody needs to look at to validate that whatever you did or the one per, or whatever one engineer did is actually good. And again, okay. So never go below two engineers. Whatever you are developing, two engineers is always the bare minimum that you you can have. Second thing that was also very easy for us to kind of agree was that we are going to look at put all of this in the cloud, in Amazon, to be more precise. So again, we needed somebody you know, to deal with all the infrastructure, the, the pipelines, the monitoring, and all other stuff. So you know, it was a safe bet to say, okay, we need like, a minimum one DevOps person to do you know, all of that. And of course, you know, because you know, this was the agile team, right? You know, we needed one more person, and that was, of course, going to be you know, a product owner. You know, because again, you can't have any you know, agile you know, scrum team without you know, the product owner. Uh, to, and how creative we had to be for this team was the fact that actually, you know, initially for the first few months, I was the product owner for this team. So basically, I had like all my job and basically you know, doing all the work in the company. And next to that, I also had to be a PO basically for this team because we were really that much stretched. You know, like I said, we need to be creative. As time went on, of course, again, like, you know, we were starting to deliver more and more value. Basically, more and more people were actually convinced of the value that we were delivering. And again, you know, we wanted to jump aboard and kind of help us because, again, you know, they saw the whole the benefits for the whole company. So this team grew. We added more Java engineers. We added added a dedicated Scrum master. Basically, we also added, you know, automation queue engineer. And also, like, you know, one thing that I was the most happy with was that, you know, like, you know, we got the dedicated PO. So I can, you know, go and, you know, do only my job, not my job and some a lot of other stuff. Of course, what happens when you have some team and basically the team grows is, you know, naturally also the scope and expectations for this team for this team also became bigger and bigger and bigger. So we convinced everybody that we have a monster, right? We convinced everybody that the monster is real. Everybody under understands that it needs to be killed. We have a plan. We know how to tackle it. We know what we want to do, right? And we also have a party of the brave heroes who actually you know, decided, yeah, we're going to like, yeah, jump on it and yeah, try to kill this monster. And the only thing left is to execute the plan. That should be simple, right? I must say, like, you know, over the years, I saw a lot of people kind of like do these free, 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 first three steps relatively good. And then kind of stumble basically on, on this part, basically on execution of the plan. And uh, I can't stress enough, you know, 
having a great pitch about the monster and convincing people that it's a monster, having a great plan, how you're going to do it, having a great you know party to actually execute it, all of that counts for nothing if your execution sucks. So you know, there's a few things that I saw over and over again that are repeating and kind of causing the people to fail on, on, on this part. So let's let's quickly take a look at them. First of all, and a very important thing is start small. And that I think it's for everything like that, that, that you do in life, it's the most important kind of lesson. You know, start small and slowly grow from there. Error that I see over and over again is that you know people say, okay, okay, cool, this is a monster, you want to kill it. And just like, yeah, let's try and kill it from day one. That's a huge mistake. That's almost never going to, to succeed. And again, you know, and for multiple reasons. First of all, it is a monster and it's called a monster for a reason because it's a huge, it's, it's, it has all kinds of stuff. It's connected to all kinds of systems. You know, just pulling it out you know, for on, on day one, it's, it's definitely not, go, not going to be a lot, very difficult and almost like a, no chance of success. So what you need to do is like like what you will do if you're really kind of party in the RPG and trying to kill a dragon, for example, is you would first try to weaken it, right? Because again, like if you just go and you know throw an axe at it, it's going to just you know, kill you. So first you need to make it weaker. And how we do that? Well, you you know look at the whole monster and see try to look all the small bits and pieces, all 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 the all the parts of that monster, and start trying to chip one small piece. At a time, you know, like you remove, you know, okay, we have this small piece. Okay, let's remove this small piece. Let's let's you know, kill this small piece. Okay, the smaller gets uh, monster gets smaller, and then you basically just you know, repeat, 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 and again you're know, making smaller, 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 weaker, weaker, and weaker. And that's exactly what you need to do. You know, when you're you know talking about you know, the IT monster, look at the whole basically system, and try looking at you know like you know, one small piece at a time. You know, what can you basically kind of like you know, chip off? And just remove it. In that way, when you start you know, basically doing that, there's attraction. There is like a, uh, there's going to be deliveries list that people are going to see. So again, they also want to pitch in and to help you along the way. And again, like I said, this system prov provides probably very important service to the company. So if it goes down and takes the half of the company down with it, that's not really a good way to start a project, right? Another common mistake that I see over and over again is people reinventing the wheel. You know, you know, for some reason, you know, us as you know engineers really like to, to build our own stuff, which for one side it's a good thing, but not always. Not always. Uh, chances are, like I said, is that you will have extremely limited you know, resources, extremely limited time. So you know, leverage any kind of help that you can get. And that means you can you know any kind of tools, any kind of frameworks, free and open source software that you can lay your hands on. Instead of reinventing the wheel, again, and spending the time and the resources which you actually don't have on building the stuff, on, on building some stuff, you know, just you know, pick that stuff you know from from the shelf and just use it today. So you know, try to use your time wisely and really spend it there where you actually need to to spend it. You know, focus on the real value and leverage leveraging what is already out there. Another important thing is to look, especially at the beginning return on investment, you know, because again, probably they're going to be much more work than you can actually can handle and, you know, the team can handle. So make sure to work, you know, on the biggest returns first, you know, like, you know, to, to make sure to that people see the value and again, to build on, on momentum, because if you deliver something then deliver something, then deliver something, also the team is going to be super happy and is going to like plow along. Otherwise, if you like, don't deliver some something for months and months and months, people will just go depressed. So look at the biggest pain points in the current system. Look at the biggest gains. Check if there is some quick win that you can actually like do, and then like, and do it in an extremely fast way and deliver the value immediately. Uh, yeah. Again, because you know, the more you do this, the more people are going to help. So how it looked like in my use case. So as I said before, we had a lot of systems here yeah, pushing the data and reading the data from these monsters. It was kind of in the center of all these, you know, data transfers. And there was, of course, the new stuff that we were supposed to build, right? So what are we going to do? Well, like I said, okay, we're building the middleware. And the plan was very simple. Anything new has to go directly to the middleware, middleware from the start. This is something that you have to be very strict about. 
and you need to make sure that everybody understands it. If even if the old systems want to add some new functionality, you say no. You if you want to add new functionality, you have to go via middleware and not go direct to the master because anything new being added to the monster is going to do the opposite of what you want to actually want to do because you want to weaken it you want to make it smaller so you can kill it easily and if you start adding more stuff it's just going to grow and bigger and become bigger and bigger and bigger right and we don't want that so we said everything has to go via middleware anything new goes via middleware and then you know we connect the middleware basically with the monster and again in that way we can also kind of like try to clean that up and again make it better at the same time because again, usually uh, that's the thing when you're killing the monster is you don't have a luxury of only building the new stuff. You need to look, okay, what, what with the existing stuff, right? How to, to, to clean that up. Also try to identify you know, existing workloads that currently go directly to, to, to the monster and then see how easily or, or how important it is for them to be, again, like okay, moved away. So again, like, okay, take the small connection like here, right? This right connection. Okay, now it's going to, to direct it to the monster. And tomorrow we just transition it to the middleware. Again, everything goes, goes perfectly. And then, you know, repeat this, repeat, 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 constantly building the new stuff, new stuff directly to the middleware, and the existing slowly start migrating basically to this middleware, and in that way, start cleaning it up, bringing order to chaos, making smaller, smaller, monsters smaller and smaller, until we actually come to the place where we can, you know, very easily kill it. Okay, so this was more was the setup that we had. We had old workloads and we had a new workload. And then of course, on the completely other side of the spectrum, we had our monster. Uh, I think what uh, needs to be shared also is the monster was on premise. It was on, on, on the old hardware, on the old systems. It was very, you know, kind of not really updated to the latest and greatest specs. But what we decided from day one is we're not going to touch it. We're not going to touch it as much as we can, due to a very simple reason, we had extremely little time, we had extremely limited resources, and we had some deadlines that we must had to hit. So basically, what we said, okay, okay, what, whatever this monster is and however it basically it's working, we're not trying to not to touch it as much as we can. So we're really, you know, we're not going to spend re, you know resources time on it because it's just not going to return you know any value for us. On the other hand. What we're going to do with the middleware is we're going to build it on the cloud from day one. And again, the reason why we, we said, okay, we're going to go with the cloud is, is again, like, you know, relatively simple. For us, the two most important things were the uptime and basically, you know, the fact that we don't lose any data. And, you know, if you go with the cloud, you, you know, you, you get your know, auto scaling out of the box. You know, like uptime is also like a much, much easier to basically hit and to, to make your application working being like, you know, up to 24-7 you know, than you know, when you actually do it all on the premise. So that's why for us, the cloud was you know, no, no, no thinking, basically. We went with the cloud, and we went with Amazon as a default provider. Like I said, for the uptime, and again, again to get ability of auto-scaling out of the box. For the version control system, and again, like yeah, CICD pipelines, again, you know, for us, uh, there was not really a lot, a lot of discussion. We went with the GitLab. And the reason for that was very simple. Uh, we already used the GitLab in the company. So the GitLab was already present. It was already plugged in into all the systems connected with all the things that we were going to need anyway. So again, like, you know, you know, it's basically came for free for us. So that's why again, okay, if, comes, if it meets your meets all your needs perfectly and it's free, you don't have to do anything, like, yeah, then yeah, just go for it. Uh, again, important part for us was we didn't want to go and you know, click the bu uh, buttons like monkeys. So we want to automate everything. We wanted to have infrastructure as a code and again, be able to replicate easily environments across like development, staging, production. So again, like, yeah, we went with Terraform for infrastructure as a code. Programming language of choice was, yeah, of course, this is thing to, to choose. We went with Java and we said, yeah, we want to go with modern Java. So really the latest and greatest because it's a new thing. So we don't want to go like, yeah, with Java 6 or 7, yeah, because again, why should we? Uh, as I said, uh, we're going to build an APIs because basically that's what we need to do. Uh, so of course you can go with the core Java and you know, build your own APIs and, you know, and go nuts. Uh, but we said, okay, like, no, we're not going to do that. So we looked into some libraries and the frameworks that we can use to make our life easier in building an APIs. Uh, one thing that I need to, to mention, uh, this was like uh, 2019, 2020, when we started this project. And for us, important thing that we wanted to keep you know, our doors open was going you know, maybe Java uh, native. 
uh, reason for that is very simple uh, because again, like you know, uh, the use case for us was you know very kind of like you know you know just get, get the data and push it to to to, to the monster. So there wasn't a really a lot of complex logics. It was almost kind of gateway thingy that we were building. So we were thinking also that again, you know, it might be a very good fit for for you know a native image of, of Java. So that's why we looked at the frameworks that could actually kind of handle that. We looked at Micronaut, we looked at Parkus, we even looked at Vertex, and you know, we made the decision to go with Parkus uh, because, again, the team, you know, felt that it's it's the most closest thing to what they already know. So the you know the learning curve for them was almost non-existing. Uh, for functional text uh, tests, uh, we choose uh, Cucumber so that we can do all the BDD testing in a nice way and again, like, validate if it's actually working as it should. Uh, because again, like you know. We were expecting a lot of data to be hitting these systems. Uh, we wanted also to do performance testing, so for that we use Gatling. And of course, like everybody nowadays, you know, we packaged everything in a Docker, and we shipped it, you know, in Amazon Fargate. Again, simple because of simple reasons. You know, we looked at Fargate, we use uh, Kubernetes, and you know, we saw that the Fargate is much easier, you know, and, you know, to set it up out of the out of the box. Less tweaking needed to to bring it to the level that we needed, and again, like you know, we had an extremely small team, so for us, you know, like, that was a big deal. I would like to point out that all the tools and technologies that you see here were selected because of few reasons. Reason number one is, you know, most important thing is they fitted our needs. Reason number two was again we all we felt that they're really future proof that they will st stand you know, the test of the time, and the reason number three, which you should never underestimate. Is the fact that the team was already you know, very experienced and knowledge about all of these technologies. So basically, you know, the learning curve all almost non-existing. And again, when you're starting with a small team with a small dead with, with a with a strict deadline and very limited resources, again, like, you know, th that is a big deal. You know, you you, you can't say you know, you know what, okay, we're going to kill this monster, but we're going to spend you know, half a year of training ourselves to actually be able to use the tools that we selected. So that was also an important part for us. So we created our API microservice in the Quarkus, and then we connected it uh, with the monster, right? And then, of course, because this is in the cloud, auto scaling and everything, you need to have some API gateway, right, of some sort. Again, a very easy choice for us was we are going to go with the Kong. Reason being, Kong was already in a company for a very long period of time. And again, Kong was also had a nice feature that, at least for us, made sense. It's that it works very nicely in the cloud, but it also works very nicely you know, on premise. And again, for us, you know, for a company, that's very important. So, of course, we connected Kong basically with this uh, microservice. We connected all the old systems to the Kong, and also we connected the, the all the new stuff to the Kong. Uh, one thing uh, that also became obvious to us very fast uh, while we were looking at all these different use cases, especially at the older ones, and you know, which one should be like, you know, transfer first to the microservice in this new middleware that we were building, is that the workloads were very different. They were different in the way that they, you know, uh, not only different in how much data they were sending over the wire and you know, what's the format of, and, and, and how often, but also actually how they interact. Because some of them really kind of like send the request and expected your know, response in the real time. Some would send request and you know, would expect eventually response. Well, for example, you know, if you look at this blue box, it didn't expect a response at all. So it would just fire the data and just forget about it. It didn't care. And also what was very obvious, for example, in, in case of this blue box was that this blue box was sending enormous amount of data, really ridiculous amounts of data. And this basically were you know, the system that were sending the data for a month and a half that nobody actually noticed that it was sending out and that this was constantly being dropped. So because of that, like I said, like it was very important for us uptime. We can yeah, take that with, with auto scaling, but also you know, not to losing the data, especially on you know, these kind of volumes. Then what we said is, OK, like, yeah, but we don't have to respond in the real time, right? So yeah, let's 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 just take this data and just push it to the queue. And again, we selected you know to use Redis for this. Uh, again, choices why we landed with Redis are multiple. Reason number one, you know, you, you know Amazon kind of did almost all the work for you, so you can just spin it up, you know, in in seconds, you know, without any problems. It's already kind of scaled up, and you know, all all the tweaks are done in a good way, so it's really reliable. You you don't have to spend any time on it. And again, small team. That mattered a lot. And again, the uh, other reason was, okay, the team were 
very comfortable with, with Redis. They used it Redis in, in the past. And also the Redis has a very beautiful way of creating queues you know, by using lists. You have like a very atomic kind of operations where you where you can really make sure that you know, whatever you put on the Redis basically stay there. And you know, so you know, for us it was you know, kind of you know five seconds you know, discussion, okay, what we go and we said, okay, let's go with Redis. So we connected basically you know, our microservice with the Redis. So it was pushing all the data to Redis in the queue. And of course, now we need to create another system, right? Who's going to basically you know, pull the data from the Redis and try pushing it to the monster. And again, we set it up in this way, and again, like here, yeah, using the queues and Redis, due to a very specific reason. The monster itself, like I said, was very tricky. It didn't always work. And again, it, it can go out, down for maybe like five or six minutes, then come back, or can go down for half an hour, then come back, or can be like here reliable and working perfectly for weeks. So so it, it, you never knew you know, at which point of time either connection is going to go down or the network or some hardware, or, because it was, it's, again, it's a monster for a reason, right? And also the hardware wasn't really the best. So in this setup, basically, we kind of, you know, divided you know, the concerns, okay, Somebody sends us the, the data, we take this data, we push it in the queue, and we're 100% sure data is not lost. And then we have this system, other system, pulls data, try to push it to the monster. And again, if it, if it succeeds, super, then we just flag it, okay, this was basically sent. If it doesn't succeed, just, yeah, we just you know, return this data to the queue. So we're not never going to lose the data, which is very important for us. Another thing that you know, when we did this uh, became obvious is that we need to do optimization in our code because now we have two different microservices communicating with a monster. And again, like, you know, this communication is something which was very tricky and very kind of like, you know, a lot of work went into that. It wasn't very trivial. So then what we said is, okay, we now have like you know, one place to, to fix all the bugs and issues and kind of and, and tweak it, and we have another. It's not a good practice, right? So we said, okay, let's pull all of this basically code, push it basically into one place. We created Maven module. Basically, just Maven module created, you know, got uh, the life cycles, uh, you know, life cycle of its own, and then we just you know, pull it as dependency in these two projects. Again, you know, in this way, it allowed us that we have one base code, basically just one you know, code base that we need to look into to, to fix all the issues and the problems and fix like that. We can also do optimizations, caching, whatever we want to do, and we do it in one place, and we benefit in in both systems automatically. Again, you know what. You know, we, what also you know, became very fast, you know, obvious for us uh, that we need also, you know, some protection layer. Uh, again, you know, we basically, you know, for protection layer, we went very easily with a key cloak. Uh, again, you know, because, you know, you can spin it up very easily and again, like, you know, and you can really kind of like uh, tweak it to your needs. So we basically, you know, any kind of request coming from from the outside to the Kong, Kong would basically go to the key cloak. And check that you know, the access tokens. Okay, are you actually allowed to interact with the systems or not? And even more, are you actually allowed to hit the endpoint that you are hitting, basically, you know, and, or or not? Uh, I, again, I never really spoke in, into details about you know, the type of data that was flying through all of these systems. But let me just say you know, a few things. First of all, it was uh, you know so it was all kind of you know different levels of the data so some of the data were not really you know that business critical some again everything was in, important for business but not you know if if it goes leaked that you know everybody goes go, going to go nuts but a lot of data was you know like you know, was touching gdpr uh also like you know, a big parts of data where you know, you know had some you know personal identifying information and you know if you as we all know anything gdpr related or pii related you have to you know, treat extremely you know, well and you need to be absolutely you know, you know very on top of it so that's why we needed to have a very nice and detailed granularity not only okay like yeah, to allow two systems to interact with us but also to when you say okay you're allowed to interact okay but exactly what you're allowed are you allowed to read the data are you allowed to push the data are you allowed to modify data and again which data because there's a huge amount of all this kind of data and basically with this setup it was very easy for us to you know to set up all those rules in the key cloak again for kong to you know basically just check that you know depending on basically you know which system you know, hit which URL, and again, like what was the tokens you know for access and and to authorization that were provided in the request itself. So it worked very very nicely, and again, you know, spinning all of this up was very easy for us. So this was basically you know the phase one of the plan. And of course, again, after this, you know, like we went you know from the phase one 
when the phase one was finished, when all the systems pushing the data to the to the most of us, you know, plugged out. Then, of course, we went to the phase two. Phase two, we were, I think, almost uh, at the end of the phase two, and basically, again, okay, and, and we're also kind of starting like now the phase three to actually see, okay, what uh, what the next steps are with the monster itself. So, let us summarize. First step, like I said, is convincing people that there is a monster. Use data and connect the data to something that they are going to understand. Money usually is a universal language for everybody. Uh, create a plan on how you're going to tackle it. And again, it doesn't have to be a perfect. It, I would even say it shouldn't be a perfect and very detailed because, again, like, you know, it can really vary and change depending on you know, how the time goes on and things like that. So you need to have a general plan. And then yeah, you can you know fill in all the details you know when you actually you know, when you need them because a lot of things can change in the meantime you know maybe like the monster stop being the monster or, or again there is some other bigger priority that needs to be tackled. Assemble the party. Make sure that you have a clear understanding and you know be very transparent to everybody what is the skeleton crew and you know that you can't go below that. And of course the only thing left is to you know basically you know execute your, execute your plan. Kill the monster, bait in the lot and glory, you know, enjoy like you're being sang in the songs forever and ever and ever. Thank you. And now we come to questions. Hello. Uh, hello again. So we okay. have uh, one question for you, uh, which to me is a little bit more interesting. So we, you, your example, the monster uh, is something that you don't want to touch and it, you just put it in a box, let's say, and you develop on top of it. But what if you need to develop new features for the monster and at the same time want to get rid of it? Uh, yeah. plan change in that case? Uh, in, in that case, yeah, I, I would say uh, the plan would change. Uh, again, to, to be fully transparent, in my use case, uh, the monster itself was a third party company. So basically, again, again, we were not even allowed to touch it. So if we wanted to, ha to have anything changed, we had to go to the vendor and say, okay, make these changes. Again, in the past, I had a similar situation where we really had a monster, and actually, you know, uh, the picture that they used for the monster was the avatar that they put on a, on a, on a Git uh, project, uh, where, again, we needed to add the new features, but again, at the same time, we want to kind of like, uh, bring it to, to sanity. So there, what uh, what my approach was, and, and the plan was a little bit different. Uh, I try to basically see, uh, okay, first of all, you know, can this monster be split in some way? Because that's usually you know, the, the, the good way that you, you attack it. Because in, in my use case, you know, we had a huge monster. It was giving a lot of functionalities. And one basically part of a monster was needed to be needed to involve. And again, we noticed that if we're going to change it as a part of this whole monster, it's just going to become bigger and bigger and bigger. However, we saw that basically this part has a future has a basically need to really evolve over time, while the rest is was you know the the the, basically the need for the rest of this monster was going down, down and down. So basically, what we said, we we basically what we did, we we split it into two parts. We basically took all of this code, basically we put it kind of like a you know, again we did a lot of refactoring where you just you know, create a package and you just transfer all all the code into this package, make it stand alone, and then you know, basically we split it into two applications. And then in that way, you know, you basically have this new one. Which is kind of less of a monster. It was almost kind of third of a monster. We slowly were adding the the new features, but also we were doing like cleanup and 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 the cleanups. While again, like the other part, we were slowly kind of like yeah, moving towards the graveyard. So I would I would go with that approach if it's possible. You know, if if you really have to you know add a new feature on a monster, you know, really think you know how it's going to you know pay all over the time, and also to see if you can actually kind of like split it up. Again, you don't have to go, you know, crazy with your know, microservices to say like it has to do only one thing. You know, if you have like you know, two two monoliths, it, it's, it's something is better than having just one monolith. And again, like, you, know, yeah. you have the monster of a half of a size, which is again more easy to tackle and kind of like you know, bring bring back to sanity. Yeah, basically the divide and conquer principle, right? Yeah. Apply here. Yeah, make makes sense. Yeah, I have one more question. Um, do you think by defragmenting, as you've already mentioned, uh, you're going to make something um, different than a monster? I mean, if you defragment it into many smaller pieces, you can just uh, make, um, how, how can I say, not the opposite of monsters out of those and just this is the, the way to... Uh, to work it out, like basically uh, refactor the monster by defragmenting it. Yeah, something like yeah, this. something like this. Yeah, 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 
Yeah, that's definitely that's also that's also an option. And again, that's why I said again, like you know, take one small piece at a time, and then you can see, okay, like yeah, is this piece needed? Yeah, and again, is it needed in this way or not? So again, you can definitely you know, either add it to some other functionality, you can create it as a standalone application, you can we can refactor it. There's there's a lot of different ways that, that you can approach it. But I think that yeah, again, okay, you know, like I stated also I tried to explain the talk, it's you know, try it, you know, thinking small and you know, go one piece by the time, you know, again, like you know, yeah. because just go from, from that approach and then you'll know, see where you land again you know what base cooper is best for you and again and you know and but keep in mind uh, also something that again like, uh, i noticed a few times is you know make sure that you know whatever you're building don't become a monster over time because that's yeah. also you know a, a very big danger that people start you know saying okay like we have this terrible thing there we're going to like start you know pulling small pieces we're going to build it you know our own and then it starts to grow and if it needs to grow, it's okay, but just make sure that it grows in a good way. That it's actually, you know, that you know, if it doesn't go beyond the boundaries that it actually should be doing. So that again, it's it's still stay nice, stay documented, stay like yeah, clean code, you know, and, and those kind of things. So you're saying that those last principles you mentioned could be a way to keep uh, something that is growing bigger, not into not turning into a monster. Then, yeah, uh, because again, like you. Know, Precisely, I, I think the biggest problem that at least we had in this situation was that really this system grew beyond what they actually need to do. So it needed, so it functionality that it was bringing was very crucial and very important, and we didn't mm -hmm. want to lose that functionality. But it was connected uh, to systems that it should never be connected. It was doing the stuff that it was never supposed to do, and that's why you know, then it became a, a, you know, the, the, the terrible thing that everybody was afraid of. So again, like, yeah, yeah. if you just you know scale it back and put it actually where it needs to be and what it actually needs to do, then it can be perfect thing and you know just stay there for years and years to come. Yeah, makes sense. Cool. Thanks a lot for the presentation and your time. Uh, it no was really interesting to see how you approach this problem, and I think it's it's going to be very useful for a lot of us. Uh, so see you later in the panel discussion. Yep. Thank you. See you later. Thank you. Thanks. So now we move on to our final lecture of the day. Uh, last but not least, of course, of our presenters is going to be Dimitri uh, Alexandrov. He's a software developer developer at Oracle and also a Java champion. Um, so he uh, is going to uh, talk to us about reactive versus blocking with project Helidon. So maybe you've heard it. If you haven't, now we're going to hear more about it. And also, Dimitri has been uh, has more than a decade of experience in Java and uh, different sectors. So uh, I think it's going to be really, really interesting to see what he has to share with us. So hello, Dimitri. Can you hear us? Um, yeah, think... he, he'll be here in a few minutes. But something else to mention about him, he's also... Um the co-lead of the Bulgarian Java user group. And this is the first time that uh, we'll have uh, someone uh, from the, our Bulgarian side uh, joining us uh, um, here as a presenter, which is uh, quite great for, for the conference, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, hi, Mitya. Hello. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Everything's OK? Yeah, yeah we hear you perfect. Oh, amazing. Thank you. Great, great to be here on this Friday evening. <laughs> Not even great having you. Yeah. yeah, great, great conference and great people here. So thank you for having me. Of course. Um, so uh, feel free to share your screen and. Um, okay, I'll go ahead. So uh, share screen. Uh, let me just see what it is. Yeah, okay. So. Uh, uh, you can probably see my screen, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I will go ahead. So, um, yeah, really, really nice to be here. Um, um, really nice that I'm able to give this presentation. Actually, it is the first time I'm giving it in this way. So uh, uh, I'll be more focused on things I'm not usually focused on. So, uh, so uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, yes, and... Since I'm going to talk about something really, really new, I mean, we're really going to touch the future here, uh, like really touch, see the code working, see the code performing. Uh, the main idea is that whenever you take your business decisions, please have a look 
whether something has changed because you know what company I'm working for? I work for Oracle. Uh, so at Oracle, things may change uh, legally. So that's why, please, take your decision wisely um, and take your decision. Yeah, reading again what has changed. So as I said, my name is Vitri. Um, Mitya, they call me here. Uh, so I write code for Oracle uh, and I work for Project Helidon. And I'm really, well, that's a big, I would say, pleasure to talk about something you really work on. And um, this is what I'm going to talk about today. So uh, write me an email if you have questions, mostly on Twitter, or I know that we have in Sofia, we have this, and not only in Sofia, by the way, we have this uh, Java beer events. Uh, so just come ask me. I'll be, I'm not drinking alcohol, but I'll be like, eager to talk. <laughs> so uh, whenever, whenever you have questions, I'm, I'm always here and always available. Yes, so probably from this conference and from uh, many more conferences, you saw that uh, what is the most common task of writing and uh, what, what the most software developers do uh, for money today? Yeah, they're writing the microservices. So microservices, has certainly became a uh, paradigm that solves a lot of problems. Yeah, it delivers some other new class of problems, but still uh, for really big scalable applications, microservices is definitely the way to do this. And uh, yes, uh, the world has adopted microservices framework and uh, not framework, but you know, the paradigm of microservices since it really solves their problems. and. Um, as a result, we write microservices. And what is the best way to write microservices? <laughs> and uh, you see, uh, I'll be quite honest, this is it, 70 or 80% of the people, managers and so on and so on, say, okay, we'll take a Spring Boot and we'll do it. Uh, I was one of those, I'll be quite honest, uh, because uh, that's what I did in my company uh, before joining Oracle, actually. So uh, uh, Spring is big, Spring is good, Spring is awesome, Spring solves a lot of your problems. Uh, but uh, there is one thing, and this is that it's not a standard. That means that whenever changes come at some point, uh, well, you just have to deal with them, or actually only uh, certain people take the decisions. Yes, this is a... I would say a paradigm, you, whether accepted or not. But uh, if you choose, for example, to work in, 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 in using Spring. But uh, once again, the main idea is that uh, uh, I don't think that community has big impact on that. Uh, so uh, as community does not have big impact on that, there was something which is called microprofile actually. Uh, and this micro profile is a community open source specification for enterprise job services, yes. For those of you who don't know, uh, but it's once again, a way to standardize us to write microservices. Currently it's under Eclipse Foundation, has many participants. And what does that mean? That means that decisions are uh, made like together in a community. So there is a procedure, there are, um, I would say process is there. Uh, you can propose something. You can uh, uh, well accept or not. You can you can uh, be against changes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's why uh, all the voices are heard, and that makes it really awesome. So with high cadence support of this year, it's really something which is uh, evolving quite fast. So you can just check microprofile.io to see the changes there. There's uh, it's. Currently, that's 13 specifications, as you know, they're all specifically made for microservices. This is one thing I usually say to my colleagues that, uh, or everybody who's asked, is it not a Java EE or Jakarta EE? No, it's not. Just because uh, the specifications, which vendors have to implement, uh, and you can easily switch vendor. Uh, so these specifications are made for microservices world. For example, in Java in Jakarta EE, Java Jakarta EE, they are, I will sometimes you know, uh, switch in between. Their main idea is that uh, 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 you mostly work in monolithic environment. Here you work in a distributed environment. Distributed environment has distributed problems. So these specifications uh, uh, 
are exactly for distributed systems which can fail um, you know, unpredictably, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So yes, micro profile is good, and uh, I won't go in much into details. It was born in our eyes. Uh, it's uh, someone in many companies has really adopted. Uh, like you know, we have different um, different uh, uh, vendors implementing in different products micro profile, making micro profile compatible, uh, but. Uh, did we ever think about the performance here? Uh, but not in terms of, you know, like each performer, each um, framework is performing, but about some fundamental stuff, like, you know, uh, how are these frameworks designed? How are these specifications made for us to deliver performance? And actually, uh, uh, we will talk on example of Helidon. So I'm taking this example because once again, I'm working for it. And I believe this is one of the best represent representatives of you know, how things evolve and change and uh, how we start thinking about paradigms and how we actually uh, uh, care much and much about the things we do in terms of performance or compatibility. So, uh, Helidon, I've always, you know, I won't tell again. So I've told it so many times for my two years in work, I always say like, this is a framework for developing microservices. Uh, I really hope that people watching this already know what Helidon is. Uh, so I won't say it again. But uh, for those of you who actually know it, uh, uh, I, I'm sure that you know that Helidon has actually two main um, uh, uh, flavors, we call it. And these flavors are Helidon MP, which follows exactly the microprofile model, and Helidon SC, which is a pure Java model, and it is reactive. And here we will talk about a little bit how we actually came to these two models and what will change in the future with using them and why. So the main architecture is very simple. So we have Netty underneath, and then Netty itself is reactive by nature. Why? Because Netty, we, we need performance. So microservices, most of them uh, really work on critical, critical, um, uh, I would say, in critical software. So delivering a lot of, a lot of messages, performance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Netty is there. It's like a basis for us, which is uh, uh, good. But since we are, uh, Netty is it, it's uh, a framework for, you know, it, it's very low level. So you can write things in Netty, but then you really have to care a lot about all these things that happen actually in in, uh, in, uh, uh, in your microservices that they have to deal with fault tolerance, they have to deal with uh, um, health checks, et cetera, et cetera. So to make it easier, we divided, uh, decided to create this reactive wrapper on them to give you uh, a possibility to write microservices with all the infrastructure around them. And then we decided that, yes, uh, we need to be standard. And this standard is not Spring-like, but a microprofile like to be part of the community. And that's why we created this Helena microprofile. And here could come to a very interesting situation. Once again, uh, we have two flavors, and these two flavors are uh, completely different and they are actually, this become kind of a small problem for us because technically we started delivering not one paradigm, but two paradigms in one product. And uh, they were made for two different things. So if we jump to Helidon MP, so you have a lot of specifications. So this is a really like a mature framework for creating microservices since it has everything you need to create a microservice. It has all the micro profile components, uh, like you know, health checks, metrics, something, everything I showed you in this uh, in this previous slide about micro profile. That means that we are able to deliver a U standard way of writing microservices. It has even more, like uh, uh, supporting of standalone specifications. Like we have some of the specifications that even from Jakarta East, but that means this product is bigger than that. But once again, uh, as it's bigger, it still delivers awesome performance. And here you can see that we deliver uh, performance in three ways. So we really care about it. And we care about it in uh, uh, allowing you to use the latest and greatest features of Java. So first of all, you don't need just to create a, 
a single jar, a Luba jar with uh, with the um, with everything you need, like the boot way actually it is. So you just put everything in one executable, it works. Yes, it's great, but it's big, it's fast, it's like uh, yeah, we should care about performance. It's very good when you have 20, 20 clients and uh, you know uh, it, it's it's really enough for you fast to start. But if you have to care about all the things you pay for in the clouds, uh, you have to choose. And that's why we deliver the same performance in three different ways. That means we have to, we can build a graal VM native image with it. So I won't talk much about graal, that great talks about it in that work. You can just deliver an Uber jar as it is. It will start a slower, it will run with more memory consumption, et cetera, et cetera. Or you can use uh, JLink to create custom images because Helidon is new enough to adopt this modularity that was introduced back in Java 9. And uh, once again, we really care about performance because our major customers, by the way, uh, are really putting Helidon in critical places. Uh, like, you know, if you need to serve a lot of messages, you have served a lot of, of you know, reservations happening, you have this possibility to do this. And once again, if you talk about Graal, uh, one thing about MicroProfile is, uh, is its standard. And uh, we are the only framework which supports CDI. CDI is one of the you know, context dependency injection. Uh, uh, we are one of the frameworks who does support a CDI inside a Graal VM native image uh, without actually losing functionality like other competitors do. So technically other many other competitors are, are, cannot be considered as microprofile compliant just because they don't give this full support of CDI. We're able to do this not only in Java, pure Java jars, but also in Graal VM native image. So once again, if you need to create a standard microservice, service, you choose one product, which is microprofile product. By the way, just to let you know, it's now fully jacardified. Um, that means that we are really moving really forward. So the LL3 X release has been this summer. It's fully jacardified. We're Java 17 compatible only. So we use the latest and greatest features. And uh, that's why I always say, like, you know, uh, it's good to adopt as much as possible. So. Uh, just if you want to start, it's something like a little bit like product positioning in my, in my, in my talk. But uh, we are proud to present something that we call Project Starter. Um, in this Project Starter, you can generate your project in a very beautiful way. For those of you who know, we have the CLI application. And the CLI application has also been adopted to, to, be, to be compliant to this uh, starter. And... Uh, um, you can use both of them. And actually, well, let me just try to do a small, uh, small thing together. So we are on Helidon.io website. So we go to Starter. We choose this Helidon MP. And you see, it's not just bunching a lot of dependencies that you usually choose. You have a good wizard to do this for you. So you can do a quick start, or you can create a custom application with different media support, multi-part support, have different observability features, and you choose what's the monitoring way. You can care about security, you need to do this, and what are the ways to do it. So we don't need it right now, and extra features like fault tolerance. How would you deploy it? Should it be Docker because we're running in the clouds? Or Kubernetes and Verizon, by the way, Verizon is also a new product to, uh, created by Oracle to use in the cloud to deploy your applications. Oh, do you have database support, what it will be, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, and you just download it. And, uh, yeah, it's my, my zip project. So you just unzip it. And you just... Uh, open it in your favorite ED, so my project. I believe it will work right now. Yes, it works, but on the other screen, I'm sorry, I'll just pull it over uh, here. Uh -huh. Just give a second. Yep. So uh, what is good about it, once again, you generate exactly what you need and what you want to use. And as you probably may see, you will, uh, it's just a simple resource. You will see some annotated way of doing things. So 
uh, declare, uh, not declarative, but to describe it, like you do in Spring. Um, it's not compatible with Spring. That means that uh, MicroProfile is not compatible. It has a different set of annotations, but it's really close. What is good about it, once again, that uh, the learning curve of it is very, very easy. And once again, you just use it and run it, and it generates whatever is required for you. So it's just a small product positioning, uh, uh, which I was going to say with this release. Nice. Uh, it's fine if you are focused on portability and serving to an average kind of users. Once again, this is quite honest. So we are, uh, MicroProfile gives you great abilities to, to, to like uh, make portable standard code. Uh, portable means that you can be easily put from one vendor to another. And uh, uh, the performance itself, you only, it's only vendor agnostic, I would say. So how does vendor perform is the only way you can affect it. And uh, MicroProfile is good at this. But what if it comes to a situation when you really need massive throughputs of uh, a lot of data, of a lot of processing, and you really don't want to lose your cycles on this, uh, um, I would say, magic that CDI, but not only CDI, but all the micro profile provides you. And here we come to the another product, actually. So this is Helena React, Helena SE. And uh, we put a different slide on it because, once again, for us, we internally call it the danger zone. Why? Because we just removed all this, uh, as you probably saw in this picture of the architecture, we removed all this layer of compatibility with MicroProfile and we made it completely reactive. And it may be considered as a separate product just because uh, it has a wonderful API and it does support all the same stuff and even more actually, than, uh, uh, than we have in MicroProfile. So you see, if it turns out to the, to the numbers, they are really small, and they are really smaller than, than you had to do for the MP. But once again, uh, how did we manage to do this? And the answer to this is using a reactive engine. So that means that in the world where threads are, are uh, not cheap, are are, uh, I would say, uh, an expensive resource. You have to think about non-blocking ways of writing your code. And here we come to the situation that uh, we decided to create our own reactive engines called Helidon Reactive Engine, uh, which actually will serve us for that. Um, and uh, we are one of the first, actually, users of... Uh, if you remember this Java, Java 9, Flow API. Flow API was created especially for, um, uh, uh, for reactive applications. And it's just a set of interfaces with publisher, subscriber, and subscription. And uh, for that, we adopted it and created our own set of operators and set of structures, not only us, actually it was contributed by David Carnap himself, who is actually the father of, uh, of Reactive. And uh, uh, we decided that we would have our own engine to serve us and not to be uh, you know, dependent on somebody else. Because as you see, there are different engines in the world. And these different engines are, you know, you start being dependent on we decided that we will create our own. And uh, as you see, we have two main constructions, which are the multi and the single. Okay, if we turn, uh, think in terms of spring, this is the flux and mono. But if flux and mono came eventually in spring, this was the foundation for Helidon since the beginning. So what do we have? So if you need a stream of something, then a, a, and a reactive stream of multiple events, so you just put a multi and do perform some asynchronous reactive operations with them. You do limit, you do map, you do for each. If you have a single element, you can do the same with single. And as a result, we have a, a quite 
I would say, good number of uh, reactive operators. There may be not that vast amount of, uh, of uh, operators as you usually get from projects like reactive, <laughs> reactor. I, I sometimes get lost in them, uh, I'll be quite honest. But here you have everything you need to perform operations on them. So uh, that means that uh, uh, our engine itself served us to do something. Well, do you see you can easily do chains of these operations? Like, you know, you can just do some, some publisher which that produces some data. Then you have can do processor at the, at the moment. And then you have to like uh, consume all the data with uh, composing them into a single result and just printing them here. Uh, and this uh, this engine, I'll be quite honest, is really fast. Fast because it does not have any other dependencies. And uh, all the operations which are in the foundation of it, like flat map, like map, like, you know, uh, filter, concat are really, really fast compared to the other framework, sometimes twice as fast. So there's a, a page whereby uh, the guy who actually handles this and held on, Daniel, is awesome. Uh, when you can check the GMH latest test. So we're constantly, you know, uh, improving this. And as a result, we came to the situation that we have this engine and we created our own reactive web server. This is a completely, uh, you know, reactive instrument for you to create reactive microservices, which are, you know, uh, uh, come together with a package of, um, of, but you have a framework with uh, health checks, metrics, et cetera, et cetera. So to create a microservice, you have a reactive web server with reactive components doing active reactively. So, and then um, more than that, we have not only, I will show it a little bit in my demo actually uh, about it, uh, about this server. So uh, it's very suitable for big messaging that comes uh, from the world. Like, you know, you need to process big amounts of of data with Kafka, with uh, ActiveMQ or JMS, for example, it's really nicely done because here uh, we follow the micro profile reactive messaging specification, like, but in a, I would say, reactive way. So uh, that means that everything is done uh, asynchronously with all the pushbacks, et cetera, et cetera, available. So uh, as you see here, we just get a messaging with a publisher, for example, something coming from Kafka. We have processes somehow, uh, like, you know, coming from one channel to another channel. Uh, in here, we just make uppercase letters. It's so easy. And then we just uh, put it into another channel, which is a subscriber for them, and uh, just print them with uh, uh, acknowledgement message sent back. So the pushback is already available here. And the good thing is here that uh, once reactive, you always have to be reactive. That means that if you work for databases, for example, you see reactiveness brings a totally different world in everything. If you work with, a, uh, uh, you can't do something reactive and something blocking. So that's why we cared for that. So in terms of uh, having this non-blocking DB client with a, so we can work with synchronous drivers but in an asynchronous way, because it's done in a separate executor. And uh, you just specify the connection and just use it inside of this client. And it will work asynchronously and on blocking there'll be some back pressure to here. The same if you consume data from other services, uh, like for example, you can call other web clients in a synchronous way. So there is a way to do this in a synchronous way, totally. So you have all the chain for that. But we came to the situation that writing the services, I will show you in a bit in the demo, is hard. Everything reactive is hard. Uh, um, maybe most of you didn't like you know work for that, or you just just write your code empirically. But if it comes to the performance, how they perform fundamentally, it's Good, you really achieve massive performance there. So, for example, I will show it in numbers. You know, we have um, we have um, uh, I would call it performance of Helidon SC compared to Helidon MP is, is uh, several times. 
So that's why our main customers use Helion SE for uh, critical performance, critical. But once again, these are like two different products, so you can't interchange them, although is one is a foundation for another. But once again, we come to the situation, what if reactive is hard? And here we have a solution which has been with us for several years, and finally, uh, it is now available to us in some preview. So from now on, I will talk about something which is considered as a future and something which is not yet production case, but uh, it will drastically change everything. Um, and once again, this is called Project Luma. Our main idea is the virtual threats. Uh, so as you see, uh, the JEP 425 was uh, published this uh, April. Uh, uh, and this is now a preview API, which is available to all of us, oh, sorry, in the JDK 19. So we already have it. So if you download the JDK 19, uh, it is already there as a preview feature. And uh, since we are in Oracle, um, we uh, as a team, uh, as like, you know, some privileged access to, uh, to this. And uh, we started working with this earlier than maybe other people. And just to give you some brief introduction, actually, what Project Loom is. So this research project was exactly to um, provide us the possibility of creating a virtual threads. Uh, as the main reason for that is that for us, virtual threads themselves, you know, parallel process the threads, which do the parallel process for us, is a is a is an expensive resource. Creating a, a thread itself requires you to have several megs for all the all the frames to serve this request, all for, to holding all the data for each thread, and uh, uh, for all this context switches that happen. Uh, it is really hard and it's really painful. So um, most of the time, uh, you, I believe that you won't be able to create like more than 400 threads in a regular machine. I have a Mac and uh, if I create 400 threads, everything will simply die. Uh, just because managing this thread will take much more time than just doing the real job. And the main idea was to uh, create virtual threads, which are uh, identical to normal threads, but the virtual machine themselves, uh, themselves uh, itself, uh, takes care of managing it the way that uh, they are performing good. They're performing well, and they give you the maximum performance and allowing you to have many threads. So uh, virtual threads are not uh, as I told you, operating system sets of Java threads. They are a different data structure with the same API, allowing you to easily create many of them. And then the virtual machine themselves itself takes the work to actually allocating these virtual threads to real threads to do you the job. So they call the carrier threads. So whenever a virtual thread blocks, uh, it's mounted from the carrier. Uh, and it's given to another thread, making room for the other threads actually to do the job. Uh, once the virtual thread is unlocked, there's a scheduler, they say, okay, now since you are unlocked, go work with it. Uh, it's a fork join pool and it's based on continuations. Uh, continuation is a, once again, computer science structure, which is like snapshot of what's happening inside of your thread and how, from which place you actually continue executing the thread. It's no external API. And this, this project was with us for several years. And finally, as it's released, uh, uh, we can use it. And as a result, we now have millions of threads, uh, which are threads by API, and which we can use in a very blocking way. So as we were thinking, in this micro profile uh, implementation, the spring implementation, et cetera, et cetera. We were thinking in blocking ways. So we just structure our code uh, in a, uh, you know, empirical way and it simply works. If it blocks, it blocks. Uh, and now we are able to write this again. 
So the only thing that actually changed is that we have this virtual thread executor um, that actually starts this virtual threads for us. And then the virtual machine cares for mapping and unmapping of this work to, uh, to uh, carrier thread, as I told them. And as I told you, Helidon has a slightly more privileged access to that because we are actually one chat away from, from the guys who uh, do this from Alan Bateman team, from Ron Plessner, who's, who is actually, uh, they, they are the leaders of that. And we really care about performance. We said, okay, what will happen if we adopt these executors in our Helidon? And it's easy as that. So you just put one property, actually two properties to enable them and to force use them. So uh, usually uh, when something goes wrong, you can easily fall back. We have the fallback procedure, but if you want to use only virtual threads, voila, you just put a property and that's it. And hell you know, you don't need it because it's not blocking. And as a result, what, will, what happened is that uh, by just changing this executor threads, uh, executor, um, uh, Thread pool executors to virtual thread uh, change massively the performance. I will show it in my demo, uh, just for the sake of time. Actually, I'm, I'm a little bit skipping that. Uh, and what would happen that uh, just with one small you know, change, the performance and the throughput of the services drastically has risen, and that's awesome. But uh, as I always tell it, tell it. Uh, the the one of the comparisons that we have here, it is like putting an electric engine in a petrol car. <laughs> so it's like yes, you have all electric cars which have a little bit different design because they have different, I would say, problems to solve. What we did is that for the thing, you know, the first thing to actually show them is that we created, uh, we just put a good electric engine to a usual car, and the performance started going better. I will show it in, in, in real life code. <coughs> but once again, uh, I'm sorry, I'll just, uh, I'm speaking too fast. By putting this, uh, uh, it changed things drastically. But once again, we it's like, it's like mixing. It's like, you know, uh, the first car, which they just removed the horses and put a petrol engine. The same is we just removed a, uh, uh, an engine from, uh, from a real car and put an electric one. And we decided, okay, the virtual threads themselves have different, I would say, challenges to solve. So why don't we create uh, a special server or frame, uh, framework around it, which is only virtual thread based? That means that we remove all the reactive stuff, all the asynchronous stuff from it, all the overhead, this uh, uh, asynchronous stuff provided us to solve problems. So we don't have these problems anymore. So we can just get rid of them. And that's why we created NEMA. Uh, it is a fast framework based on virtual threads. I'll be saying, I'll say it quite honest. So um, uh, it's developed really tightly together with uh, um, Java team. So uh, uh, we really talked to them in one chat. So the guys actually did it. So I'm um, um, from my team. They were in, in one chat with them. And it's the main idea is just remove all the asynchronous stuff, remove all this uh, uh, non blocking stuff, and write pure normal blocking typical framework. Because virtual threads will solve that for us, the technology will solve this for us on the JVM level. And what we have, that um, it's a framework. We have a, a web server, the way we have reactive web server in Helido and SE. Now we have this NEMA reactor, a uh, REMA blocking, I would say, server with uh, libraries, additional libraries. I'll tell about them later. And uh, we really get rid of netting and make it totally our engine and we build around it 
like around the car, we build our own framework. What is good? It's already released. It's alpha version. It's available in Maven Central. So uh, it's been open sourced, <clears throat> and it's been uh, uh, make it made available for everybody. So it can be actually made as a replacement for netting in some way. So the architecture of, of Helidon now um, may become something like this. We have an email, which is a blocking server, and we have a micro profile built around it, or on top of it, to be compliant to specifications. You're still able to run Helidon Reactive over virtual threads, which is cool because, uh, once again, all our clients which are working on uh, Helidon Reactive, so we already have the code base, they don't have to move away. So they just, just with the switch and change, they already start benefiting of it by um, just putting Nima instead of Netty, actually. And uh, this is awesome, once again, because uh, uh, it gives you compatibility. So we always care about compatibility. And this compatibility comes to you, I won't say for free, but it's really the, the easiest way to migrate. So what we have here is that we're still in development, it's still alpha, and one of the components which are done here are totally new, like for example, uh, the, the core, like Helen Web Server. We have completely new gRPC server. We have completely new WebSocket server, web client for that, and fault tolerance itself working differently. But we also uh, reuse one of the components, like config tracing, health check, and course. Uh, and metrics and security are now in development, I would say. So that means that uh, we are transforming this combination of layers of Helidon SE and Helidon um, uh, and Netty into something which is called NEMA. So it will have a one single big foundation for Helidon NP. And what is good, that uh, it's totally virtual thread based and provide it, provides us HTTP, HTTP2, gRPC, not as library use, but our own implementation, WebSocket, TLS and TLS support, uh, access log, course, uh, static content, observability features, as I like it so much. You can, it's really suitable for not just writing something very tough. It's really suitable for running in the clouds where you need this observability and control. And uh, the best thing is that it's, once again, it's written from scratch. That's why you actually use virtual threads as a, as a combination, but you also use newest features uh, in the uh, Java available to you, like enhanced switch, like sealed classes, system logger. So it's already there. It's new code. Uh, getting rid of all the all the you know um, culture layer that we had uh, building on top. Um, getting rid of all this old stuff. And uh, as a result, we have our own thread model. So uh, um, all the socket listeners are um, real threads. And for HTTP one, we use true threads per connection, so they are virtual threads per connection. HTTP two, we use two virtual threads, uh, uh, one thread per stream, because you have streams there, and you have you can, as the threads are now cheap resource, you just use them in threads. And uh, all the routings are done in virtual threads and can block as much as we can. Virtual machine will take care of this, and. What we have as a result, why would you actually need it? If you ever have written um, reactive code, you will die into you know, writing the code. And I, I usually die in reading virtual. I really don't understand what happens. It's hard to write, hard to debug. And um, yes, I know three people in my career that are able to write uh, reactive code, like for instance, like, like they think reactively. But for me, as an average developer, uh, this is hard. So uh, why would you need all of that stuff to happen? Is that basically that's it. Either you write a reactive code, which is performance, which is good and awesome, or you just write regular code as you, as you actually, most of us, I don't know, I'm 36, I learned in school, 
uh, programming and uh, this is the way we write the code. In the university, it's pretty much the same. Maybe things have changed differently now, but once again, writing that in protocol is easier and it's much more debuggable. I would say, have you ever tried to debug virtual code? Virtual, not virtual code, but uh, reactive code. I tried it, it was pain. Uh, and all, it all ended up with some system out prints. It's, yeah. In reactive, in blocking code, you just code away this and you get performance, which is, uh, which is much better than we actually had. So once again, uh, here, this picture may sound a little bit strange, but uh, uh, it may sound that held on C is bad, you know? Uh, and uh, it's, uh, but Amazon SC itself is a state of the art technology. It's one of the fastest framework you will ever have. And uh, the fastest, one of the fastest framework you will ever have performs, well, times worse than we have with Nima. So that means that uh, if we change this, uh, if we write this uh, performance in tests, that uh, uh, Helidon now outperforms even Netty, but Netty doesn't have any overhead. It just simply serves you some data in a reactive way, and that's it. And here in blocking, where we're outperforming it, and having all the infrastructure around your code for working in the cloud, so you know, conforming to specifications, you get it uh, out of the box here. And actually, let us jump into the demo. Uh, I have prepared... Uh, a uh, project for you. I will just put it here. Uh, it's available uh, in my. I uh, wonder if you can see it. By the way, if you don't see it, I'll make the code a little bit bigger. So I had to do this earlier, but sorry for that. So I'll make the code bigger. So what we have here, we have. Um, uh, I've already showed in some conferences uh, this for this uh, this code. But I extended it just to compare. So uh, we have a client who is doing fast calls. Like, you know, it's monitoring fast calls. It, it's, it's waiting for it to send a request and get a response immediately. I have a client who is waiting for slow responses. The send response is, is waiting for it to come at some moment and it's blocking. We have three types of servers here, even three, just to make a comparison. First one is uh, the regular uh, Helidon MP. It is very easy. So it's, uh, once again, we just annotate the code as we used to. It has two endpoints, which is the quick, just return done. And it has the slow, uh, which is, well, sleep for some time. It's blocking thread. Uh, it's doing uh, not doing work, but blocking it and send them, and that's it. To compare to it, we have done the same with Reactive. By the way, here, I just want to demonstrate how easy it is to write Reactive. <laughs> well, easy in our house. How, how uh, Halidom itself shrinks the code that you have to do. So uh, that means that you just create a web server, pure Java, no magic, uh, and here, um, Sorry. And here we have just two endpoints. Uh, you see, you just create a service um, uh, which has only one function to override, which is update, where we actually um, I'll assign to endpoints one function to do. So we just send done. And here we sleep. By the way, sleeping in Reactive is, is non trivial. You have to do additional executor to sleep because Reactive is non blocking. You don't block threads, actually. And uh, uh, that's a reactive uh, representation. And now, actually, this is a, not exactly a world premiere, but uh, uh, let's have a look at the NEMA code. NEMA code itself is, once again, it's not micro profile. It's, uh, it's a foundation for micro profile. That's why it follows the same ideas as Helidon SE, but only making it non-blocking. So it has a main function, which is also just a main. You can run it from VD if you want, because it's a main, it's Java. It has only one root for us, which does the very same uh, stuff. 
right, you know, quick stuff. So one is just send a response. Other is, is wait, block, and send a response. By the way, maybe it's not that visible here, but uh, uh, I will show another example uh, that it's, it's extremely easy in terms of you write the code you used to, uh, to write. It's non-blocking. You don't have to you know, change your mind and change your brains to start thinking reactive. We just run the same code. And let us see how we perform. So uh, I will just open another set of windows. I'll open a group. Oh no, that was a bad idea. Sorry for that. Uh, uh, let me let me do this. Yeah, I'm I'm always doing the same uh, the same mistake. So terminal, open a group of. Yeah, much better. So what we have? We have a client. Uh, Two clients, fast client and slow client. We have server, which is with Loom and without Loom. Actually, by the way, let me switch back a little bit to the uh, to the um, idea. Uh, we control this only from one property, actually. So we just enable a property. So it's a usual server. We enable a property, and that's it. And you have virtual threads available to you out of the box. You don't do any changes in your code at all. Uh, so it has true for virtual threads uh, on and no loop, they just false. That's the switch. Uh, let's go back to the, to the, uh, yeah, here. So what we do, we start the server with no loop. Uh, it runs and we start the clients. So target clients quick. It starts requests and responses. But if we add this uh, client slow, wait a second, target client slow, you will see something happening. Is that the performance dropped significantly, as you see. So the slow threads are blocking the fast threads. And you see there, they you just simply don't get the responses anymore. And that's that's a pity, you know, how it is. So previously, it has been solved in a reactive way. So let's stop this uh, server. It now has some errors happening. So no requests and response are coming. So we'll just start the reactive server. So target reactive. It's doing the same stuff, but in a reactive way. And suddenly we see that we have both of the things happening. We have slow threads served and we have fast threads served as well. That means that reactive somehow brings us better throughput because now we utilize the resources much better. By the way, if you do have H top of this of the uh, of the uh, server, so you see it's starting like doing better utilization of the hardware that you have. And here the numbers are completely different. By the way, just to uh, just to uh, give you a let's run again, no loom and ch top. You will see it starts serving, but some of your performances, you see, you don't use the threads. You simply don't use them. So that's an issue. Okay, now as you say, uh, let us put an electric engine on a petrol car. As we did it. So I will put a loom option here. And uh, you see, something changed. Well, we started better using the resources. And just with one option, uh, we became uh, much better performance, much better throughput uh, on, the, on, the, on the platform that is always already available to us. Look. Awesome, I would say great, uh, and it simply works. I mean, but once again, you're using preview feature of JDK 19. Uh, you, you can put it into production, but uh, uh, it will be up to you. But since, again, we have put an electric engine on a petrol car and it's already working. But now uh, let us get rid of everything here. Let's get rid of any reactive this.
Uh, let's do the same with uh, Helidon Nima. Uh, where is it? Yes, server Nima. Uh, oh, yeah, we have to do preview. Hey, I didn't put it. So, because it's once again, I especially didn't put it because it's a preview feature. Things can change, but it's label preview. Preview. Yep. And suddenly you see it's now getting warm and warm and warm. You're starting getting better performance and better performance as the machine. Actually, now you're writing completely blocking code, completely. And the virtual machine starts, you know, performing and actually managing it up to you. You see, this is this is what I was talking about. That something, the big shifts to our way of writing code are coming. And that makes me completely happy. So uh, that's how it is. I will stop it for now. By the way, I'm running, running on Mac. Mac is not a good representative. You will run on Linux. You will get much better better result because it has still to be optimized for Mac. But all the all all the things are happening in with Linux servers. So um, yep. And if we take a look, so I will just uh, stop it. So we saw, saw it on our own example. And if I open a um, uh, an example to you, a different example, I will put it here. You see, the main idea is that the code itself is much easier. So if we get a reactive client, like reactive server, for example, if you need to do, for example, a sleep in an async response, sorry, you have to start writing something strange, you know, invoke async, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you need to do a parallel execution, you just need to do multi of a range, then flat map of a single, which is like mono, create completable future, which will supply, I think, to you a client with get request and executor. Then you collect it to a list and map it for an executor. And then if something goes mad, uh, you, you, I don't know how we did bug it. If you do the same with the blocking way, well, you got a virtual thread executor. You have some features that you have to do. You just put this feature in a list, add them, and make them run. You can even debug them. As easy as that. <laughs> so, uh, yep. So this makes the changes. So uh, um, once again, we touched the future a little bit uh, with this, but there's so many challenges. Let me just switch back to my presentation. I took a maybe slightly more good time, but I was really excited to show it. So you have to know some fundamental stuff. What this thing does not solve. If you, uh, this uh, a fundamental terminology called abstraction. So it's a long-term full utilization of a threat requiring using to build. So that means if you are blocking the threat and it's really doing some job, you simply can't get more resources. It's up to your processor. We have physical threats that you have to execute. So reactive is good to handle short non-blocking tasks. That means that if you send a, some, do some small work and wait for something, it's perfect for that. That's what most of the microservices actually do. They, for example, okay, give me this response from the database. You go to the database and your thread is waiting for this database to come. While it's waiting, you can do something else. And the virtual machine will care for that, you know, working with this virtual thread. So don't obstruct. If you obstruct your code, it will not help you at any moment. So, and there were some challenges that actually was so were happening during this process, just to share with you some internals. Um, uh, like for example, uh, Shared buffers don't work anymore. So you have to, to break your brain a little bit. So if you just uh, um, uh, share cache buffers, we don't reuse them anymore. It's not efficient in terms of virtual threats. Uh, asynchronous writes uh, in Linux, for example, uh, we saw that using them also did not help us. You have to be blocking to get performance. Uh, the same is for sockets, like for example, uh, Funny thing is uh, that the best performance is achieved when you block them. 
not 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 uh, non blocking sockets non sucking non blocking sockets don't perform as well as blocking sockets and this is this is something that uh, a really big paradigm ch change in our brains is that uh, you should block again <laughs> and if you block again it's code is easier to write and troubleshoot it even performs better um <clears throat> http2 is is hard but it did work for us in this virtual threads environment. What well, was good that the gRPC performed better, gRPC is everywhere right now, and it was much more easier. Uh, we have created our own gRPC uh, module, and uh, uh, we now conserved, uh, you see, in Netty you don't have gRPC, you have to put additional server for that. Uh, and for example, now, as we have our own implementation, you can serve in the same port as other protocols. So we have a better new routing. Uh, so you can work only on one port serving gRPC requests. Uh, of course, it's only alpha version, so it has to be polished. And uh, the good thing is that, uh, um, that we can still reuse some of the code because like, for example, Paul Torres and all that stuff are blocking by its nature. So now they have blocking by its nature, we can reuse them. So it's it's really awesome, and this is basically what I want to say to you. It may took a little bit longer than expected, but we're still on time. So we take took a small journey together with you from uh, the idea of uh, well, we have a a blocking code, but we don't care for the performance. Then suddenly we started caring about the performance, and we had to switch to reactive. And Helidon provided you this pre-grant, and it still provides in one of the best class performance. So. And now we said, okay, so if now we have this instrument or, and, or tooling from, uh, from uh, JDK that actually changes the world and Thread suddenly became uh, a cheap resource for us, we have designed uh, a completely new framework, throwing away all that reactive overhead that we have to outperform it actually. And you see, it simply works. So I really showed you the code, which is uh, already available in, uh, uh, in GitHub, uh, not GitHub, yes, GitHub and uh, Maven. So it's even in Maven Central. So um, once again, it's an enable preview feature, but it already comes with even not early access builds of the JDK, but with a regular JDK, you will, uh, you will download JDK 19, which has been released like two, three weeks ago. And uh, we are already there. And uh, something really big is coming because uh, uh, this is a big game changer. And we are happy to be on the leading edge of this change in Helidon. And uh, we are really happy that we are able to really like, you know, switch from all these changes from blocking, non-blocking way to really blocking and perform and outperform everybody. And um, we are happy that we are together with our colleagues from JVM team who are actually in one chat, chat away with us. And we can fine tune performance really easy. And that's what we're doing. And uh, now a few things just want to say. So first of all, uh, uh, if you have blocking code with micro profile, you can easily migrate to, uh, to Helidon and use it the way you used to do it because it's standard. Just to prepare the code for um, switching one option, which is like you know enabling virtual threads, and you will already be able to gain massive throughput, massive performance, just from one option, which is awesome. And now, very today uh, in our GitHub repo, uh, we have uh, the first version of Helidon MP running solely on Nime. Uh, which like you know removes this intermediate layer of Helidon SE, and it performs really well. So that means that suddenly your code, which is standard code, becomes much more effective just because you know our team, the team of JDM guys, did their work, and uh, Hespo has uh, enabled this technology for you. So whenever you need to uh, read some more details, we have tons of, of, um, of ways to do this. So just go to Helid on Twitter. So we tweet uh, with all of stuff there. And we have a new community in, in, uh, in LinkedIn. Uh, website is the place to gather all the information for you. We have long reads and media with some technical blocks. It's not only marketing. Uh, whenever, uh, by the way, 
there is a mistake. Um, we have uh, we have changed. Now we have our own Haley Don. Oh, you see, I changed the slide. EO IO um, uh, organization in GitHub. So we are really independent in this case, and we can write better. If you like videos, just go to our YouTube channel. Have questions? Ask them directly in Slack. We always have. I am um, uh, somebody who is uh, on duty for answering questions. So that's why, uh, although we are like, you know, open source startup in terms of uh, Oracle, but uh, it's already, uh, we already have somebody who is monitoring the questions and will be answered shortly. With that, I want to say thank you. And I really hope that you like this, uh, this small journey we could take together from blocking to reactive and non-blocking again. And we have touched the future a little bit, and I'm really sure that uh, it's going to be a beautiful future. So thank you so much. I hope you have questions. Thanks a lot, Mitya, for your presentation. It was very insightful and very interesting. So one of the main takeaways that I get from the presentation is that basically uh, with this project, Helion, you're introducing the performance of the non-blocking uh, pattern, or let's say, of design into a blocking way of writing it is that yes. a fair way of putting it yeah yes so yes. so still um in my experience i've seen a lot of people struggle between the two ways of writing code because as you rightfully said it's very hard to debug it's very hard sometimes to understand so still there the question that comes to my mind is even if we use uh, helidon uh, and we decide to adopt it in a in a new project and keep our mm -hmm. let's say old ways of doing things there are probably still some challenges that we need to overcome and shift our way of thinking. What would you say are these challenges? Do you see something else that we need to also shift in our mind? So that's yeah. that's what I said in this slide, actually. So if you put here, uh, uh, if you remember the previous architecture, which is three, three uh, layers of architecture, which was uh, uh, Netty and then this reactive framework, Kelly on reactive, and then the Microsoft file, that means what do we say here? We still be able to use reactive code even inside of Nemo. It will be very, it will, it will reuse all of that performance that you have. But uh, you also gain the way to write it in a blocking way, uh, on a standard blocking way. So that means what, what is beautiful about it is that we care a lot for our clients and uh, we have a lot of code written with Helidon Reactive. That means that it does not cancel it. It simply provides you another, uh, I would say, foundation for it using the latest technology. And the code that you will have, uh, it is, it is, uh, you don't need to rewrite it. This is the good part of it. But if you, for example, migrate or use your, you know, uh, or uh, uh, write your code from scratch in a blocking way, it will have the same performance. This is the main message of it. <laughs> so that means that, uh, we really, uh, what is good about it is we, we really keep your code uh, uh, working and performance. So this is what, what, what I want to say. You don't, need to, you don't need to switch paradigm to get more performance. So I, I, by the way, I know many people, three, who are writing, <laughs> who, are writing uh, uh, who are writing reactive code better than blocking code. These people will still do the reactive. Yes, uh, and if you need people who are, I would say, much more affordable to a company <laughs> in terms of HR, for writing blocking code, they will have the same, well, close to the same performance. This is it. Nice, really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, then do you think there are scenarios where reactive is worse than blocking? Uh, yes, when you have to debug it. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, you see, reactive is good, uh, non blocking is good, but uh, once again, if we come to this slide, um, uh, if you do obstructive code, uh, that means that you have full thread utilization, that means that you don't switch between, between small short tasks. Uh, and you are doing like really like massive computations like hours long, then Reactive won't do any anything good for you. I mean, you will just write a, a, a 
much less effective code, uh, much less readable code, and much less debuggable code to do the same thing. So that's why uh, Reactive is not a silver bullet. It was not a silver bullet, but it certainly uh, solved a lot of performance issues for certain kind of tasks, which are very much, um, I would say, typical for microservices world. So that's why it became such a popular decision. Makes sense. Cool. Thank you. And we have uh, one more final question for you before we let you go and have a <sighs> break. So um, oftentimes uh, when we talk about uh, reactive and blocking and unblocking, uh, we talk about performance in the application. But uh, in real life scenario, uh, probably almost uh, more, uh, let's say most of the times, the issue with performance is actually somewhere in the database or in the drivers of the database or the actual queries. Mm -hmm. And I know that, for example, the most popular way of accessing the database with Java is JDBC, which by nature is blocking. So do you think that this also needs to be addressed in order to go to fully utilize uh, the non-blocking uh, nature or this is something that's not really relevant uh, with what you presented? No, it is relevant. It is relevant. Uh, and uh, that's why I even have a slide for them. For example, uh, I'll go to this. Uh, the problem of uh, reactive is that it has to be always reactive. I mean, once reactive, always reactive. If, you, if you're doing this uh, in... Uh, in a blocking way, it will, you will block everything. So all the reactiveness, you will block, block the thread and all the reactiveness will simply vanish and disappear. So that's why, yes, we do solve it in a way with our uh, very strange, I would say to many people, but uh, really working solution of uh, uh, putting uh, the driver itself, or work with the driver in a separate thread pulling skewer and making a small, uh, frame around it, it's like our DB client. So you, you start working with uh, databases in a reactive way, although they are not reactive way. So you really, all this waiting time uh, for uh, acquiring some data in the database, you will reuse it in your thread pool uh, with reactive code. So you get this gains and benefits. But uh, uh, there is a solution uh, like, you know, uh, R2DAB, R2DABMS, oh, I, I can't spell it. When you have um, the um, non-blocking drivers for, uh, for, uh, for databases. By the way, Neo4j already has like non-blocking drivers. I know Mongo has non-blocking drivers itself. And with this uh, project of R2DB, r 2 d I will write it somewhere. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, you receive the possibility to work with the database in a reactive way. And uh, this solves some issues, I would say, in the performance. So we solved it in this way. Uh, it's, a, it's a wrapper. It's like a little bit, um, I would say, a hack. But this hack works. But if you need really deeper, a deeper, uh, deeper way of doing reactive, you just do reactive drivers. And this is a project which happens right now, which is like in progress. Just oh, I will write it somewhere. <laughs> but if you have, if you are forced to use JDB, uh, like GDBC driver, which is blocking, we have this hack for you in Helidon SE, and in uh, in uh, Helidon uh, Nina. Well, time will show a little bit later. What is it? Because we're just making our first steps. Great. Thanks a lot for the, the presentation and for the information. Yeah. yeah um, thank you. Uh, we're shortly, almost uh, a minute late. <laughs> um, <laughs> I used all the time I have. It was yeah. perfect. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Thank you a lot. Um, everything was very useful and very interesting. Um, and uh, since we're wrapping up uh, your part of the, the, the presentation, but again, you uh, will be joining us for the panel discussion. So if anyone has any more questions uh, to you, they can ask then. And now we'll give uh, our audience a 30 minute break and we'll be right back in 3.30 to um, discuss um, the topic of our panel discussion. And we'll see you guys soon. Yeah, see you later. See you.
Welcome back, everybody. Uh, now it's time to wrap up the day with our panel discussion. I hope you had a great time so far. And if you have questions prepared, please uh, be ready and post them in the chat. Uh, otherwise, we're going to start a discussion with our panelists uh, in just a, a few minutes. And just a quick reminder for anyone who's joining now, uh, there will be a, a recording uploaded later in the day and you'll be able to uh, watch the whole show from the start if you missed anything, so stay tuned for that. And now uh, let's welcome back our uh, guests. Hello, everyone. Can you hear us? Hey, hey. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello. Nice to see you again. Hi. Hello, hello everyone. Hello. So today I will be the moderators of um, the panel discussion. And uh, as you already um, speakers know that I have sent you questions, uh, we'll start with them. But in the meantime, if any other questions pop up in the chat, we'll read them. Uh, for the, our viewers, you have the questions pop up uh, down below that are going to be answered uh, currently. And uh, all your questions asked also will be uh, will, will pop up down below. Down, uh, the stream and uh, also uh, we will uh, be ready here to read all, your, um, all the questions from the audience to our guest speakers. So uh, as we have already mentioned um, the topic of the final discussion is uh, what are the technologies or skills each Java developer should have uh, in their back pocket and should master in a couple of next years and uh, where is Java world moving to? It's quite a broad topic, so I hope you have many things to add you speakers and many questions to ask you guests. So starting with the first question that we have prepared, that is, uh, we can see a trend moving from monolithic in-house applications to cloud-based services. If I am a Java developer, why should I care about this? So guys, you can take... Um, your time, each and every one of you, to ask uh, and share your opinion. Yeah, maybe I can, I can go go first. And uh, yeah, I, I would like uh, can I can I would start with start here you know, with, with answering that question with a very relevant thing. It's again like you know you still need to be relevant in day to day work. So again like you know, keeping your knowledge fresh and basically you know, up 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 to what basic demand is. One of the, I would say, the biggest reasons why you should care with, you know, what are the new trends, what's basically coming out there, and, and things like that. So, again, like I don't believe that yeah, the monolithic monolith applications are, you know, necessarily bad. But again, yeah, there is a obvious shift in, you know, into the microservices, and again, that, yeah, in a lot of situations, microservices kind of like yeah, have their benefits. Of course, they have also the drawbacks. But again, yeah, the the chances are that a lot of your know, systems and legacy systems that exist today and monolithic applications that exist today in you know, a few years from now either will not exist or will be broken down into multiple you know, different applications. So, again, you, know, you, you need to, to know and to be relevant still like, you know, also in the future to, you know, to keep the job, I would say, at least. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Daniel. Daniel. Come on, so, go ahead. Okay, I will go ahead. I, it's, it's nice to see you in the airport, by the way. Uh, you're presenting <laughs> from all possible locations. That makes me like, you know, uh, really admire your job. So uh, <laughs> I would say, uh, I would say uh, this way. You see, uh, once again, as as Vladimir said, uh, it should be relevant to what you're doing. And your monolithic application will still be there, and they if they do their job uh, correctly and if they're suitable for their job. The same is for microservices. If they're suitable for that, what are they doing? Uh, it's uh, uh, it's definitely the choice, and you have to and you have to uh, be relevant to this once again. Just because you have to keep your choice. And what I like about Java is that uh, uh, it, it's really like very wisely uh, adapting to this trend. I would, I, would, I would call it this way. So uh, uh, definitely Java is the, the choice for enterprise development. Enterprise, that means it's something that will last. You see, it's 25 years of Java and it's, uh, it's even more than 25 years so far. Uh, and it's really uh, 
always adapting to the to the changes and the challenges. And I really like that not only it, but also the uh, ecosystems like Jakarta E, like uh, MicroProfile, like they're also adopting to it. And uh, they are like, you know, defining the trends for that. So uh, yes, you should you should do this just because you otherwise young young generations will come and just kick you out. And uh, why I saying young generation, Java is still, although having such a long history, it's still having this young feeling of what's happening. It's young in its soul. And I really like about it. And um, just to just to keep it short, uh, you have to change to uh, to be relevant to the time. If you're stuck in this uh, monolithic world, you'll still have some job to do, but um, well, you just go to the history in some moment. <laughs> that's what I. This is this is my opinion. Yes, I usually recommend to start with why. Why should I use microservice? Why should I use monolith? It's important to know these tools and strategy of architecture. However, go beyond everybody else because usually the people put on discussion several buzzwords where. They don't have no idea what does it mean. Yep. So go beyond that. Why should I use Monolith? Why should I care about uh, microservice? And when should, should I use one or another one? And go specifically to Java. Yes. As Dimitri said, we have a huge options to go whatever you want in uh, the point of your context. And yeah, your context matters. And computer science, there's no silver bullet. And microservice, is not an exception. I completely agree. And if I may, I would like to spin a little bit the question. So instead of thinking about microservices, I've had this discussion uh, several times now with colleagues that nowadays with more companies adopting uh, co uh, <clears throat> infrastructures in the clouds and, and using AWS, for example, um, many Java developers are now faced with, let's say, the necessity of learning these services and how they operate. So kind of they kind of go into the domain of DevOps and what the DevOps would usually nowadays do. And um, do you see a trend that uh, this kind of skill is more and more required by the, let's say, standard things that the Java developer had to do just a couple of years ago? Do you think it's, it's more relevant for a Java developer now to learn and master these kind of DevOps related skills or it's still fair game to say, okay, I'm just doing my Java code. I don't care about pipelines and I don't care about AWS services. This is something my DevOps will do. What do you guys think? I guess, I guess as Java developer and software engineer, we should care about software engineer at all. So beyond the language, if you know the database service, the architecture that you're using and so on. The main goal of Amazon service is exactly to decrease the complexity were able to use that instead of learn the whole detail around operation. Uh, also say that, yes, it's important to know what's going on on the AWS, but at some time, take a look and invent the locking stuff, especially because the comp computer science does not change. For example, uh, in the Google, we have PubSub that has an equivalent for Amazon AWS, serverless. Every uh, cloud service provides a serverless solution. And we also have the K-Native to avoid exactly the vendor working. So as I said previously, understand uh, Amazon AWS, understand why you're using clouds, and try to understand the concepts. This way you're able to choose between uh, the products. Oh, I'm using Google Cloud, so okay. Let's use the Amazon S3 equivalent to go cloud. This has been happening with mm. Oracle and so on. Mika, you're muted. Yeah, we don't hear you. <laughs> yeah, I usually mute, yes. So this is my, like, you know, I'm doing too much of uh, uh, remote work, so I used to <laughs> mute. <laughs> uh, okay, so my personal opinion here is. Uh, well, again, it's all about the money. Let's be completely honest. So uh, uh, currently running some infrastructure in the clouds is it's simply cheaper for the business. Uh, 
Well, that's uh, that's also an arguable point. Where would you run it, and how would you run it? Yes, Octavio said that you have to uh, be able to know uh, what are the challenges, what are the locks, what are the uh, uh, whether you migrate easily or you don't need to migrate easily. It's all about that. But knowing it, for example, for me, uh, I used to have a an architect position. It's not only about coding; it's about taking the decisions. Uh, knowing about that stuff, uh, if you are an architect position, it's especially is essential because this defines, uh, well, in most of the time, this defines the success of your project in terms of, um, in terms of uh, uh, exactly money, most of the time, and uh, in scale of scalability, we should get for this money. So it, it's so good to have a small server with some 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 application running on it. If it solves your problems, why not? I mean, you have only 50 clients. If no, you have to do this and you have to know this and you have to take the architectural decisions. So um, <clears throat> if you take about, think about like middle level developers, should I care or not? Well, you should care because once again, uh, uh, Yes, I know one of the paradigms of microservices that it's an isolated thing and you it's developed in its own speed, uh, like you know, and uh, <clears throat> uh, there's a team working on it, and it's once again the isolation in terms of developing works nice, but uh, uh, the, the reality has shown us that it all works like a big organism, it has to be orchestrated, it has to be uh, you know, working as a system. And if you're out of that system and you're not thinking systematically, well, uh, you will just be, be a, uh, a uh, junior to middle developer and that's it. That's not what we want. So uh, knowing this, especially for higher positions, uh, is essential. This is my point. Yeah. Yeah, if I can add yeah, a few things. Basically, I think that yeah, nowadays, like, and, yeah, constantly, you know, there is more and more stuff that is out there. And there is, again, like, always a valid question from an engineering point of view. Okay, like, yeah, should you invest the time into learning all those things? And the reality is, I think, you know, however you know, much, you know, most of us would like to know everything about everything, that's just not a possibility. But, yeah, you know, again, that's why I think it's very important to kind of try and keep a T-shaped kind of like a knowledge about the things to know, you know, at least what is out there, when, what would be kind of the good use case, you know, what wouldn't be kind of the good use case, just on, on, on at least on a basic level so that, you know, if, you know, opportunity arise, you at least know, okay, okay, should I like look, go and look in this into the more details? And again, I know that, you know, companies are different. Uh, and again, we can possibilities inside that some companies very differ a lot. So again, you might be, you know, working for a company where a lot of those kind of things are already decided for you. So you can think from the point of view, okay, okay, why should then I uh, kind of spend my time and energy on learning something that, you know, I can't, you know, influence. But again, the more you know and the broader knowledge you have, again, you will be able to better understand the complex systems. You will be better, be, be, you will be a better engineer. And again, you will also grow. And again, like, and I think that is the, the most important thing that, you know, everybody needs to keep, you know, in the back of my mind. Again, like, you know, something which is uh, very relevant, very, you know, in today and, and you know, everybody needs to know doesn't mean that that's going to be the case, like, you know, in five years from now or 10 years from now. Like, you know, if yeah. you look at the cobble was like all over the place and now, you know, everybody's running the, you know, in a different direction. So just, you know, keeping your... You're like kind of like a learning hat on and you know try to at least know where you should go and dig deeper if there is a need that would be my suggestion interesting so so to, if i may just sum up uh then the answer to this question is basically uh yes we see more and more things going to the cloud and at the very least if someone as a java engineer wants to take it uh, another notch and just improve he should at least understand what are the capabilities of such infrastructures and get to um, to know what are the benefits and the pros and cons, right? So at least that is is something that could be useful for him to grow. Is that a fair statement? Yes, yeah, I, I would say yeah, absolutely fair statement for, for anything. It's not not only for cloud, but for any kind yeah. kind of, of new, <laughs> new technology. Cool. Thanks a lot. Uh, so most of you are uh, part of uh, Java user groups, and now uh, when uh, can you just uh, briefly share something that uh, you have discussed 
that is interesting and you're not sure that any other how you how can i say you uh share it in between user groups but when it comes to different countries probably you discuss something different that might be specific to uh the the, the country can you share something specific that you have discussed in uh, your meetings that could be interesting to to the audience okay i can put in two sides uh the common things is about we complain about the young generation how they follow the or exactly like we did in the past so hibernate second cash become the new microservice and something like that the the word scalability become useless because our product has its capability it doesn't matter how and why and if it's true or not and a more specific thing on Brazil right now, we have a huge discussion around uh, LGPD, so user protection and database and integration with Java and Graal VM. And I'm Brazilian, but living in Europe and specifically in Portugal. And they started the discussion, had more discussion about Parkour and Micronaut. Each one is more capable to do your approach and of course help them. especially with virtual threads and Nina. Yeah. That's actually an interesting point I would like to ask. So we uh, we know that we can talk about technologies and what people should learn, but after the, the 2020 pandemic and now people working more remotely in general, do you think this is also a kind of a skill that uh, the developers need to learn how to adapt to this way of working? Have you seen challenges in that regard in your own, uh, let's say, professional lives? Uh, for me, I have worked in remote and open source for a while. So I guess Dimitri as well. So it was like a normal life even before the pandemic situation because I know we stay at home and then go to the conference and return back to the home. So it changed because everything goes through online. online uh -huh. and hopefully right now it's back into normal life. As you can see behind me at airport in the, in Russia, because we had DevOps version three, four hours ago. Yeah, maybe I can drop yeah, for a second. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and give a little bit more right. more different uh, perspective. Uh, at least from my point of view, and again, like from what I see, is I think that engineers and you know developers per se didn't really have any problems in you know, kind of switching to to you know, to full remote. Uh, again, you know, I think that most of us are techie savvy, so setting up all stuff it's not a problem. Again, we all I would assume that we all work in a uh, agile and scrum methodologies. So again, you have your old kind of your know, standard meetings chat you know, already you know, used heavily to communicate with people, at least what I saw in the pandemic period that you know, the business people had to adjust the most. And basically that was kind of like the part that sometimes needed the hand holding and again, like, you know, and, and helping basically people you know, make the bridge because for our engineers, you know, again, at least I haven't seen any single engineer who had a problem in switching. Unless, of course, you know, they kind of like miss like you know, your coffee chats and those kind of things in the company. But yeah, but beside that, work related, yeah, I all, mostly saw that you know, the business people had sometimes problems. And and I would say all, all, all the old school managers who want to see people that they are at work, you know, that they also they had to kind of like, yeah, adjust to the new reality that yeah, you will not be able to see the people doing the work. But again, like, you know, in physically, you will have to like see it like yeah, the tickets going away and you know, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Yes, I will. I will. I will exactly like. I wanted to point this thing is exactly that you see before. Uh, and everybody knows I'm a wheelchair user, so going to this for me is hard, that uh, physically hard. And uh, it was it was that situation, especially for Eastern Europe, that you have to be micromanaged. You know, in order to to somehow you know, perform, this has to be a manager with something uh, hanging around you and watching you what you're doing in your monitor. That was quite typical, and that was exactly um, um, not for me. So it was hard for me to find a decent job, I'll be quite honest. 
uh, I was uh, I once had 42 interviews and I passed all of them, but they never hired me because I had to be in the office. But uh, as one 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 guy said, there are two options: either either you will change your job, or the world will change. And see what happened, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that was the that was the funny thing. Uh, well, funny. Well, for me, it was it was. Um, I'll take the funny out of it. I mean, so it's definitely a bad situation. But the world definitely has changed, and uh, <clears throat> in my case, uh, it's interesting because it's opened a lot of opportunities uh, for people who will never able to do job or, um, well to some companies. Uh, to do it just because they were like stuck somewhere at home uh, and that was happening in my case uh, what I think is that for two years in Oracle I never ever saw my team uh, uh, in real life I saw only one person <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I for most of the people uh, I even don't know how they look because they have like you know you know like uh, uh, like uh, clip arts on their post uh, on their on their profile pictures and their avatars. Uh, but uh, what's interesting that is, uh, um, uh, I was always big fan of this remote asynchronous work, where everybody knows his his responsibilities and his uh, um, predictability. I like this word predictability. So the, the, the things that we had to learn is to be predictable. And that's why you gain trust and uh, managers start trusting you. And uh, yes, the managers, maybe they had the biggest pain here. But as for developers, as Octavio said, uh, my world hasn't changed at all. <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> only, only thing that has changed is exactly the virtual conferences, by the way. So they have become a big part of my life. And uh, as you see, I'm, I'm now part of one of them, and uh, I like it. Although, I'll be quite honest, you know, in-person meetings are always, also necessary. Uh, and as we talk in terms of Java, you know, what, what's in, in, in Java user groups uh, and discussion, you know, Bulgarian Java user group, um, the most of them is beer. <laughs> so we gather at these Java <laughs> beer events. I think that's mandatory, um, right? <laughs> yes. And, uh, and what I like about that is that uh, a lot of startups are born this way. Uh, but, uh, you know, Java 19, for example, brought a lot of new stuff. Exactly those virtual trade I was speaking of. And uh, maybe I'm just because I'm part of something that is using them. Most of my question was about that. And uh, um, this is what we have discussed. At least people were talking to me. And they also had the question, will finally re reactive die? And uh, uh, I say that uh, there's still those three people <laughs> who, st who still code in reactive and they're doing it so good that, yeah, it will still be there for some time. So at least this is from my side. <clears throat> Thank you um, all for your answers. Uh, next question we have is, what are the next big, big features that we should expect in when it comes to the Java world? Well, what do you think? You have different backgrounds and different perspectives, so it would be interesting to, to join each other's point of view and discuss. Mine is quite predictable, you know. Yeah, that's why I'll so. give you into the, uh, to the other people. Yeah, maybe maybe I can then drop down for a second. I think again, like it's you know, since since the Java started with the six months kind of like the cadence of you know newer versions, I'm I must say that yeah, I'm I'm you know really starting to get lost. Like which version basically uh, brought which you know kind of functionality, what functionality is going to come next? It's it's becoming, you know, it became much harder f from that side to kind of like, you know, have a big features like we had like in the past with, you know, we, with you know, Java 8 and Java 9 and so on. Uh, the one thing that you know, I can't wait for basically to come out of the preview is definitely your know, virtual threads. I think that that one is going to have a huge impact on a lot of systems, especially on a lot of enterprise systems who are already heavily using the, the Java and is and already kind of like, yeah, using it to the max. So that is at least one of, Ones that you know, I just can't wait to you know to be kind of like yeah, out of the preview and you're fully kind of like yeah, production ready. That's it. And, and again, there's a lot of a lot of others which are kind of like yeah, 
look kind of smaller, but you can can be can become you know, very huge you know, impact you know, over time, like like you know, the, the records and all other stuff. So it's I would say in, in you know since the Java started six month cycle, like you know, all the time there's something new and something nice and great that you know that you're just super happy that you're going to use and you're know, super happy that you're going soon going to be able to use. Yeah. Oh, nice. Of course, virtual threads. It is possible to not think about it all the time, all the second, even now. And besides the virtual threads, we have several improvements in performance and to look more to start up the ABM, a one off process. And beside the Java SE specification, we are able to see several improvements on the Jakarta E side and microprofile side specifications where we are discussing more how to take advantage of these APIs, like virtual threads, exactly what uh, Dimitri is working right now with Helidon, and we're discussing how to integrate JPA and Jakarta NoSQL with uh, records to do more data-driven design inside our code with the systems layer, and the last one is improvement inside the ground game, where we have the CDI uh, 4.0 to look for more faster, faster one app that we have right now. Yeah, I see. I know there's something here um, still. Um, the virtual threads, that's the best word, but there's another thing. And it's coming from the cloud world, actually. So uh, as you see, cloud modal, once again, it's all about the money. Uh, uh, I know it's, it's, it's not techy, but it's something that actually brings us the possibility to use the technology. So the payment model of, uh, of cloud is usually, uh, well, pay as you, as, you, as you use, actually. So the resources you use, you pay for them only. And uh, one of the critical uh, stuff is uh, the startup time. Uh, and uh, yes, Gravium is somehow solves that thing for many of us, but um, Gravium uh, is, is awesome for fast starting and uh, I would say slow, not slow, but uh, fast startup time and uh, short usage applications. Like, you know, you start fast and then you die fast. Still, there are many options when you have to start and work for, for some period of time. And uh, here comes the JVM, actually. So you still have to use JVM because uh, Hotspot, for example, it has massive performance, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, better performance on long distances. Uh, it also comes to the Graal VM, but not native image, but the Graal VM with the, uh, with the Graal JIT. So that means you still have a lot of tasks which are long running tasks and which are optimized during the time they're running. So that's why, for example, Crack as a technology is also to somehow solve this issue of startup times. And uh, uh, yes, so you both have optimizations that gives you JVM and you have a fast startup time that gives you native image. And once again, native image is also good at performance uh, in terms of it's, you still can use most of the features that Java have. But uh, once again, uh, Java is not like slow anymore. This is, this is, this is something that uh, many people who are still in this business uh, say that Java is slow. No, it's not. I mean, it, it's, it's modern Java. And it's, it's totally different from what we have decades ago. And now we start really thinking in terms of awesome startup times, which are comparable to native startup times by Rust, C, and Go, for example. Sometimes they outperform them. And uh, you still have this big enterprise history and uh, ecosystem, which is available to you. So the challenges for, for example, for my, uh, well, I'm mostly writing framework right now, but still the users that we have, um, they say we need awesome startup time and you got it. And we need so much, you know, performance consumption, less performance consumption, uh, not performance, but resources consumption because we pay for it. So uh, these are the, the main, like, you know, things. So startup times, because you pay less as you start faster. Uh, 
you know, uh, you use less resources, you optimize, you pay less, and you use less, for example, space, memory, and so on, you pay less. So this massive to optimizations are something that drives Java now and well keeps it uh, keeps it up to date. This is what I think. That's a good good one. Especially when you talk about software, everything's around trade-offs, right? And the analogy, analogy that I usually do is when you try to compare a motorcycle with a plane, right? Yeah. A motorcycle goes fast initially, but a long time, the plane will be faster. And it should not only take the first meters to the analogy. Otherwise, I need to take a, a motorcycle to go to Brazil. And that's, of course, not a good idea. Of course, the plan will go better a long yeah. time than the, the device. That's that's actually a very good point. That uh, not always that the fact that you're fast in startup means that the overall performance or what you're aiming at is is the better option. So this actually brings me to to uh, one more question about this. We know that many people nowadays uh, have a standard, uh, let's say, entry stack that they start working with Java Enterprise, and that is usually Java, Spring, and Hibernate, as you probably know. So these are very popular frameworks that people use. And so when you go to the cloud, now we're talking about GraalVM and Quarkus. So if I am a Spring uh, techie and I really like Spring and I really like uh, Hibernate, should I consider actually learning into these other, uh, let's say, substitutes or technologies that are more prevalent in the cloud? What do you guys think? Is there still place for, for Spring to help us out in the cloud? Yeah, I, I think we, we we could come back to basically like, uh, what also like uh, like uh, was already mentioned uh, basically by Yatavi also like in in the beginning of a talk. You know, start start with the why. You know, like uh, why do you want to do it? Do you just want to do it? You know, because you want to learn new technologies and basically you know, get some additional point of view, or you have a really a reason you know now that you basically want to solve, and kind of the tech and the stack uh, that you know is not is on it's not able to do it. And again, like, uh, it's it's you know. From my point of view, I think like yeah, the Spring is really awesome, and again, I, I used it you know, a long, long, long time, and yeah, I'm still using it in some projects. But also the Quarkus, the Micronaut, the Vertex, the Halide, you know, like yeah, all these, you know, basically, I can call it kind of in some some sense maybe new new things are also awesome and also they're doing a uh, great job. So I think it's you know we have a tool, we have a lot of great options, and sometimes that's uh, a bad thing to choose. So. Yeah, I would I would say that yeah, at least from my point of view, for the future, I would st still see all of them having a you know, good place, basically in both like uh, on prem, but also in the cloud in in different kind of flavors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. I will I will drop into this. Uh, so once again, it really does depend on what you're doing. Uh, and uh, here is one thing called market. So. Um, I, when I used to be a, an architect, so I usually take my architectural decisions about what people I have, because it's very hard to learn them, for example, something new, and I have to educate them. And if I can take them from the market with this knowledge, uh, it's easy, good, and nice. And uh, this is exactly what was with, uh, with uh, Spring. So if I can hire a bunch of people who are um, knowing Spring and I don't have to educate them, that's really good. I mean, so it's it's very good for me as an as a, as a decision maker to be able to hire them. The problem is that uh, Spring ecosystem is not a problem. It's even good at some point, but it's it's good for some um, for some common tasks. It's a very big ecosystem, and you can easily start uh, with it. But only starting is not enough. If you want to grow a product which will live for a long time, you have to think in, like in the future. And you really have to care about those things. I was, uh, I was also talking in my, uh, giving in my talk, and I was also, um, uh, well, many times saying on different conferences that if you think long-term, you have to be able to scale. And you definitely have to choose a technology for the scale you need. Once again, the scale you need. Uh, if you know that you will always have 50 users and you need to just start your business and that's it, 
Yeah. Spring is an awesome option. If you want to build uh, something long lasting, something like uh, will evolve, evolve, et cetera, et cetera, but you also care about performance, you definitely should have a look about, uh, about how your product will evolve. Uh, what, for example, is good for micro profile in Jakarta is that you're not bound to vendor at this moment. So you can, you can start with one technology and end up on a different you know, vendor implementing this technology. And uh, this is what I usually give, it a, give it as a, um, as a um, advice to young architects. I mean, you have to really think at which moment you will rewrite everything. And do you really want to rewrite everything? <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, you should you should take it into the whole planning. And if you don't want to re uh, to to rewrite everything, you, you have this specs which are standard. If they solve your problems, it's a good solution. If you need just to start and you need this ecosystem which Spring provides, why not? Uh, so it's definitely bound to the tasks. But uh, once again, what is good about it, and we come back to a little bit product placement, is that uh, you are still able to do a standard code and get a good performance with these game changers that are coming in Java. So uh, once again, it's only the distances that you're thinking in. So uh, up to you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Octavio, do you have anything else to add? Yes, that's a good question. Especially when we talk about uh, frameworks, we usually talk also around platforms. And the thing that I'm, I, I'm seeing as a senior engineer uh, on a company I'm working right now is uh, we are sometimes missing the why. Uh, we are put several auto write or inject annotation, but sometimes we don't, we don't understand the inventory control or the solid aspect inside our codes and the couple thing and how to do a, a readable and a cleaner codes. And that's uh, the, the thing. As some of you know, the concepts around the good software design, it doesn't matter if you go through authorized by Spring or at inject by microprofile, CDI, Heldon, whatever. The good design will be there for you. Yeah, makes sure. sense. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, uh, we by the have... way, I'll right here. It really does depend. I'm sorry for the break here. If your no, business no, no, no. is something, is something that has to happen. There's something called time to market. You know, you know, uh, yeah. Spring is a good, good option for time to market because it's like a Lego. You just drop into some blocks, and most of the time. You already have something that you have to that's already there, and you just reuse it. At the end up, it will it will end up maybe with some you know big monster of different you know uh, blocks. It will do your job. So if you need to start it fast, spring is a top. If you need to perform uh, something which is long lasting, well, you have to think about platforms, as Octavio said. Uh, by the way, the funny thing is. Uh, most of the people say, okay, this EE is like dead and so on and so on. You'll be surprised that uh, oh, Java EE is the most money-making business right now. I mean, uh, all the banks, all this uh, big enterprises, uh, state uh, uh, software like running for, you know, uh, for the government and so on and so on. Uh, it's, it's mostly running on that, you'd be surprised. And... Uh, it's so stable that it simply does its job. <laughs> uh, that, so that's why uh, it may be fashion to run something in microservices and, and so on and so on. Um, uh, maybe it's suitable for something, but uh, it really depends on the problem that you solve because sometimes you even have to put a WordPress, sorry for saying that in this conference, and it will do the job you need. So you don't have to make a microservices framework for running a website for a, I don't know, three people. Um, and the same is if you really want to make something long lasting and you really have to think about the platforms, the migrations that you make, the rewritings that you made, 
uh it's uh it's uh it's all about the distances you take once again I'm sorry for repeating it and thanks for Octavio for saying that great yeah. insight thank you uh so uh the question for from the audience is uh as ton of projects are still on java 8 if you need to convince someone to move away from java 8 and upgrade to a newer version which will be the biggest selling point feature you will use that's the easy one. Security. Security. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Precisely. Unless you're paying for the extended like support, like you're like in a huge problem. And and I don't think that the companies, are, you know, majority of companies which are still on Java eight, are paying for extended support. So it's yeah, you don't get any security features or anything. And you know, and if you really care about your company and you know, and your job, yeah, you should care about security because tomorrow you know you might find out that you know, there is no company anymore if you have a security breach. And I will like great. another killer feature, and it's called performance. Uh, uh, because out of the box, uh, you will get massive performance updates with, without any, any, doing anything. You know, it's not about the virtual credits. It's just about that the platform from Java 8 has so much improvements in the code that, uh, once again, if you need performance, once again, you don't, don't always need it. Uh, like you will just get it out of the box. And once again, there are bugs which are post time to solve. And uh, uh, yes, you will have to break your workarounds. By the way, I, I, I once had a problem of a company who did not want to migrate because they already had the workarounds. They had to break again <laughs> to, to, to fix them. And, and they didn't want really to pay for the... Yeah, this is this is uh, ridiculous, but this is what this was why they were not moving because it's it's works don't touch problem uh, <laughs> because uh, and once again um, uh, it's all about the money. Whom will you pay and who will uh, do this uh, upgrade for you? But what's good about Java that it does not have breaking changes uh, and you can simply update and it will call to work. Security performance is something that you will get out of the box. Yeah, and, and I think that that's, I would say that's what should be like the most, you know, important selling points. Basically, you know, like you already said, like, yeah, without changing a line of your code, you would get security, you would get performance, you would get something that would work in a Docker containers, like yeah, as extended and, and again, like in the cloud in much better way. So it's, it's and like, you know, you don't even have to change the code and you will get massive and massive, basically improvements and securities and bug fixes and, and a lot of other stuff. Also, again, like, you know, resources are going to be, you know, will be you use less resources. So, again, like, I, I really don't see any good reason why somebody wouldn't, you know, do something like that. If we're talking some other programming languages or some other technologies where, you know, they're not backwards compatible, then I would say, yeah, then it's a, it's might be a huge problem to just, you know, change the JVM because. I think that a lot of people forget, uh, you know, very often with the Java is that the JVM and basically the code are completely separated. So you can take it exactly the same jar or var or ER and just put it on a different JVM and it's going to work, you know, because I think, as, at least as far as I know, majority of other programming languages basically tie the code to be the runtime itself. And that's not the case in the case of the Java. Yeah, that's why it survived so many years. Uh, and another, the, the, if you ask me for the less uh, I would say convincing selling points, the less convincing selling point, you will please the developers. <laughs> <laughs> That's very interesting. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm just curious, you mentioned performance uh, and uh, do you happen to, let's say, know what is the performance gain? So for example, if I'm running, let's say Java 8 and I move to Java 17, do you know, or can you take, take, tell, tell us at the drop of a hat, what would be, let's say, an estimated performance gain? I would say it depends well, on the workload. It really does depend. It, it really does depend, and it's a construction. For example, you use a lot of hash codes, the hash maps, you will have better performance there. Like, you know, because uh, it has been really nicely reworked uh, for mm. better performance. Yes, the same is for different algorithms that you use in lists. In, uh, in, uh, uh, there, by the way, there are many libraries uh, who actually take benefits of uh, 
you know that, for example, if we moved out from un, un, uh, unsafe stuff, that was like you know a big big problem. Uh, it's still a problem, and we moved to secure constructions like uh, like bar handles and so on and so on. You know, uh, you still have a better but much more secure code uh, with much past benefits on uh, on really um, like you know uh, long runs. Once again, long runs. Uh, it, it's something that you will feel in long runs because uh, if you just start something, it works, and you throw it away. There's not going to be massive performance, I believe, in any language except startup times. But for long runs, uh, you will feel it definitely. Even changing, uh, we're tuning the the the, uh, the JVM with different garbage collectors. By the way, you say you have to know your JVM to to be uh, to be uh, to tune it correctly. New garbage collectors, like you know, um, uh, you know, work knowing that your JVM is working inside of a container and the JVM knows about it. So all of that performance is uh, is is radical. I would say so. We can't say in percents; it's really depending. But you will definitely feel it. I mean, uh, I'm not sure if the, there are, I would say, common tasks, but you can have to take benchmarks. And, you know, we can take. For example, tech and power, and see the benchmarks there, and you will see all the gains. So uh, uh, we can't say it from a heart, but uh, there are many, many benchmarks doing this. So just go there. And once again, if it's if it for the business, it's uh, the main question is, will this bring you more money or save you money? Then yes, because you will use less resources and you will pay less because it's going to bring you much more performance. And security, as I said, it's something that is measured in, uh, in uh, uh, I would say, su survivability of your company. <laughs> so it will survive yeah. because you have, to, you have security. So that's my point. That's a great point. Thank you. Octavio, do you have anything else to add to this one? The no, no, I'm fine. Several improvements to funnels. <laughs> like they said but mostly security we are living right now in the where everything is around business is software and if you did a small mistake way which you lost your whole company as well so mind the gap between java versions yeah. okay i just want to um flip this question around and ask you how would you react uh, if in a hypothetical situation the company comes to you and says um we heard there are quite a lot of new technologies we want to use most of them uh we don't want to be outdated we just want all the new things and can you bring us uh, as mika mentioned time to market in the shortest period of time how would you um, approach this uh, this question if a company comes to you with this request? <laughs> I will start here because I always had this request. You mean uh, there's one thing called fashion. You know, uh, its impact on the way we think is much more then uh, then uh, we will think it's rational i'll be quite honest because yes uh, we're in conferences a lot of things are in conferences are our type of uh, talking about fashion what's fashionable right now and uh, i would call it this way so i will make this comparison do you want to look like a very trendy, I don't know, if Saint Laurent or Dolce Gabbana wear, uh, wearing guy? <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, and or, or you want to be like, you know, in classics and doing your stuff. I mean, if your business depends on, uh, on you to be fashionable, I mean, it really depends. It's something that brings you money. Uh, then why not? If you're an influencer, you know, uh, going to some clubs, then you have to be fashionable. If you're a banker working with a lot of money, you only wear a suit and people judge you in a different way. So yeah. uh, uh, if a company and client wants to do, uh, to adopt everything which is uh, new, trendy, and so on and so on, first of all, they have to have a lot of money for that, like spend a lot of money. 
because the newest special is the, the people who know the newest stuff are the uh, the most expensive by the way <laughs> so uh, if you are if you want to invest in this then go ahead mm -hmm. if you if your business depends on that then go ahead uh, if you know your strategy I mean business plan say okay we will be fashionable we'll be cool and this is how we attract more people to our product to our how we attract our developers and we are able to pay for that why not if then somebody comes for me and said okay i got like you know uh uh plus one salary and i want the newest and coolest things well, he simply won't be able not only just to make it, but to maintain it, because it's not only making it, you have to maintain it as well. So uh, it's a problem of resources and a problem of what what's the problem the company is solving. So yeah. yes, uh, it's also, I, I always say, it's also a little bit about fashion, or maybe a lot about fashion, but uh, if this is the survivability of your company, it has to be fashionable, and mm -hmm. you're able to Pay for it, go for it. Yes. Uh, also, you when everybody talk about uh, fashion way, we usually forget the maturity, right? Uh, we're able to see even the Java one, the big Java one about huge companies who decide to move out of uh, train language like Python and decide to go to Java, especially because when they go big. They need to go to a maturity language, a maturity platform around it. And every time that I have a discussion around it, I usually start with the why, of course, and then understand what they really want to. Usually because uh, the VP and the directors, they sometimes have no idea about what they want to. And it happens. And once I say that, Cloud, look to the clouds, try to decrease the complexity, especially to developers, try to increase the developer experience through doing more tools, uh, explore more tools, options, especially to make me do a deploy in a short uh, time and more often, especially to the business sector. Yeah, that's fair to say. So we can say that uh the newest is not always the best especially when you're not sure what exactly yeah. your end goal is right so you always sure. have to consider at the end of the day what you want to achieve before you actually decide to be trendy as we just said yeah i, th I think that that's a, that's a very very fair point to say and, and again it comes back to something that dimitri also pointed out you need to think about okay how you're going to maintain that system who's actually has the knowledge and how many people actually have a knowledge and want to learn about those new new technologies because again, in reality, what they always see is that you know, from the business, business don't really care. They just want to deliver to to get something, or they maybe heard some you know, the latest and greatest tech words that they just want to kind of slam into you know marketing of their product. And then yeah. usually, kind of like that, the engineers want to play with the latest and greatest. But again, like yeah, that's why you know, again, obviously, more senior people in the company to think about okay, like yeah, is this maintainable in the long run? Yeah, will we be able? To kind of like uh, bring either you know make internal uh, knowledge and basically you know, big enough to kind of be able to sustain this and, and maintain this or we will be able to hire people also does this actually product has a future because if you you know adopt some technology or something and it's you know like you know six months from now that it's not there then then you're in a huge problem so yeah. uh, for me it's always you know also think about the blessed area you know like if so things go wrong how bad they're going to go and again, also take that into account because usually with the latest and greatest bleeding edge, you know, it, it, it in most cases it goes wrong before it actually goes good. And with the proven technologies, it's it's less chance that it, they will go 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 wrong. So yeah, that's why what uh, Otavio said. What is the problem? Are you going to solve with this? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Or maybe you need another problem. So I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah I, I saw the companies who really want to you know, use use this or that technology because it's trendy now. So it's so that they can say, yeah, we built you using this technology. And then you ask them, okay, do you even understand what this technology does? No. Do you have an idea how it's going to help you? No. But it's good marketing. Yeah. So. Yeah, that that's precisely. If what the marketing is you need, why not? Yeah, so sometimes it could be useful. You, again, as you coming back to what you said, it's about 
taking into consideration what is the cost versus what is the expected uh, gain, right? So sometimes maybe it works. Mm -hmm. Great. So since we're having a um, couple more minutes until uh, the planned session and the planned time, uh, I would like to once again thank you uh, all for joining us. And then I would like to ask each of every one of you, our participants, to share something with the viewers if they want as their final words. So Vladimir, starting with you. Ooh. Uh, well, yeah, nothing to share. Just yeah, thanks everybody, like yeah, for organizing this, yeah, like yeah, for making this happen. And from you know, it's you know, I know that organizing things like that isn't the easiest thing. Also, like yeah, I'd like to thank you, yeah, Tavio and, and Mitai, for like, also kind of like yeah, joining, again, making and all other also speakers for making this you know conference great, and also for all the attendees because again, like, yeah, without them, yeah, all of this wouldn't make any sense. So. Great, thank you. Thanks. Mitya? Yeah, once again, thanks. It's been a pleasure. I really liked uh, uh, that they're able to present and talk about the new stuff. So I really, I really like uh, uh, the organization. So thank you. And I actually like this discussion a lot. So making the panel is good. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And the uh, final words is that. Uh, I believe we are, like, uh, once again, experiencing big changes happening right now with all this uh, thing we have discussed. And uh, it's really great to be part of them and to be, uh, to be um, using them and to be, well, uh, a little bit even judging. Do we need or don't we? Or we don't need it. But uh, it's nice that these changes are happening and they, they are, for me, they are good. And we are part of it. And um, uh, experiment uh, and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you as well for the kind words to both of you. Otavio, would you like to share as well? Yeah. Um, first tip, when you do presentation on the fly, don't forget to check the, the gate. Also, I said that <laughs> <laughs> uh, go beyond what as a top engineer if you are a software engineer understand soft engineering so go through database how does it work the types the trade-offs understand very well the architecture try to document your architecture your code as well do the boring stuff is also important and especially when you go to a new height understand why you're doing that because sometimes when you, you want to solve an issue and eventually you're gonna put more issue than we schedule. So avoid that, understand. Great. Once again, uh, thank, thank you all of you for joining us and thank you again for your time uh, and presentation. It was a pleasure and I hope we see each other again. Thank you and have Safe a nice day. Safe travels to who's traveling, yeah. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> bye, bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye -bye. So, our viewers, to wrap up JonConf, um, thank you all for your participation and to the speakers again. Uh, it was a great pleasure for the two of us to be joining uh, with you here today. Um, as we have already mentioned, if you want to watch the stream, you will be able to uh, on the website. And for that, those that have registered, you have a link to um, send through, through your email as well. Um, if you have any suggestions uh, about speakers for next year's edition, because we'll surely have a next year one, or if you want to see anybody uh, appear either on the Java special interviews that we've already mentioned that we at DreamX have, be sure to drop us a line. Uh, you can find DreamX at our website, dreamx.eu. Or you can find us on all our social media when just at DreamXLV and you can uh, leave us a message there. Have a nice evening and see you soon. Have a nice evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Bye. Bye.